In the last third of this century, our independence will depend on self-sufficiency in energy. The United States will not be dependent on any other country for the energy we need to provide our jobs, to heat our homes, and to keep our transportation moving. Beginning this moment, this nation will never use more foreign oil than we did in 1977. Never. Our imports of foreign oil have been climbing steadily since 1985 and now stand at 42 percent of our total consumption. We need a long-term energy strategy to maximize conservation and maximize the development of alternative sources of energy. America is addicted to oil, often imported from unstable parts of the world. This country can dramatically improve our environment, move beyond a petroleum-based economy, and make our dependence on Middle Eastern oil a thing of the past. In 10 years, we will finally end our dependence on oil from the Middle East. Calls to action. Calls to action. If you're at the age of 15 to 19, consider becoming a nuclear, chemical, electrical, or mechanical engineer. If you are from the ages of 20 to 25 and are not one of the aforementioned majors, consider going back to school. <laughs> <laughs> When you spin a spinning top, the heavy water
two liter bottle of water. Put a little bit of water in the bottom. Now try to balance it. And I couldn't because all the weight was really low. I couldn't maneuver it fast enough. Then he filled it all the way up. Now it was much heavier and it was much more unstable, but the center of gravity was higher. So Europa! Another Europa! A black and white picture of a ring of Jupiter! Okay. No. What? How do. You didn't get a second. Why is the Earth round? Why isn't it square or any other shape? That's a good question. I like that question. It's a question I have asked myself. And the answer has to do with gravity. Carl Sagan was a member of Voyager's imaging team. And it was his idea that Voyager take one last picture. That's here. That's home. That's us. Every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species, on a mote of dust, suspended in a sunbeam. As we explore further from the sun, the utility of solar panels shrink to zero. To illustrate, imagine we can power a space mission orbiting the Earth with one solar panel. We'll call this solar panel the Earth Panel. If we use Earth Panel orbiting Venus instead of the Earth, we'll get almost twice as much electricity from it. Because orbiting closer to the Sun, more photons will be hitting the panel surface. The same Earth Panel orbiting Mercury will generate almost seven times as much electricity. Mercury is closer to the sun, more photons hit the panel. But when we start moving away from the sun, in Mars orbit, we only get half as much electricity. So to power an identical space mission, we now need two Earth panels. At Jupiter, where only 4% as many photons can hit Earth panel, we now need 27 Earth panels to power the mission. The distance between Earth and Sun is what's called an astronomical unit. Earth is one astronomical unit away from the Sun. Jupiter is only five astronomical units away from the Sun, but requires 27 times as many solar panels. The relationship is not linear, it's quadratic. At Saturn, 91 Earth panels. Uranus, Neptune. At Pluto, 1500 Earth panels are required to power the mission. Somewhere between Mars and Saturn, 
our mission became impractical. Clouds and haze completely hide the surface of Titan, Saturn's giant moon. Titan reminds me a little bit of home. Like Earth, it has an atmosphere that's mostly... The landing produced some surprises. Philae didn't secure itself to the comet's surface and bounced, making multiple touchdowns. The final resting site was partly in shadow, receiving less sunlight to recharge its instruments. Philae was power-starved and unable to conduct experiments before freezing to death. Hours of operation? Decades of operation. Neil deGrasse Tyson is a tireless advocate for NASA, explaining to politicians and public what we miss when space exploration is severely financially constrained. We lost an entire generation of these smart people. They became like investment bankers or lawyers out of the 1980s and 90s because there's no place for them to take their interest in science. When the merger between Boeing and Lockheed's business occurred, the merger promised in the press release $150 million of savings. Instead, there were billions of dollars of cost overruns. And entrepreneur Elon Musk explains how space exploration is launch constrained. Musk created SpaceX to drastically reduce the cost of launching payload into orbit. SpaceX was, was founded to make radical improvements to space transport technology, uh, with particular regard to reliability, safety, and, and affordability. We have top men working on it right now. Who? Top men. But what about powering space exploration? Most of our RTG fuel, the plutonium-238, was created a quarter century ago. NASA started producing more in 2013, but the worldwide shortage of RTG fuel is a perpetual constraint on space missions. And while our tiny supply of plutonium-238 
Hello. 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 All right, everybody. Wave at the camera. All right. Now, a few announcements. Now that we had the little phone thing, put your phones away or mute them. Lesson of the day number one, <clears throat> please mute your phone. Uh, I just did. And so it's, it's a lot of times people are like, yeah, I muted my phone. It's like, oh, I muted like some of the rings, but not all the rings. Uh, <clears throat> couple of rules here. These things with exit signs above them are called exits. All right. But if you can be solid and take this on board, do not go through that exit. <clears throat> All right, because people up here are going to be talking, and you know we don't need the, the in and out next to the door. The best exit is that one, and that's because there's a bathroom down at the end of the hall. They kind of put it, kind of where God lost his shoes, but uh, you know whatever. That's where they put it. Uh, <clears throat> uh, also, if it wasn't obvious after doing this 12 times. This is all being filmed, camera, 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 all over the place. If you don't want to be on camera, which occasionally we get somebody who says they don't, then the way to handle that is to don't be in the camera lines. So when you bought your ticket, there's a little thing in there saying you're going to be filmed. And I'm telling you right now, you're going to be filmed. So I, I don't need any ex post facto someone going, uh, I need you to expunge me from your video. My boss didn't know I was coming to talk about thorium. So, <laughs> so it's too late. You're here. Everyone knows, you know, these things are listening to you. You know, it's too late. Tomorrow there's a tour of the new nuclear facilities at Abilene Christian University. It is up to you to figure out how to get there. Yeah, so to answer your question, there is no bus, no, uh, <laughs> and uh, the address is on the website. Uh, so I need to start pressing. 
the buttons here. There's the address also right there in front of your face. And uh, all right, that's Gordon McDowell. So he's got the clap. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you're going to have to forgive me. I'm probably going to read a lot of this, which is not the greatest way to present information, but uh, it's a good way to keep it, you know, get it all out. So this is uh, my little introduction. I guess all these conferences have to have themes. So I sort of came up the theme for this one is uh, the troubling topics. Uh, Troubling topics at TAC-12 that nobody else would talk about. Some nice alliteration there. And, uh, you know, we're grateful for uh, ACU. We're very grateful for them allowing us to come on to their uh, campus tomorrow and get tours of these facilities. It's essentially the last chance that we're going to have to do this. Uh, once it's a nuclear facility, it'll be a lot harder and more regulated. So uh, that's why we kind of had short notice on the... Uh, conference this year and and uh, why we kind of had to do it in a in a odd time of the day and year and all this good stuff so if you were wondering uh, that's it so <clears throat> uh, so one of the <laughs> one of the things I want to talk about since we are at uh, you know sort of uh, in a Abilene Christian University environment here, and we got Abilene Christian uh, representatives here. I thought, well, you know, I'll, uh, you know, I'll talk a little bit from the perspective of, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, what's the spiritual aspect of what we're doing here, you know. And uh, so, when I was a kid, I was a, yeah, I was a pretty spiritual kid. I even like toyed with the idea of being a priest. I went to Our Lady of Perpetual Help School, Loyola Academy. And some of you might know that uh, Loyola's motto is uh, men for others. And uh, men for others is the curse that, uh, you know, once I heard, found out about thorium, I was like, ah, now I got to do something about this. <laughs> so, so uh, uh, you know, I've been cursed with the idea of trying to make this available to everybody, you know, on earth. And uh, so... Forgive me, but I'm going to give you a little bit of a Christian Sunday school, uh, you know, <laughs> Sunday lesson here for you. Uh, so I, I was talking to somebody and, uh, you know, they said, uh, you know, how can God be, you know, you know, man, spirit, you know, God? And uh, they said, yo, there's a famous uh, triple point for water. And uh, you can find these on YouTube. Obviously, I just took a screenshot there. And uh, water can be frozen and a gas and a liquid at the same time. So I thought, huh, that's, <laughs> that's pretty interesting. You know, there's a, a precedence for, uh, you know, for you know, kind of letting these Venn diagrams of these, you know, the science and the spiritual kind of overlap and help explain each other. So I said, well, how can, I, how can I apply that to what we're here to talk about today? And uh, so this is about where thorium comes from, right? <clears throat> Mostly, not all of it. There's stuff like thorite and, and uh, things like that. But the vast majority of where we would be getting thorium for the things that we want to do with it comes from this phosphate rock. And uh, that happens to be monazite. Uh, <clears throat> so, this is, a, this is why we also say this is a critical materials conference, right? Because they're, they're intricately linked. They can, they're brothers, they're twins, they're always going to, they, they have to be taken in the same, same breath. Uh, and uh, so, there's, it, there's generally composed of three things. There's your critical materials, there's your fertilizer, you know, that's a phosphate, that's why people mine these rocks, and there's your energy to, to run all of society. <laughs> so we got these in this one rock. Rare earths and enable advanced technologies of tomorrow. Phosphates and dicalphosphates are the fertilizer of life. 
There's a desperate need for it throughout the world. And thorium, you know, look at all this. You know, fuel, sure, you know, we got fuel, but also alloys, catalysts, lighting, electronics, ceramics, the greatest cancer medicine on earth, superconductors, and we barely know anything, barely, we've, sc we've hardly scratched the surface. So pretty cool. Maybe uh, uh, maybe someday we're going to be able to reintroduce uh, thorium-based products and not just fuels. So yet in the West, in the Western world, what do we do with this rock, right? Well, at best, we take the phosphate from it and we use it for fertilizer and everything else we throw away. So these are the phosphate stones, the mineral stones that we throw away, and we reject them because we fear them. We fear the power that's held inside them. And because we've become fearful cowards in the West, <laughs> we have a, we've been given the solution to hunger, to all the technology needs and advanced materials, endless energy abundance, we throw it away because we fear the immense energy in the thorium. And there's some uranium in there too, but we've based policy on fear, and that's not how you want to live. And so 50 plus years at least, we've let greed and avarice guide our decisions, and we threw this miracle rock away. Someone, someone gave us this phosphate mineral this monazite, this apatite, xenotime, basazite. <clears throat> and we've had the solutions to food, water, advanced technologies, most importantly, energy. We've had them. And yet we spit in the eye of this opportunity to really make a difference. So I say no more. You, me, everybody in this room, all the people online right now, and in the weeks and years to come that watch this online, we're going to free the phosphate stone. And we're going to create a future with that rare earth. And we are going to free the atom. And we're going to power everything, everything, with thorium. It's been, uh, it's been around for a long time, far too long. Uh, we've been at this for 15 years. 2009 is when the first conference was. But we're, but we're closer, closer than that. ever. A lot, a lot of times, times it doesn't seem, seem like we're making progress, but you know, you know, we're in for the long haul, right? right? Uh, uh, we're, we're going, going to win, win this race. race. And we're we're going to do it with, with this misfit, misfit scorned rock. rock. Phosphate, rare earth, mineral stones filled. And now these stones that were rejected are going to be the cornerstones. So that's your... <laughs> Little uh, <clears throat> lesson. <clears throat> so, so, as my uh, friend Robert Bryce said, you know, let's build a cathedral of energy. And so, those are the stones you're going to build a cathedral of energy with. Uh, so, I'm going to beg your attention for just another minute more and. Uh, talk about uh, view into missing vendors. Some folks that couldn't make it here didn't uh, have uh, uh, you know, the time or energy to, to get here. <clears throat> and uh, Generation Atomic will do a, a, a big uh, overview of uh, progress in the world. But for right now, uh, Flyb has a new CEO and uh, our friend Joe Bonametti, who's been a longtime supporter, is still working there. Uh, you know, bringing uh, he he developed tons of technologies with uh, DARPA, and uh, so I'm sure he's going to professionalize everything and 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 help Flybe make some progress. Thorcon still in the game. They're they're uh, proceeding along. Uh, excuse me. They're. Uh, uh, they also are looking to get a new CEO soon. Sadly, 
They've, uh, they aren't using <laughs> their very name, their namesake, Thorcon, they, uh, they're not using uh, thorium anymore. They are going to, but uh, like terrestrial energy, they are going to at least use uh, low enriched uranium. So at least they, that's smart. TerraPower, uh, we're going to have a discussion about TerraPower later from Carl Pauls, but basically uh, they've recently just got a construction permit uh, going for Wyoming, so you know, let's see if they can pull that across the line. And uh, uh, there's a when it comes to thorium-based stuff, they're still working on uh, U-233 and thorium milking process uh, to uh, to make medicines. China Academy of Science, as far as we know, from what I've heard, and I've spoken to a few people, the LF1 was started. They had a few problems, might have been a leak, we're not sure. They apparently seem to have gotten it back, and uh, from what I hear, it's, it's running. Uh, maybe Dr. Holcomb knows more, but uh, that's... So, the, uh, you probably know who I was talking to about that, but uh, so... Uh, but really great stuff in the world of thorium is uh, clean core thorium energy. Uh, Mahul Shaw and his kid and a few other folks, they've actually started uh, accelerated uh, fuel testing. There's our buddy Jess Jean shaking Mahul's hand. So they've got their thorium-based uh, fuel for can-do reactors being tested at INL right now. So that's pretty good stuff, you know. Uh, it's a, kind of a discreet application, but hey, he's making progress. So you got to really hand it to Mahul. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm not a monster, I won't read this for you, but uh, you guys can read it yourself. But, uh, you know, the, the basic, uh, you can go on to World Nuclear News and read about all their work. Hopefully they'll be done with the, the fuel testing and they'll start selling the uh, can-do fuel soon. So there's been some political successes. And uh, uh, I'm very proud of this, that uh, Byron... Donalds. Uh, he's introduced quite a few pieces of legislation, many of them specifically addressing uh, uh, thorium and thorium needs and critical materials applications. Um, very proudly, you know, we were, many of you know that we've been working very closely with El Salvador for <clears throat> much of the last year. And Naib, the president, Naib Bukele, just signed uh, an agreement the IAEA, and as it says up there, El Salvador is going nuclear, so El Salvador, and more. You know, so there's a lot more to be, but I won't belabor it. Uh, we've, uh, we've gotten support. Uh, Jim and I go to Washington, D.C. at, uh, at uh, ridiculous amounts of times, and, uh, and there's, uh, there's growing support for this. So that's why I say it's been a long, long, long painful journey in many, many respects, but uh, 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 it feels like, you know, we're just about to pull that pebble out from this giant boulder. There's a lot of uh, uh, pent-up energy, and I think we're about to get that pebble finally out, and the, the giant boulder can roll down the hill. So that's, that's uh, your first assessment for the day, and we'll, we'll wait for... Uh, Generation Atomic to do theirs. But right now I'd like to introduce uh, Dan. Yep, thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh. Restart computer, of course. Let's do that. Oh, gosh. Disappointed by the lack of bananas. All right. Thanks so much. So I'll let Thanks, you introduce sir. yourself. Thanks, Dan. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks so much for having me. Um, how's that? You guys hear me all right? It's not designed for massive Canadian men. 
Before I became the CEO of Synergetic, I was actually a lumberjack for a year. No, that was like when I was 20 years old. But I am the CEO and one of the co-founders of Synergetic Carbon Neutral Fuels. This is not a presentation about nuclear power, but it is a presentation about what we might do with it in a future that is more abundant. We are in the business of generating net zero and increasingly net negative hydrocarbons synthetically by using industrial heat and seawater. Sounds like science fiction. I did wanna make a comment of science fiction before we start. A lot of the stuff that I'm gonna speak on today does sound like a bright shining future. For our version one, and tech that will continue to iterate, all of the technology that we're gonna use exists right now. There's no new science in this presentation. There's no new technology in this presentation. Maybe a few new integrations, um, and we will continue to iterate as we go. But when I get into the spooky stuff, trust, we've come a long way. I want to start by asking everyone to imagine what happens if our wildest dreams come true at this conference. 2030, maybe it's 2040, when we actually see the proliferation of SMRs, large reactors, and we get this abundance of nuclear power in the world. I have a lot of conversations with people in the nuclear industry, and it's, it's fair that we've been a bit bedraggled by tough bureaucracy, tough financing. So it's, it's a moment to start this day today. Close your eyes, think about what kind of abundance comes from actual proliferation, because we are seeing a lot of progress. This nuclear world has gone from fringe to mainstream. I mean, you guys saw it, COP28, tripling of nuclear. Activists turned leaders and governments, industry, everyone's coming around to the reality that we're gonna need a lot more energy and nuclear is the backbone of those future energy demands. The bureaucracy remains, but suspend your disbelief around the bureaucracy for the purposes of this. We can come back to that in another presentation. Um, because novel electricity demand is one thing that's really interesting. We're gonna see a lot of that from a diversity of sectors. I think there's a really interesting whole knock-on effect of industrial heat demand. Industrial heat today in its diversity of applications is probably 99% fossil fuel fired. We need solutions to that and there aren't many and nuclear is easily the best one. I'm preaching to the choir on that. But in the far future, electric vehicles, sure. Data centers, we get that. What about geoengineering, terraforming, space travel beyond interplanetary? What about intergalactic? These are things that the nuclear future underpins. And uh, even Winston Churchill in, I believe it was the early 1950s, he was learning about nuclear and its genesis then, and he has this quote, schemes of cosmic magnitude would become feasible. Geography and climate would obey our orders. I'm a big Churchill guy, I always really like that. And so, <clears throat> emissions-free electricity underpins an era of abundance that would be hard for us to comprehend. Emissions-free industrial heat underpins a further abundance that it's really hard for us to wrap our heads, heads around. And you guys are the ones that are making this future a reality. So thank you so much for the work you've been doing in the last 15 years, in some cases, the last 30 years. The future of nuclear power is an exciting prospect thanks to the hard work that's gone on substantially in this room. How large is our appetite for industrial heat? 99% fossil oriented today. Since 1800, this has come exclusively from oil, coal, and gas. And I would venture that it would be difficult to go 30 seconds in your life without interacting with one of the amenities, comforts, and benefits that come from this abundance of industrial heat. We don't hear a lot about it. I read a lot of headlines around electricity policy and EVs and let's make solar and wind turn every electrical outlet green. Fantastic, that only solves about half the problem. The rest of our energy, arguably about $7 trillion a year in global expenditure, is from industrial heat. Why don't we talk about this more? It's probably because humans are biased towards things that we see every day. Most of us have never walked past a steel manufacturing facility in our daily lives, a cement plant. Um, but these are verticals that it will be challenged for electricity or green electricity alone 
to solve. So this is a problem that needs solving. It's going to get solved at some point, and I am of the view that we should just solve it today. I think current demand trends might suggest that fossil reserves will sort of become economic on about a 200, 250 year time horizon. That's not very long in the scope of the entire existence of the human species. So let's get it right, let's figure it out. What are the best ways to solve for industrial heat? I bet you know the answer. Electricity alone cannot economically power. I'm gonna say all this stuff out loud and be the annoying guy that reads it because think about this stuff. Mining and refining, cement production, steel production, chemical production, heavy industrial manufacturing, aviation. I flew here yesterday from Vancouver, Canada on a jet. It was a miracle. I went to sleep at six in the morning. I woke up, I was in an entire different country. Uh, that isn't feasible without, in this case, fossil hydrocarbons and in the future, net zero hydrocarbons. Marine transport, so many of the clothes on our backs, the goods in our hands, the things that we're dealing with, this computer, likely that, no, not the water. Uh, came here on a fossil hydrocarbon powered marine transport vessel and hydrogen production. So what's the solve? You guessed it. Abundant nuclear implies abundant industrial heat. Even in some of the conversations we were having last night, we got bogged down in electricity. Well, we could just do more solar and wind and there's so much solar and wind policy and credits and all these things. I say for the purposes of this presentation, let's put that to the side. Nuclear, especially small modular reactors, have some really fantastic industrial heat characteristics. Super critical temps, depends on who you talk to. I actually heard a core temp quoted at 700 Celsius. Also, I'm speaking in Celsius today. Ah, oh, damn Canadians, right? The rest of the world is on that program. Um, very, very hot, really hot. We can directly apply that to a variety of these industrial processes. Scalable and modular, we don't need transmission of this heat. Give me a good steel plant, I'll build you an SMR right beside it. Um, deployable adjacent to existing infrastructure. My team and I also deal in geothermal. I'm gonna to get to that, but we really like geothermal as a co-located heat source. The problem is geothermal, especially shallow, hot geothermal is not located everywhere. So SMRs could be. Lowest cost heat, cost heat physically possible. I don't know, we'll see in the next 10, 20 years of geothermal, super hot rock especially, versus SMR, but I think we're really abutting the physical limitations of, of cost reduction. And of course, emissions free. And I bet you were wondering when I was gonna get to this part. This is the ideal heat input for zero, net zero, and increasingly net negative fuel synthesis. Nuclear powered fuel synthesis, the path to net zero hydrocarbon abundance. Yes, I believe in a future of increasing hydrocarbon abundance. Hydrocarbons have underpinned every technological change, advance, quality of life aspect that we have in our society. We've just been making them out of the wrong stuff. Very simple, don't refine down, synthesize up, start with modern, beautiful electrolyzers that have gone through incredible step change advances over the course of just the last few years. The budding and expanding and rapidly TRL increasing carbon capture world, scrub carbon out of the air, scrub carbon out of the ocean. That carbon is an exceptionally valuable resource. We can add it to hydrogen and make that the easiest and most transportable fuel, highest energy density that we use for these applications. And then chemical synthesis. As I say, the chemistry involved in combining these hydrogen carbon atoms in Fischer-Trope reactors and gasification, it's not complicated. We've been doing it for 100 years. Uh, it's getting a lot better and there's some really interesting advances that are happening. I actually spoke to an advanced researcher from Cambridge who's just doing his postdoc work with Shell. He was operating Fischer-Trope reactors inside an MRI so that he could see what was going on inside the reactor. Fascinating. And we're really excited about the hydrogen economy. Trust, if I could sell hydrogen tomorrow, it'd be easier for me than adding carbon into it and moving that stuff all around. Hydrogen is very difficult to transport and there's not a lot of end use applications today. Plus, if we say we're gonna run every engine, motor, and turbine we've ever built off hydrogen, that's probably in the order of tens, maybe hundreds of trillions of dollars worth of retrofits. 
long time plan, one day, give me a beautiful hydrogen economy, I can't wait to supply for it. Ammonia, uh, easy way to transport hydrogen, or easier, is to add it to some nitrogen atoms and then you can move it around without having to keep it at super cool temperatures. But today, 4.4 trillion liters a year of liquid fuels, about 99% of which is still coming from fossil, we want to replace those, one liter at a time. Net zero synthetic hydrocarbons. This is our first and foremost effects test. I believe that we'll demonstrate this physically within the next 12 months. Very simple. Heat resource, in our case, we're gonna go with a super hot rock geothermal resource to begin. Guys, get me some SMRs on grid, get me some SMRs uh, with some industrial heat applications. I'm happy to use them. We got, admittedly, as you know in this room, a bit more of a bureaucratic process to get there. Heat and water through modern solid oxide electrolyzer cells. We've got quite a few companies developing and iterating these. Our friends at Bloom are doing fantastic work. These electrolysis cells can accept both electricity or heat as their inputs. They operate really hot temperatures and the physics is so simple I could explain it to a five-year-old. Get the H2O molecule active, hot, moving, it becomes fragile. We tip a little bit of electricity in and we crack it into hydrogen and oxygen. The value product for us is hydrogen. And from there, we could look at a today functional ammonia configuration. Ammonia is really great. Fertilizer industry is $400 billion a year. We need more hydrogen, or we need more ammonia. And ammonia could be a great stepping stone for us to get to hydrocarbons. The integration here is to add an air separation unit. That gives us nitrogen. We run it through this beautiful Haber-Bosch reactor. Uh, it's been around a long time. We get some cool co-products, oxygen, hydrogen, hydrogen peroxide. These are all saleable commodities. They're super valuable and even utilized for load balancing. So this is kind of the intermediate step, but the big kahuna, net zero fuel. If we can get our heat below four cents per kilowatt hour electric, there's a conversion to thermal, depending on who you talk to, maybe eight to 10 times. That then takes us through to add in carbon. In our iteration one, the easiest thing for us to do is to buy point source carbon. There's lots of emitters today that are being regulated to scrub their emissions from their smokestacks or what have you. And a lot of them are burying this carbon in the ground. That's the thesis. Let's take the carbon out and we're gonna bury it. This is a beautiful commodity. It's incredibly important. We say, don't emit it, but we'll take it. And we can buy that. Our models work at $100 per metric ton. We can buy that point source carbon for like 30, 40 USD. In the future, as direct air capture and direct ocean capture become more commercially mature, we hope to integrate those right on site as a system. This means we're scrubbing carbon out of the atmosphere and we're making fuel out of it. At the baseline, it's net zero. That's a huge improvement on the incremental carbon emissions and various other emissions, I'll come back to that, that come from burning fossil fuels. But where it gets exciting is increase the amount of DAC, there's also inherent loss through the system. Eventually, we could deliver a fuel that every time you fly in an airplane operated by sustainable aviation fuel from our process, you're actively segregating carbon out of the atmosphere. Host of really awesome co-products as well as we spoke to. Hydrogen, hydrogen peroxide, methanol, waxes, greases, all the stuff we make out of hydrocarbons, we want to make out of synthetic hydrocarbons as well. I wanted to bring this uh, Venn diagram up because I know there's some engineers and contractors and construction guys in the audience and you guys just absolutely love this paradigm. I put this here because every builder I've ever worked with loves this thing. Mark my words, synthetic fuel powered by geothermal or powered by SMR lives in the not possible range. We're going to produce fuel that has a higher energy density than fossil today. I'll come back to why that is. We're gonna produce fuel at a lower cost than fossil fuels with no beta risk. All of the inputs are inherently price stable. And the fast piece comes into play when we consider 
that over the next 30 years, oil and gas super majors plan to spend $26 trillion only on resource replenishment. It is getting harder and harder to find new oil fields and new reserves. It becomes an economic problem, 26 trillion earmarked. So we're saying, we just build one of these plants, we could operate it in perpetuity. Synthylene fuel, this is our end product. Why is it great? Drop-in substitutable, we need no retrofits, no overhauls, we can operate it in existing motor engine and turbine infrastructure. We are not asking any of our consumers to change their behavior. We want them to continue to act in their own economic self-interest. We just want them to buy the best grade fuel they can at the lowest price. If they don't believe in climate change, I don't mind. The reason why we're doing this is deep and intimate about solving some of our climate problems. My customers don't have to be morally aligned to that thesis. Unprecedented scalability. All we need is water and heat. As long as there's water and heat, we can expand beyond the restrictions of biofuel limitations. We can expand beyond the limitations of fossil fuel reserves. Proven component parts. We're not inventing anything new. There's no new science. There's no new technology. The hydrogen effects test I pointed to all the way through to that full sin fuel configuration, they can operate with off-the-shelf catalog items today and molecular purity. When we refine oil into kerosene, for instance, it's rife with impurities, not us. Instead of refining down, we build the molecules from the ground up, and it gives us a molecularly pure output, which you can see on this slide. This is my favorite image. This tells the whole story. Fossil jet A on the left, <laughs> and synthetic fuel on the right. Higher energy density. We're estimating that our fuel has 7% higher energy density than fossil hydrocarbons, than fossil kerosene jet A. That implies that planes that flew exclusively on that, it's not really how it works right now, we blend the SAF into existing fuel resources, but over time, planes can fly higher, planes can fly faster, Planes can fly in places in the atmosphere with less friction, and as a result, they're creating second-order efficiency. As I mentioned, there's no beta risk here. We don't have to be hamstrung to the ebbs and flows of the fossil fuel input economy, uh, nor the biofuel input economy, and those do fluctuate, unfortunately, correlated with food prices. Citing anywhere, adjacent to demand, Military airports, large airport consumers, we can put these plants adjacent to the consumption and we don't need to take on as much transportation cost and transportation risk. Domestic energy security, Russia, the Middle East, these are nebulous places, unclear as to where the future of our reliance and relationship and friendly relationships with those will go. Imagine a barrel of kerosene jet A that says made in America on the side. It's a compelling, compelling opportunity. Um, the contaminants in fossil jet A include heavy metals, aluminum, arsenic, cadmium, chromium, copper, iron, mercury, manganese, nickel, lead, zinc, as well as noxious gases like sulfur dioxide and other ground level ozone forming gases. We kind of get honed in on CO2. CO2 is not the only problem in the atmosphere. And so we solve for second order issues that are beyond us that. We're gonna be consuming a lot more aviation as a society. Seven and a half billion people have never flown on a plane. They want to. Projections are tripling of jet fuel demand by 2050. You can see there's a little blip on the graph. Uh, the graph that's to the left there, that's the pandemic, barely made a dent did not change our long-term consumption behavior. Solving for sustainable aviation fuel is an issue that the airline industry is critically aware of. The EU has set mandates. By 2050, they expect 70% of kerosene to be not necessarily synthetic fuel, but sustainable aviation fuel. 2030, that number is 5%. Right now, we're on track to miss those mandate targets by 40%. So we've already got a massive delta 
of pent up demand. And unfortunately, the limitations of the current incumbents in the sustainable aviation fuel space, they're about 95% biofuel, they got a real big problem. And that is that they're forever in a day about five times more expensive than fossil fuels. Right now they get away with that because of subsidy, but we also just don't have enough waste food oil in the world. If we could somehow collect all of the French fry grease in China, we would still be maybe substituting 0.1 or 0.2% of liquid fuels. Uh, so this is a problem that needs a novel first principles solution and synthetic fuel is that solution. Breakthrough unit economics, this is important. I want my customer to make a self-interested economic choice. This is the greatest mechanism to enable progress on climate consumption and climate change, is to just ask people to buy the best grade product they can at the lowest price. By using heat from a small modular reactor or from geothermal and operating these new solid oxide electrolyzer cells with greater efficiency, we can get to perhaps between 80 cents and $1.20 per kilogram hydrogen. That underpins our ability to then buy that carbon, less than $100 a metric ton, combine it for an end fuel price in the 50 to 80 cent per liter range. The 10 year historic moving average of Jet A is 80 cents. So we actually, we will definitely benefit from subsidy. Those subsidies exist for a reason. It gives us a beautiful margin ramp to be able to get to scale. But at the end of the end of the day, subsidies can't last forever. We need to give people a better option. And this target cost range, the maroon line is the current estimate for SAF. It's not actually a commodity. It trades on more one-to-one -one deals. And like some airline customers are paying 700% price premiums for SAF versus uh, Jet A. The orange line is the historic price of fossil jet A, and then this band is our target cost range. Beyond that zero, take the carbon out of the atmosphere, make it into fuel, put it back in the atmosphere again, that's great. There's some other contributions that we make that actually increasingly make us net negative over time. First of all, the system is not perfectly efficient, so maybe it's 15 or 20% of that carbon is lost in the system. Maybe we sequester that, maybe we reintegrate it. Um, Direct air capture, really exciting. We've seen crazy explosions in that space. I think Lower Carbon Capital made 68 investments in direct air capture last year. It's a kind of an index fund approach. Direct ocean capture, we have some really cool friends that are doing the same thing, but pulling it out of the sea. And uh, they're making great progress. I think they're living at about a TRL six, and we're gonna see that commercialized in industrial use in collaboration with a large shipping company uh, in the next two years. Second order reductions come from the inherent inefficiencies in fossil fuel refinement. To turn a barrel of oil into kerosene, you need to burn an additional 40, 45% of that oil. So the refinement process, incredibly lossy. It's a second order efficiency. And then further material reductions, the elimination of emissions intensive exploration and extraction activity. Think about going to find new oil reserves and digging them out of the ground especially when you look at, think of Canada, we've got tar sands up there, and it's really, really pricey to get it out. It takes a lot of energy to turn it into anything usable. Uh, we don't need to do any of that. We just need to build the infrastructure, make sure there's water coming in, heat coming in, fuel coming out. What are we doing right now? Admittedly, very early stage. We really couldn't even envision this bright future just two, three years ago. The solid oxide electrolyzer cell advances, the advances in geothermal, the advances in SMR, we're living at the confluence of a bunch of existing step change advances, and we're standing on the shoulders of giants. So in the next 12 months, engineering model, conceptual design report, we'd love to work with US national labs or universities. I'm sure some of you guys have some experience there, probably some war stories. Help my naivety, tell me what I'm missing, help me figure out how to navigate those politics. Effects test. The digital twins are amazing these days. We can create machine learning and AI enhanced virtual environments that give us a very deep understanding of many, many different iterations of how best to maximize efficiencies from our systems. But as we know, investors love physical things. So plugging in very simply a geothermal asset to a solid oxide electrolyzer cell, this has never been done. It's a novel proof. We're really excited to deliver it over the course of the next 12 months. And pilot site assessments, 
Geothermal is the core focus for now. Luckily, there's some really hot rocks and great places that are fun to do business in. Alaska, Texas, here we are. There's a lot of geothermal here and built on the back of some incredible wildcatters, some really smart operators from the oil and gas industry uh, we look forward to working with. Iceland, think about Iceland. This is a big black volcano. Lots of energy there and other friendly nations. So here it is, superior grade, higher energy density, lower cost, self-interested choice, net zero, increasingly net negative. The crew that I've been lucky to tag along with on this ride have been imagining this future their entire careers. We are at this inflection point now, and it's on the back of many different converging technological changes. This may be the most important mission of the 21st century. We've got to get off fossil hydrocarbons, but our society is deeply reliant on hydrocarbons. What are we gonna do? We're not gonna change the engines, the motors, and the turbines quite yet. We're just gonna change the hydrocarbons. Come chat with me after. I'll buy you a beer. Let's have some laughs. Thank you so much for the work that you do. That's our, that's our show today. Do we have time for cues or I'm done? Yeah, let's do some questions. Uh... Does anybody have any uh, questions out there? I got a question. Uh, so, uh, obviously, uh, starting out with geothermal, uh, when you, uh, when, when you, uh, are doing that, how, uh, how directly do you think, uh, applying nuclear process heat to the, uh, uh, to the solution you're looking for? We would way rather use nuclear process heat. If there were a few SMRs that were idling and needed somewhere to put their energy, we would love to capitalize on that. Geothermal has a host of different risks. Pulling it out of the ground, complicated and expensive. When it's really hot, it gets more complicated and more expensive. Operating at you know, 350, 400 degrees Celsius, maybe that's functional with the materials we've got today. To get into the 500 plus, that requires some new materials advances. Heat temps up down, fluctuate, you can draw down on your heat reserve. As you scale it, you need many, many, many wells. Like we're talking, if we were to wanting to get to a gigawatt, that might be a thousand wells all tied into one system. No one's ever contemplated that for geothermal before. So in short, there is no better heat input for us than an SMR, especially one that operates above 500 Celsius. Natura, Copenhagen Atomics, I want to talk to you guys. Thanks very much. Uh, since we're broadcasting this, I would ask uh, Gordon, can you hand him a microphone? Or actually, here. What's the upper limit of the temperature you're looking to use? So, solid oxide electrolyzer cells increasing their uh, hydrogen separation efficiency in terms of energy in and ultimately cost up to 700, I think 750 is probably like the absolute ideal. Um, but the cool thing about those cells is that they could accept 120 degree wet steam and they still have efficiency, uh, incremental efficiency gains over the historic PEM and alkaline low temperature electrolysis systems that really have been around for like a hundred years. Um, so anywhere where beggars can't be choosers, we could get 250, we love it. 300, even better. 400, even better. And uh, as we move towards integration with SMR, that is when we can really tailor it to the maximum efficiencies. Cool. Uh, oh, Randy, uh, can you get in the microphone there? Testing, testing. I was curious, what volume of seawater would you be ingesting? I'm guessing it's probably really small, but the, anything no regulatory agencies would be concerned about, but do you have any idea? The amount of water will be pretty substantial. For one kilogram of hydrogen today, we would need about nine kilograms of fresh water. The likely application is going to be on a either seabed or near shore mounted platform, because being close to abundant seawater is really important. 
We also have to get crazy good at desalination. The hydrogen production inputs needs to be essentially lab grade water. Now, luckily, there's a lot of valuable stuff in that brine as well, including a lot of thorium, as I've been led to understand. So about nine kilos of water for every kilo of hydrogen, that hydrogen kilo as well, there'll be some inefficiency loss. So you could probably look at it as a 10 to one or 15 to one liters of water input to liters of fuel output at a rough estimate. Very good. Well, let's thank Dan for coming all the way from Vancouver. Thanks, John. Thank you, man. Appreciate, Appreciate it, it. Absolutely. Uh, I want to take this and, uh, yeah, I, I just want to take you, I, I, uh, these little interstitial times while we're bringing up the next speaker who would be, uh, Alex from, uh, Curio, uh, uh, we'll, we'll wherever he is, <laughs> oh, there he's waiting in the wings. All right. Uh, but while we're waiting to change uh, change over the presentation, uh, I want to also recognize uh, Cannon Brian here. Uh, Cannon is a super founder. He uh, helped found uh, Terrestrial Energy, and uh, he's definitely a founder of uh, Synergetic Synthaline. Uh, and you all wouldn't be sitting here if it weren't for Cannon. Way back when. Uh, back in 2008, when I was uh, infected with this thorium bug, uh, I just I made a deal with you know somebody I don't know somebody upstairs or just to myself that uh, if I could get you know if you remember the housing market was not awesome back then and uh, by some miracle I was able to sell a property and I said if I do this I'm going to take all the money I make and I'm going to start the Thorium Energy Alliance with that and then when I did I said. I called up Cannon. And I'm like, so, who uh, who can you talk to? <laughs> yeah. And he, you know, it's kind of like uh, shooting from the hip. And he's and so he really he saved us. He he donated money. Was the first guy to give us uh, money. First guy to help us reach out to folks like Jim Kennedy and Jack Lifton. And uh, so, uh, thank you, Cannon, for for all you've done. And uh, this synergetic is going to be a really really fantastic uh, way to use. Uh, all this technology that's being developed here. So uh, I want to introduce Alex. Alex is from Curio, and uh, if he's watching online, I want to also thank uh, Rabbi Moskowitz uh, for being so generous and for generously allowing Alex to, to come here. And uh, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you doing this, Alex. And I'll let you further introduce. So thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm not big Canadian side, so I need to lower <laughs> this. So, let's, this is, is that the right oh, you're it's right. It's the, yeah, the yeah, link. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Oh, okay. Oops. Can you make it go full? Oh, yeah. oh, there you go. Just like Netflix. <laughs> Thanks again. All right. Yeah, thank you for having me here. Coming through all right? All right. Uh, I'm here presenting on behalf of... Okay. I'm here presenting on, the half, on behalf of Curio. And uh, at Curio, we believe that the... Oh, okay. At Curio, we believe that the future is nuclear and that the future of nuclear is a circular economy. Now, recycling spent nuclear fuel is a rich topic with a lot of intimate details about it. I'm only gonna scratch the surface here, but hopefully I can get you guys excited like we are. So first, a little bit of an introduction to our company. Uh, a lot of us, a lot of people call us a nuclear recycling startup. Uh, while that is true, we focus mainly on nuclear recycling. Uh, nuclear recycling opens up uh, a wealth of opportunities that we want to explore and bring to the future. 
So we view ourselves more of, uh, as a nuclear innovation technology company. So I was taking an Uber here, and I was talking to the Uber driver, and I, I mentioned I came here to present on recycling spent nuclear fuel. And he said, oh yeah, that's a big problem, nuclear waste. And I said, do you know anything about it? And he says, no, but I do know <laughs> that it is a problem. And fair enough. Uh, right now in the US, we have something close to 90,000 metric tons of nuclear waste. It is sitting across 81 sites. Uh, all of that was supposed to go to Yucca Mountain. We have a nuclear waste fund that we collected money for. That's about $50 billion it's up to now. That is not going to be enough to pay for it based off current estimates. And Yucca Mountain is just not happening anymore. So what do we do instead? We, we have it sitting on site. And we're paying about a $1 billion a year to store it on site. Now, if you look at the fuel itself, 96% of the energy potential is still in there. Uh, about 95% of the spent nuclear fuel is uranium. And we want to recycle that. So what do you do is you build a facility that could recycle that. So we're making about 2,000 metric tons of spent nuclear fuel a year. We want to construct a facility that will process 4,000 metric tons in a year. Now, at that level, you'll be able to produce enough uranium to power about 40% of the reactors now. And if you use the transuranic uh, product, turn that into advanced fuel, you could power a roughly an equal amount of advanced reactors for that. Now, we want to go on this at a more economic approach. Currently, other countries recycle, but they see that more as a task that the government needs to do. We want to approach this from an economic perspective. We want to recycle and not just for it to cost money, but to make money doing it. And by doing that, we focus on trying to extract as many products as possible. So we're eyeing something over 10 products that we want to extract out of the spent nuclear fuel to sell into the markets. And in doing so, we plan on reducing the waste volume by 96%. So we think this is possible by using our key technology, New Cycle. New Cycle is what you see here. It's kind of a cartoon version of it. Uh, but it, it focuses on three different unit processes. The first one being decladding via oxidation. Now this is where we can take the product, the fuel, spent fuel rods as is, put them into our facility in the first unit process, and it will open that up and turn the product into uh, a nice mixture that we can work with. Then we take that to fluorination. We're looking at selective fluorination. And where this is exciting is you can take the uranium out as UF6, and if you look at the front end of the fuel cycle, we turn uranium into UF6 before we put it into enrichment facilities. So this can go straight back into the front of the fuel cycle, how we use it now. And then at the last bit, we're going to use electrolysis to extract out the remainder of the products. And this is where you'll get out your plutonium and your other minor actinides. You'll get those in a commingled state we call true fuel. So when developing our technology, we had a series of goals that we wanted to achieve. So in the first unit vessel, we wanted to split open those rods and turn the spent nuclear fuel into this small powder that would, that would really react with uh, our fluorinating agent. Um, we want to really reduce the amount of spent nuclear fuel that is left on those cladding holes. And a lot of the cladding holes particularly the zirconium one, we, use, we also want to recycle that and put that back into the fuel cycle. Now this is also the first point where we'll get out key isotopes. Uh, one is Krypton-85. Right now we regulate that. Uh, we don't want that to be emitted. But we also use it. Uh, we use it primarily for leak testing. It is a great material that you can use to test for leaks. Uh, we use that in the defense industry. And right now, 
Russia has a, a virtual monopoly on it. And in recent years, we kind of found out that it's probably not a good idea to rely on Russia for key isotopes that we use in defense. But there's other isotopes we want to get out. We want to get out tritium. Uh, iodine is not really used for anything, but is a problem with uh, disposing spent nuclear fuel. We want to get that out there. Uh, xenon is important for space travel, things like that. And we want to get that out at this point as well. The next step is fluorination. Now we're looking at a temperature based selectivity uh, with fluorination. Right now we are focusing on a, a unique fluorinating agent that at lower temperatures, it takes out those nasty frission products that will fluorinate. And as you raise up the temperature, it will start to react with uranium. So you can take that uranium out in a, a near pure form that you can do very little processing to it after and then just put it straight back into the fuel cycle. And right now, it looks like plutonium with our fluorinating agent, plutonium will never fluorinate. It will never turn into a gas and it will never come out at that point. So that will stay in with the other minor actinides and with some of the fission products. So that's a, definitely a safety and security standpoint that is very valuable. Now for the remaining product, uh, we want to co-extract that out as true fuel. True fuel is a unique product that I'm going to talk a little bit more about, and that will be great for advanced reactors. Um, but there's not just true fuel there. There's also a lot of precious metals. One thing we're looking at is platinum metals. You can get a lot of those out at this point. Um, and two isotopes that we are looking at at this point, trying to extract, is strontium and cesium-137. So strontium-90 and cesium-137, these two produce something around 80% of the heat in your spent nuclear fuel. And that's one of the main limiting factors when it comes to disposing your spent nuclear fuel. But for something like strontium, there are companies out there like Nano Diamond Batteries that want to use this and turn this into, take the heat, the, the radiation from it, and just turn that straight into energy. They're looking at making these small batteries that will last years and years. Um, so if we can take that, that's a huge problem for disposing this, and then just turn that into a product that you could use in the economy, that would be great for us. So we have these ambitious goals. We took them to the, some of the national labs here. And luckily, we got four of them to say that they are enthusiastic. They have time and ability to help us develop this. So up here, we have sort of an organization of those labs. We have Idaho National Lab, Pacific Northwest National Lab, Oak Ridge, and Sandia National Labs. We also have Spectratech. That's an early engineering partner. And together, we came up with a research program that we pitched to ARPA-E. And this is to do some of the early uh, proof of concept work for this. So luckily, they accepted that. We got our ARPA-E project funded. Uh, they were focused on the first two unit vessels. The third unit vessel, we ended up getting a gain voucher to explore that. But right now, we have uh, Oak Ridge, who is doing the first unit process, uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab, doing the second unit process. And there we have Bruce McNamara, who uh, originally found this temperature selectivity. Um, so it's great to have him on board. Uh, and then we have a full integrated demo that's going to be produced at Idaho National Lab. Now, right now, we're working on simulant material. And we've already shown pretty good sep separation with the simulant material. We got pretty pure uh, UF6 out of that. And at the end of this year, early next year, that's when we're going to start doing these tests with actual spent nuclear fuel and just see what that looks like in a radiation environment. Uh, and then Sandia National Labs, they're going to take some of this early data that we get out and use that to help us construct uh, safeguards by design for our facility so we can keep this uh, secure and safe. Now, what does this mean in terms of waste if we are successful? Well, this means a dramatic reduction in the volume of waste that's going out. Uh, 
Right now, you can compare this to Purex. This is what is done in other countries like in Russia and in France. And we're looking at an order of magnitude reduction in the high-level waste. So when you have waste volumes this small, you no longer have to focus on these large uh, consolidated facilities like Yucca Mountain. So something like Yucca Mountain, they expect it to cost $90 billion. I think that was back in 2000 something dollars. It's going to be over $100 billion now. We have $50 billion in the spent nuclear waste fund, which, by the way, is already spent. So we have to somehow get that money back up. So when you have these small volumes, you can really open up other opportunities for spent nuclear fuel disposition. Uh, so what we seem to favor at our company is deep boreholes. So boreholes, instead of these big facilities, you just have a small hole that is dug very deep, talking miles miles deep underground, to where if even if the packaging breaks, it's not going to get back up to the surface for millions of years. So when you have these huge reduction of volumes, you could actually take all the spent nuclear fuel in the country right now and dispose of that in four boreholes. So this conference room right here, that is enough space to dispose of all of the spent nuclear, nuclear fuel in this country if you were to process it. So that's a huge deal. That opens up a huge opportunity. Right now we spent in the nuclear waste fund something like $800 to $1,000 per kilogram to dispose of it. And if you look at some of the, the prices coming out of La Hague for their processing, that's about $1,600 per kilogram. So that's already too expensive. We want to get something that is much cheaper and then reduces your waste disposal cost as well. So another thing we're looking at is the transuranic product that's come out. We call it True Fuel. Now this uh, product is going to be different depending on the spent nuclear fuel you get out. But when you get to the volumes that we get to, you can somewhat homogenize that. You can mix batches. You can get some more standardized fuel forms. So right now we're doing some studies of what would this look like in different types of reactors. So up here we have uh, light bridge fuel. They're an innovative advanced fuel, uh, fuel design company. Uh, they're looking at putting metal fuel in current day light water reactors. That is attractive to us because there are light water reactors right now. So we can actually address that market right away. Uh, and we also looked at something like EBR2. That's where a lot of these fast reactor companies, they're basing their design off of EBR2. But when you put true fuel into these reactors in a thermal system like an LWR, uh, true fuel is a pretty good replacement for HALU at that point. Uh, you might want to remove the minor actinides at that point for various reasons, such as waste and safety. But in a, a fast reactor, you can really utilize a lot of this stuff. Um, and there you also get, instead of this 2.5 neutrons per fission, you get something closer to 3 neutrons per fission. So that, that's a huge deal when it comes to transmutation of products in these fast reactors. So putting true fuel in a, a bunch of these other reactor designs are all well and good, but really what you would want to do is you build a reactor that is specialty purpose for this fuel. So our CEO always brings up the... Um, the, the metaphor of uh, IBM and Microsoft, where IBM was looking at this as a hardware design, and that was the future, and you'd think that IBM would be the biggest company you know, 10, 20 years in the future if you're looking at it in the early 90s. But Microsoft was looking at it as a software design, and it really took that software, and that really ended up driving the technology. But we want to take the fuel and drive reactor design from that. So we want something that is you know, safer, more economic than what comes out now. So we here at Cario are pursuing our, our own reactor design. We call this the homogeneous plutonium eliminating reactor. We shorten that to HOPE. Uh, this will be a molten salt reactor. Uh, you have some issues with fuel, like true fuel. That can sustain a fission, a chain, fission chain for a very long time. but. If you have these solid fuel rods, they degrade over that time, so they can't actually keep up with true fuel. But if you have a liquid fuel, that could really 
realize the full potential of true fuel. Uh, so we have essentially this two fluid reactor design. Now one uh, bonus of true fuel is that it's very dense in fissile material. That's typically what you run your reactor off of. So when you, you have a molten salt, you want it to be at a, an ideal concentration for hydraulic purposes. But you're now limited at what enrichment you can get your uranium to. But with true fuel, you can have a lot more fissile packed into there, so you can make the reactor design a lot smaller. So we're looking at this two fluid design. You have sort of that central cavity region. That's where the core region is going to be. That's going to be a fast spectrum that is burning this, you know, quote unquote waste, and instead turning that into uh, cheap, clean energy. And then we have this secondary region, which we're going to fill up with graphite and turn that into a thermalized region. So as a result of this, you get kind of these two spectrums. One neutron spectrum in the reactor, which is characteristic of a fast reactor, but then this secondary uh, neutron flux spectrum in the secondary salt, which is much more thermalized. Now, where there's advantage for a thermalized spectrum is that uh, materials tend to absorb neutrons much more readily at that. So this really increases the transmutation potential. And where that could be a big deal is if you could fill up this blanket with thorium. So once you have a bunch of thorium in there, you can produce a lot of uranium-233. You can take that out of there and put this into a lot of these proposed U-233 thorium fuel cycle designs and start that up just on a thermal spectrum there. And that's where U-233 is really the best, is in a thermal spectrum. Uh, but we also get some other advantages. We have our chain reaction is dependent on these thermal neutrons, but they're a lot easier to control. You can use, uh, control rods are much more effective on them. So we can run this reflector control essentially to increase the safety margins of our reactor. So at the end of the day, uh, we're hoping to bring new cycle into, into fruition, and with new cycle, that brings a lot of opportunities in the future, not just with advanced reactors, but with medicine, with industry for other isotopes. And we really hope to, to foster this community in the future. And, and really, there's, there's a lot of applications that you can use, not just medical and industrial, but Space, that's another one we are also looking at. And I'll be happy to talk to this anytime with anyone after this, but thanks for listening to my presentation. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, does anybody have some questions? I got a question. Uh, so just this past week, uh, you you may be aware that uh, Shine up in Wisconsin wants to do a little, much less complex version of this, but they want to do a little bit of fuel recycling also. And uh, we had the uh, typical usual suspect pants wetters like Ed Lyman and, and McFarlane wrote a big letter saying how scary and awful and proliferation causing that would be. So... I mean, you don't need to give away your secrets, but like, what do you think your general way to uh, deal with these uh, these people who want to block your progress? Uh, yeah, I, I predict there'll be a problem. Um, <laughs> the big issue with Shine is they're looking at something like a Eurex type system. So they're extracting the plutonium with the uranium. And if you looked at their argument, they said that putting uranium in with the plutonium was not a big enough of a barrier in their mind. Uh, the standard right now for increasing the barrier is to include fission products with the plutonium. We plan on extracting the plutonium with fission products at that point, so it's a lot safer from that perspective. Good. Is there... Okay. Uh, good morning, uh, Ron Medina. I did have a question on the, the deployment of the, uh, uh, the news cycle, so is it like the Yucca Mountain, you have a central facility that these 86 uh, sites would bring their spent nuclear uh, fuel 
or would it be an in situ uh, kind of uh, deployment where these 86 sites would uh, conduct, uh, uh, use the new cycle process and uh, dispose of their fuel? So right now, we're looking at a central facility that has a lot of uh, economies of scale with it. One of the big issues is security. Uh, talking to the people at Sandia, you have a, a, a fence around it that could, your operation costs could be pretty close to 40% that. And when you had these different sites doing it, that can really increase your cost. Um, so we think the most economic approach is going to be a centralized facility. But our design is modular. Uh, if you remember that tri-unit vessel, we're going to have 10 of those in a facility. So that could be easily split up into two facilities if the economics prove out that way. Do you have a target date for when y'all would start on commercial production? Yeah, the commercial deployment, we're looking at something from the early to mid 30s. Um, right now, we are planning the next stage after the RPE project is to go to a pilot facility. We want to do that under DOE authority because that will be a lot easier. We can get the data from that point and just take that to the NRC and say, this is how this process works. This is how it's going to work. This is how it will be safe. Um, the NRC is, of course, a big question mark, but they have their, their time goals out there. And if they stick to them, it could be more towards the early 2030s. But if they, they do what they normally do, it will probably be more like the mid-2030s. Very good. Let's give Alex a hand. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. I'm very, very grateful for you. Uh, so, uh, da, 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 da. so now on their way up here would be uh, Eric Meyer and uh, and Matt. So let's see here. Da, 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 da. Hopefully, I didn't. Give away any secrets there by you know, previewing the thing. Oh, so uh, I love Eric, man. You're, yeah, I'm so proud of you, and I'm so glad that you uh, made the time to come here. Uh, Eric, uh, Eric started Generation Atomic, and it's clearly by far the greatest uh, atomic outreach group in the world. And so you should be proud of yourself, and so should your brother. And I'll let you take it from here, brother. Oh, man. Thanks, John. Uh, high, high praise. Um, let's see if I can get this thing in here. There we go. Oh, man. Um, yeah, well, of course, uh, I don't know that I would be here uh, or uh, a, a lot of nuclear advocates who, who do this kind of thing part or full time uh, without the work of the Thorium Energy Alliance, uh, some of the you know, most prolific nuclear advocates in the world. Uh, you know, folks like Mark Nelson, even, who um, uh, couldn't be here today, uh, credit uh, this organization and the, the video work of, of Gordon McDowell uh, for first piquing their interest in, in nuclear energy. And uh, so let's just give a round of applause for the Thorium Energy Alliance. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> right? So certainly kind of the... Uh, the butterfly effect of uh, <laughs> nuclear advocacy here. Uh, so if you're in Albuquerque uh, in October of 2022, uh, you saw me run through a bulleted list of positive developments for nuclear. Man, uh, so we're here for the sequel now, and holy cow, it's been a really busy uh, 16 months or whatever it's been uh, since then. My goodness. Um, so we are going to start uh, since then. Um, so that was in October, I believe, that conference. I don't know what happened in November. I think we're all just like working off our hangovers, but not a whole lot. So we'll start in December <laughs> of, uh, of 2022. And uh, I don't think we could take credit for this, but yeah, Miss America, <laughs> the nuclear engineer, Grace Stanky. That's pretty awesome. She's great. Um, 
And uh, yeah, and she she just did uh, some collaboration with uh, Kirsten, uh, who does a lot of our, our TikTok videos. If you uh, follow us on Instagram, or I think we post them a few different places, but uh, you'll see uh, Kirsten, the very uh, fun uh, b- young blonde lady, uh, telling us all about about nuclear and energy. Okay, uh, let's get into January of 2023. Um, so uh, NRC did the what a lot of us thought wasn't possible and certified an SMR design. Uh, it was new scale, and that maybe isn't all of our favorite reactor design, but it's a start, and we see the regulator very much interested in getting better at, at uh, approving new designs, so very promising step for the future there. Uh, then we saw G Hitachi sign a contract uh, to deploy the BWR X300 in Ontario. Uh, I know maybe some of us in here would have preferred if they picked terrestrial energy, but uh, alas, uh, it is a good sign for the industry that um, SMRs are getting uh, permission to go forward and funding to do so. Uh, in Belgium, a country that's typically been pro, uh, anti, sort of anti-nuclear for the last uh, decade and change. Uh, we saw the extension of a couple of their reactors, uh, Dual and Tiange. Uh, so very good sign for Europe turning around a nuclear there. All right, what happened in February? We got Westinghouse agreeing to build Poland's first nuclear power plant by 2032. They're going to do some AP-1000s there. March, this one kind of came out of nowhere for me, but Arkansas passed a bill establishing a nuclear fuel recycling program. I'm guessing Curio is aware of that. Uh, yeah, it's it's sort of a, a bill to establish a plan uh, type of thing. So not a whole lot of specifics yet, but they have directed uh, one of their, uh, their, I think their state energy department uh, to pursue this, which is a very good step. I'd love to see some other states do similar things. Virginia uh, passed uh, a bill establishing a nuclear innovation hub. So this is a a trend we saw a lot over the last couple of years, a state level legislation uh, showing interest in advanced nuclear. Uh, And then we saw our first hydrogen production from a nuclear power plant uh, in March. So this isn't a crazy amount of hydrogen. I was just looking up. It's it's uh, roughly 500 kilograms a day, uh, which isn't isn't an absurd amount. I guess they're producing that with like one and a half megawatts of electricity. But it's a pilot. It'll get things going. And uh, hopefully uh, we're able to scale up hydrogen production massively uh, with you know, the, the work of our, our friends, uh, Synergetic and, and others on this. Uh, and then John mentioned this already, but very cool. Uh, El Salvador signed an MOU with Thorium Energy Alliance to deploy thorium fueled reactors. That's awesome. Uh, also in March, I forgot to mention this one uh, or put it on the slide, but the, uh, the DOE released the uh, liftoff report. And in that, they projected that we were going to need something like 500 gigawatts of new clean firm electricity uh, from something like uh, maybe new nuclear. Uh, could also be, I suppose, gas with carbon capture or geothermal. But they're projecting that need and also st- stating uh, explicitly that 200, they think 200 gigawatts of, of new, new nuclear by 2050 uh, would would be feasible. That would be incredible considering we have just under uh, 100 gigawatts today. But as you'll see in a second, the ambitions of uh, some of these other countries are even greater uh, than that that goal we have called out and uh, maybe we should rise to that challenge. All right, so we'll get going with April here. Uh, Finland's uh, Oki Luoto 3 started, that's, a, that's an EPR, uh, generating 30% of Finnish power. Good, good stuff. Um, in May, with, uh, so this is sort of a summary one, but by, by May of 2023, 11 states had passed 14 pieces of pro-nuclear legislation. A lot of feasibility studies. Um, I, I called out some more specific ones on the previous slide. Uh, and starting to see a little bit more democratic support but at this point it was a lot of uh kind of republicans sort of like ramming stuff through uh against against the votes of some democrats um i'm happy to see that trend uh you know uh, change a little bit where we're getting more and more democrats because i think we need bipartisan support for these policies to be durable long term 
Uh, Oliver Stone released uh, Nuclear Now. Uh, so that, that was great. Get, get the message out there a little more broadly with a pretty uh, well-known director. Uh, Vogel 3 finally, uh, finally enters service. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Fukushima wastewater released. Uh, is is this a win? I say so. Absolutely. God, I mean, about damn time, right? Man, it's uh, so, so heavily diluted. It's totally inconsequential, yet um, they're so worried about it from a public perception standpoint. And I think uh, in part because of uh, hard work of, of advocates, uh, Pub, uh, pushing journalists to try to cover this a little more honestly, and the IEA was was really great in helping monitor and, and make the release more more credibly seen. Uh, they're able to to begin that. Uh, this was pretty cool. Great British Nuclear, which was first around from like the 70s to the early aughts. Uh, it's back, baby. And they have a goal for 24 gigawatts, a new nuclear, up from their existing six and a half uh, by 2050. So that's uh, you know, a three to four X increase there. Uh, and they're, they're going to need it too with all of their ad advanced gas reactors uh, coming offline. Uh, I got to tour one of them uh, in uh, uh, 2021, uh, the Hunterston uh, gas reactor. And it's just a shame. They're great plants, but they, they built them uh, using graphite and they just they didn't expect the graphite to have cracks and kind of degrade over time. So they're very much more age limited than our, our PWRs where we're using water as a moderator instead. So they got, they got some work to do and they're going to be switching over mainly to PWRs. It seems they you know, they got a few, a few uh, EPRs going now. Uh, India has been building and raising their nuclear ambitions. So they, they connected uh, this uh, Kakrapar 3, 700 megawatt reactor and got that churning out clean electrons. Uh, Start of Halu production happened uh, November 2023. Centris produced their first 20 kilograms of Halu. We're going to need a lot more than that, but it's a start. <laughs> All right, what else we got? So December, holy cow. I think nuclear was on the nice list because Santa had lots of gifts for us in December. Um, for one, uh, after a a almost decade long push. Uh, we got Diablo Canyon extended. Yeah, I'll take some applause for that. Hell yeah. Man, that was, that was great. So we still, we still got our work uh, cut out for us a little bit. It only takes it to 2030. Um, but uh, we are, uh, PG&E has, you know, applied for that 20 year NRC li license and they are taking a look at that now. So, um, you know, if we, uh, if we do put in the work, I expect Diablo Canyon will, will go for another 20 beyond that, which would be amazing. Uh, Illinois lift their moratorium, uh, for SMRs only, a uh, little bit of a, I don't know, a pure, maybe Pyrrhic victory isn't the right term, but they were so close. They, with a veto-proof majority, just blanket lifted the entire moratorium. And then they, the governor came back with a veto, some demands that, hey, this, we, we don't like this because it'll open up the door to expensive boondoggles like Vogel. And the legislature, despite a lot of meetings that we had and a lot of letters and pressure, they decided, okay, we will cave to the governor's pressure and uh, just pass it for, for 300 megawatts and less. <sighs> of course, this excludes things like the natrium reactor. Um, it excludes, uh, I guess, the, the AP300, which is technically over 300 megawatts electric. I think I heard it's like 325 technically. Um, it excludes Rolls-Royce, 470 megawatts, if, if that would ever be built in the U.S. And of course, the AP1000, which is the one we have the most experience building at the moment. Um, so a little bit of a troubling trend, though you could see it that way, or you could see it as, you know, baby steps, um, depending on and that. And California is looking at similar uh, step with 300 megawatts and less. And we are pushing back very hard on that saying, or, and maybe a, this is a good point for me to say, SMRs should not be the buzzword here that we push as advocates. We should be pushing, pushing for advanced reactors. Uh, that is more inclusive of larger reactors. Um, we don't really... We shouldn't really care what size they are as long as they are produced economically, maybe with some degree of modularity. They could be large modular reactors. Why not? Why close the door to promising technology? Uh, 
Uh, we did see the NRC approve. <laughs> I heard a Kairos employee here right there, Ian, hell yeah. Uh, yeah, NRC approved construction of their, uh, their molten salt cooled uh, advanced reactor. It uses a solid fuel, but very, very cool that that's going to be built in uh, Tennessee at Oak Ridge. Um, that is awesome. Excited for that. The Hermes. And then we saw Ukraine and Westinghouse ink a deal for nine AP 1000s. Incredible. Um, hopefully, I don't know, right now it's hard to imagine building things in Ukraine, but oh man, at some point, hopefully this war can come to an end and uh, they're going to need to rebuild a lot of power plants. So um, they'll need that. Uh, we saw the, uh, as part of the NDAA, we had initiatives to boost domestic production of HALU and direct the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to expedite regulatory reviews for nuclear fuel supply activities. So that was good. Some of those provisions were part of a different bill, but they got uh, stuck in there. It's progress. Make sure we got fuel for advanced reactors. European Investment Bank. Long time uh, sort of uh, antagonist to, to nuclear projects said, you know what? Yeah, we're, we're open. We'll fund new nuclear projects. They're, they're, they're bankable, I think was one of the, the quotes they had. Um, SMRs, things like that. Positive development in Europe there. Uh, South Korea connected a new APR 1400 to the grid. And then we had the climate talks. Oh, man. Uh, so uh, Generation Atomic was there with a, a bunch of our international uh, partners as part of the Nuclear for Climate uh, and Net Zero Nuclear Coalitions and a huge, huge development where we had 25 countries uh, pledge to triple global nuclear capacity uh, by 2050. Uh, that's, that's pretty awesome. Uh, and let's see. And then we also had something called the Sapporo 5 come together to uh, put a uh, little over $4 billion into enrichment and conversion capacity, recognizing that maybe we shouldn't be dependent on Russia for this anymore. Um, so that, that was good. Um, and just a couple photos here. You saw uh, there's the 20, 22 countries, I think it was on the first day, and by the end of the week, it was 25. And then uh, on, the, on the right, you see a couple of our, uh, our ladies at our Generation Atomic booth at, at the COP talking to folks. And uh, yeah, would, would that have happened at COP28 if not for previous COPs uh, having very progressively louder and louder nuclear advocacy? I don't know. Um, I, I kind of doubt it. I, I feel like we have shifted the Overton window uh, over, over the last you know, five, five, eight years um, because of this persistent advocacy. And it's, it's so hard to, uh, to measure sometimes. It feels very squishy, but then you get something huge uh, like this happening. So uh, this, this was from uh, the Glasgow COP in, in, uh, in 2021, where we had a, this big nuclear flash mob dance in a public square. It was a lot of fun. Uh, nice. So we are now into this year, our, the year of our Lord, 2024. And we see uh, Japan's uh, regulator, the NRA, <laughs> uh, approving fuel loading at uh, Kashiwazaki Kariwa, which is the largest nuclear plant in the world. Not the largest operating one, unfortunately, but maybe that'll, that'll change soon because um, they are getting permission now to put fuel back into some of the units and get that thing going again. Uh, so that's great. Japan's up to 12 reactors restarted now. Um, so they, they have a long ways uh, to go, but uh, it's a huge, huge priority for them now, uh, amazingly. Um, the White House dropped their renomination of the <laughs> somewhat anti-nuclear commissioner, Jeff Barron. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, that was pretty cool. That was a campaign that was started by uh, Breakthrough Institute that, that we joined with, helped out um, to, uh, to keep him out of there. Uh, and yeah, we had NRC. I mentioned this earlier, but began public comments for Diablo Canyon license renewal. Ontario saved the Pickering nuclear plant. And we have plans for refurbishing uh, uh, four units there. It's two gigawatts for Canada. Very nice. Uh, Westinghouse going to deploy some AP300s in the UK. European Parliament officially labeled nuclear power as, a, as strategic for EU's decarbonization. Um, so opening the door for more subsidies. 
you might remember that just two ish three ish years ago um, there was question on whether it would be included in the green finance taxonomy and uh, thanks to a ton of advocacy we we organized an effort that sent uh, 500 uh, 5,000 letters uh, to members of the European Commission in, in European Parliament um, with uh, friends from 13 countries uh, that was fun translating the same letter a whole bunch of times <laughs> that was good uh, Juice Power Politics in the Grid was released. Did anybody watch this on YouTube yet? Robert Bryce, Tyson Culver, yeah? All right, I'm seeing about 25%, which is about you know 75% lower than it should be, but <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll get there. Um, yeah, really, really good series, raising awareness of uh, you know, grid reliability, like t it starts out with the, the Texas story of, of uh, Winter Storm Uri, talks about how Enron helped break the grid um, by uh, establishing the the market system there, and uh, and then how we can fix it all uh, with with nuclear is a, a, a part of it. Uh, nice. All right, we're into March here. Palisades gets a a 1.5 billion loan for restarting, approved by the DOE. First time we get a nuclear plant coming back from the dead. Hell yeah! That's so awesome. Yeah. I. I, I used to sort of be like, ah, oh, I don't like whole tech. They're, you know, they're the grim reapers of nuclear. They're just there to take apart the plants. Now they're restarting and they're going to build SMRs there. So big turnaround. Uh, good job, whole tech. <laughs> um, yeah, and we had this uh, international summit in Brussels that kind of the follow up from, from COP where we had countries further kind of strengthen their commitments to building out nuclear. Vogel 4, yes, enter, connects, connects to the grid. And then here we are this month uh, at Atomic Hope uh, was screened. That's a, a Frankie Fenton uh, film that uh, has actually a big chunk of it is about uh, the Thorium community at the beginning. Uh, screened over 40 times for universities and community groups. Pretty cool. Uh, and uh, India announced plans to hit 100 gigawatts of nuclear by 2047. That's a 12-fold increase on what they, they currently have. So massive, massive ambition there. And clearly they need it, right, with, with uh, yeah, the low energy use per capita and tons of coal. So I, I love that they, they put that out there. Um, and that is uh, the nuclear wins for 2024. Uh, what made these wins possible? Partially advocacy, I think, because we're getting getting the good ideas out there. Also, you know, uh, economics, policy changes, they're sort of all uh, different, uh, same sides of the same coin or different sides of the same coin, all working together. So uh, advocacy has a really important role to play here um, as, as we go through. You know, Diablo Canyon started out this in 2016, and then uh, it's, it's seven years later, you know, we're, we're celebrating that extension. And if we don't show up, what happens? Um, things like this. We get a lot of ban, high-level nuclear waste storage. Um, this is in Texas, where we are here. I mean, you'd think Texas would probably be fine with this, but we this one was kind of under the radar. There wasn't a whole lot of advocacy around it. And what do you know? They, they banned it here. Um, I don't know. Maybe oil and gas industry had something to do with it. I'm not sure. Uh, what else? Uh, in uh, uh, the Northeast, in uh, Massachusetts, we saw a ban on dis disposing lightly tritiated water. Um, Jim Conk has got some stories about that. He was in the room when uh, these folks in these costumes came up and talked about how, you know, th this water that you'd have to, you know, drink uh, eight eight gallons of in a single sitting uh, to get, you know, the same as a banana or something on that order. I forget what the numbers are, but just absurd levels of this water you'd have to drink to equal very uh, small amounts of radiation. They're talking about how we're gonna, all going to grow uh, extra arms and legs. Um, and then uh, and then Spain is uh, one of the, the fronts of our advocacy fight right now. They're, they're attempting to pursue the same energy plan as Germany right now, um, learning nothing from their example. Um, and part of this is policymakers sort of feel beholden to the people that, surprisingly, that show up and, and talk to them. Um, I, I'm a city council member and at an uh, instance of this where there is this, a great 
development for some affordable housing. And the only people that showed up to talk about it initially were the, the people that didn't like it because they're worried about parking or whatever housing values. And, and it made it hard because it, it checked every other box of being good for the community, but just like the very small amount of people uh, showed up and it made it hard to d uh, disagree with it as a result. Um, so showing up gives the policymakers that political cover to make the right decision uh, for nuclear and for energy. So we got to show up to provide that balance so they don't feel like they're speaking out against the rule of the people, um, even if it makes the most sense. And uh, I guess uh, in service to that, we've been working on the moratorium in Minnesota, uh, you know, projecting uh, uh, things like this up on buildings, meeting with lawmakers. Uh, we have a, built a coalition of uh, about 60 uh, electric cooperatives and uh, a dozen unions and some trade associations. So we're gonna be pushing hard on that next year. Um, it's very, very exciting. And uh, yeah, and then, that's, I think this is the point where I bring up my brother, Matt, who I've been working with for the past couple of years, he's been doing a great job, and uh, he'll talk about some of our uh, outreach strategies and efforts. So good luck, Matt, have fun. <laughs> for the record, I usually don't like going after my brother, Eric, because it feels like a competition. John, uh, Make sure you don't ask me to sing, especially if it's after Eric. Not the one who does that. <laughs> 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 we might have to work on that in the yeah. afternoon. <laughs> All right, so Eric laid out uh, some of the great wins we've had over the, the last year and a half or so. Um, and it's safe to say that if we... If all this momentum is building for more nuclear, we can probably expect to see a lot more nuclear being built in the next coming decades. Um, and so Eric mentioned we're working on turning over the moratorium in Minnesota. So removing roadblocks like that is one key thing to help make this a smoother deployment. But if all of our dreams come true and we do have this sort of situation where we're building new nuclear, that uh, brings us on to a whole nother challenge that we may not have been thinking about too much up until this point. Um, and that is how are we gonna build that workforce that's going to help us build and deploy these nuclear reactors. Um, imagine the situation where many of you who spent probably a big portion of your lives uh, trying to make it uh, so that we can build more nu nuclear in the United States. And when we get there, we have to put the brakes on it because we just don't have the workforce to pull it off. So um, <clears throat> Department of Energy recent liftoff report has estimated that we're going to need another 375,000 new jobs in the nuclear industry by 2050. And this is jobs that are directly related to deployment and operations. If you expand that out to supply chain and other realms that it's not incorporated, that, that number gets a lot higher. Currently, directly in deployment operations, we're sitting at about 100,000. So that essentially means we've got a pretty close to quadruple our current workforce. And on top of that, there's another factor. We need to replace our retiring workforce. Uh, it might not be news to many of you, but nuclear does not exactly have a young workforce. Um, we do have more people that are in the second half of their career as opposed to that first half of the career. So not only do we have to replace people that are retiring, but we have to actually build up uh, people entering the nuclear workforce to build up and, and meet that 375,000 uh, number of jobs. So there's room, there's reason to be optimistic though, because there is Gallup research that has showed that 75% of students, we're talking like high school, middle school age students, have an interest in entering a STEM career. Unfortunately, only 29% of them actually see themselves as, as actually pursuing one of them. So how do we get them to commit? I actually can commit, or I actually can relate to this because I remember uh, in high school, growing up in a small town, I was really, I, my favorite class 
in high school was the physics class. Uh, I actually set the record for the the toothpick bridge that held the most rate r- weight. And uh, but in the end, I decided to pursue a business degree because I I don't know I just was a little intimidated by the math and the physics and all the hard work in school involved with it. So I kind of opted for what I thought of as a safer option. And if we look at bachelor's degrees in the U.S. today, it might be hard to read this graph, but the black line on top is business degrees, by far the highest. Um, that's me. One uh, dime a dozen these days, I think. Um, further down, we see health professions, you know, health, health field-related careers. Uh, then we've got social sciences in yellow, and then sort of tied on the bottom is a tie for, that's where we have our engineering sciences and math. So there's a big gap we want to bridge. Um, we want to be able to convert some of those people that students that want to have uh, a career in STEM or that are interested in having a career in STEM and actually commit to it. So how are we going to do it? Well, as an organization, we have decided to develop some programs that are going to help inspire high school and middle school students in pursuit of nuclear and other STEM careers. And we're going to do that by making visits to science classrooms across the U.S., uh, as well as after-school programs. And we also have another initiative where we're going to actually develop educational materials about energy uh, and, and place them in schools in the hands of teachers that uh, are more than capable of pulling, pulling it off. We just need to get them to the materials. Um, I'm going to dig into each, each of those programs in just a second, but I also want to tell you why did we pick uh, high school and middle school students. And uh, for, well, the big reason is this is a very impactful age, right? Kids are trying to decide what they want to do in their careers at this time of life. I remember personally thinking, being intimidated by uh, getting into something with engineering physics. But if I, you know, if I had somebody come into my school and uh, function as that role model and tell me, you know, oh, you can do this and this is what it would look like if you do this, um, that would have probably been a big impact for me. Um, also, it's just uh, that whole idea of giving, <clears throat> giving, uh, g- giving that important lasting impression at that age when they're making that decision. Um, once again, we think we can bridge the gap between the, the kids that have STEM interests and the ones that want to pursue them. Uh, I said it earlier, 75% have an interest, 29% pursue. Being a role model in the classroom, we can uh, help uh, maybe bridge that gap a little bit. And then lastly, we also see this as a sustainable path for building a workforce pipeline. Um, there's always new students coming up of age, entering into these uh, science classes. And if we can build the relationship with the, uh, with the high school or middle school with that teacher, uh, we can go back year after year without trying to have to seek out a new audience uh, each time. <clears throat> so what are these programs? Well, first program is called Atomic Horizons. And the objective of this is to spark wonderment in nuclear science through its role in clean energy by visits to schools. And these might be a high school science class takeover. It could be an after-school program that the teacher feels that is more appropriate. Uh, it could also be done virtually. Uh, but the idea here is to create a template of a, an impactful experience about nuclear energy that can be replicated in classroom after classroom across the U.S. And uh, in this template, we want to be able to mix interaction, uh, visuals, demonstrations, make it fun, uh, whatever we need to do to make it sort of an impactful, lasting experience. And I should point out there's other organizations that have created uh, educational materials for classrooms, but nobody's really taken the initiative to sort of uh, make it in a replicable template and then really worked hard to get it into classroom after classroom. And we feel like we are uniquely positioned for that. Uh, that's because Generation Atomic has a very broad base of volunteers 
Uh, we span uh, probably a good chunk of the U.S. if we really tap into our volunteer base. And we plan on using them to assist us in delivery. So that doesn't, make, that doesn't mean we're going to have... How do we do it on time? Did I just see a... Oh, okay. All right. Well, okay. I'll, I'll keep moving. doesn't mean we're going to take everybody, uh, but uh, we, it, amongst our volunteer base, we have some really skilled, smart volunteers that are good communicators and can also know how to uh, uh, be good for talking on this. Um, we also see this as having a potential for global impact. As a matter of fact, our volunteer base does expand beyond the U.S. Um, in fact, the idea for this was inspired by a number of international events. Um, two of the pictures you see here were two of our volunteers that decided to take on their own high school classroom takeovers. One is Luke in Canada, and then we've got Dennis in Nigeria. And then uh, probably even most importantly, I actually had a very personal experience seeing this happen when I was down in Jamaica last year. I was invited by Dr. Charlene Smith to join for the, a, a full week of a nuclear energy boot camp that they put on down there. And it's just, it was really fascinating to see the, the light bulb that went off in these kids uh, after being uh, exposed to nuclear energy, the inspiration, and you know, I think there are some really big impacts that uh, were made there. And I should point out that uh, they, this organization is also developing their own version of this uh, to do like week-long boot camps uh, at various places across outside of the country, inside the country. And we do, even do have uh, one, of the, one of the people here that is working on that program, uh, Shirley Rodriguez in the back there. So I'd like to acknowledge her on that as well. <clears throat> okay, so we're getting close on time, so I'm going to just breeze through this last one. The second program we're working on is called the What's Up Clean Energy Program. And so this is a program where we uh, are going to introduce a suite of educational materials, lesson plans, uh, training on how to pull it off, uh, all based around energy and all based around the megawatt card game. And so this is a card game, many of you are familiar with it, that teaches you how to build an electricity grid, uh, balancing costs, sustainability, reliability, all those things. And so um, we are working on uh, having classroom materials prepared, uh, like a full kit that includes lesson plans that we can deliver with games uh, to a teacher. So they've got everything they need to pull off a very uh, good workshop based on energy. Uh, some of the lesson plans is how to build a sustainable grids, understanding costs and benefits of your various electricity technologies, looking how electricity is generated around the world, how other countries are doing it, how have they decarbonized, that sort of thing. And this is, we also feel it's going to be interactive game-based learning, which lots of research tells you that this is a good way for students to learn. So lastly, we're very thankful for John and his support, Thorium Energy Alliance, uh, for having us here. Um, and if you are curious on how you can help, there's three different ways. One, you can support us individually by making a donation. Uh, our website is the easiest way to access that. If you happen to know a teacher or a school that might be interested in having some of these uh, megawatt materials delivered to their classroom, or having one of our volunteers come in and give a talk about nuclear energy in their classroom, you can connect us to them. And also, you can... Uh, connect us to an organization that might be interested in, in um, supporting this endeavor. Easiest way to contact, my email, matt at generationatomic.org, uh, or any one of us really can uh, help. You can always look me up later on today. And that's it. Super cool. It's a... Uh... It's like my, one of my favorite movies, uh, Jump to Conclusions. You know, so, you, <laughs> so we'll just stay here for one second. Or, you know, I, uh, I'm opening up the floor here to, to questions for these uh, fellas. Go ahead, Jim. Race up to that. You might have to turn the mic on. Um, but just, 
I've done a lot of STEM teacher stuff, right? So you, there is a, a national association of STEM teachers. That, that might be a good thing to do. And I put together talks on planetary, because so, I actually started as a planetary geologist, and nuclear in space. And there's nothing like planets to get kids excited about that. And then you say, well, without plutonium-238 and, and, and now the new nuclear rockets and stuff that, that we're doing, uh, developing for lunar uh, and Martian colonies, that, that's a cool way to get them. Yeah, ab absolutely. Thanks for that. And we, uh, yeah, we, we didn't mention it, but let's see, three weeks ago, maybe a month ago, we were at the National Science Teachers Association Conference in Denver and met a whole bunch of teachers, and they're all super excited about uh, getting more nuclear stuff in the classroom. Um, <clears throat> Matt, uh, I'm Mike Pelizzari, and I'm wondering, of all the laundry list of accomplishments of nuclear wins, uh, how many of them were you involved in or Gen A was involved in? All of them? I don't know about yeah, that. Sure, all in oh, some okay. small right. tangential way at Maybe least. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's clear it's a global community. We're all, all pushing in different ways. Um, so yeah. But, yeah. I recognize a few of them you were involved in, but yeah, such a huge list. There's okay. a lot there, yeah, for sure. But I think it's, you know, uh, rising tide lifts all boats kind of thing where good, good headlines for Diablo Canyon help another state pass a feasibility study, stuff like that. Yeah. Yay. Uh, I'm Ralph McBride. Uh, great presentation. I wanted to mention that I think the nuclear industry is missing a, uh, an important segment of the market. Uh, Dow in 23 just uh, announced, I guess, in the last year, their new sea drift uh, facility, 80 megawatt uh, small uh, SMR. And uh, they're doing it on the basis of economics, on the basis, on the basis of carbon reduction, uh, additional steam use for their plant. I think there's a lot of uh, support you can get from the hydrocarbon refining uh, industry that would basically, uh, I think, uh, and Dow's really opened the door. I think they've cracked the door for Motivas, all the, all the large uh, Gulf Coast, Texas plants to get involved and put small reactors in and, and actually it makes economic sense. It makes environmental sense. Just want to encourage you to, to do that also. I didn't, you probably had it on your list. I didn't see it, but in 23, the Sea Drift project is an important development, I think, so. Yeah, yeah. Great presentation, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think we had the advanced reactor demonstration projects. I think we're on the, the 2022 one, but you're, you're right, there's been more progress for that. Yeah. Do we have more? Uh, yeah, go ahead. One more? Okay. okay. I was just curious, the, um, the sanctions on Russia and the lack of importing oil into Europe and, and other parts of the world, I suppose, has certainly been a big push uh, to help nuclear, I think. I wonder if how you feel about, um, is this gonna be a permanent change? Will they hopefully get addicted to nuclear? Or do you feel like maybe in 10 or 20 years, people will kind of backslide and go, hey, you know, we wanna, we're gonna change back? I, I think once you go nuclear, you, you know, you don't go back, you know, <laughs> unless you're Germany. But <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, you build those plants and the U.S. has shown they're good for 80 plus years, maybe. So heck yeah, long term, let's do it. Hi, just a quick uh, comment. I wrote about uh, nuclear on Mars in 2017 with uh, Thomas Dolan, which was a fabulous project that was spearheaded by John Kutch. I am, and the second edition is coming out, actually, it's right now. I'm happy to work with you and develop a curriculum because there's lots of thorium and uranium on Mars. I have the data in my chapter. Happy to work with you guys and develop a curriculum and I'm publicly declaring it, take it for free, it's fine. <laughs> All right. Awesome. So thanks for that. I'm happy to do that. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Stephen. Very, very good. Uh, now we got to kind of move. All right, fine. Give it. Just one quick I'm question. I'm going to be the one answering, though, so I'm going to okay. just pretend. Just one quick question. The sure. Indian Point uh, plant in, in New York, what was your involvement there, and what is your prognosis for any restart, or is there any hope uh, for, left Indian for Indian Point? Point. Mm -hmm. 
From uh, what I understand from our, our, our friends there, Nuclear New York, who did a ton of the advocacy around that, uh, they started pulling that thing apart almost right away, and it's kind of it's too far gone to actually restart the plant that's there. That being said, Holtec is very interested in SMRs at all of their existing sites, Indian Point being one of them. So my best guess is one of the Holtec uh, SMR 300s, uh, maybe in 10 years, who knows. Yeah, that's a that's a uh, my personal uh, Kiwani up in Wisconsin was the greatest, most efficient nuclear plant in the world, literally from the day it was open to the day it shut down, and uh, uh, so they're talking about bringing Kiwani, maybe not the plant itself because they pretty much destroyed the plant, but they the site license is still active, so just like Holtec, I think. Uh, uh, the company that got the disposition license is now changing their tune. So it's it's like I said, it used to be these companies, Holtec and these other companies, it was like the angel of death. Anytime they got their claws on these things, they were, you know, their whole business model was destroyed. destroyed. And, and uh, 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 I, I, my, my brother's uh, cabin is very close to Palisades in Michigan. So I talked to the nuclear workers up there and I'm like, why does it take a billion and a half dollars to bring this plant back online? I mean, just turn the fucking thing back online, you know? <laughs> and he's like, well, it's not that simple. And I'm like, I, I know, know it's, it's not, not that, that simple. He's like, well, the real problem, what the billion dollars is for, is the minute they, they turned, turned it, it off, off they, they destroyed the fuel loading machine. And I was like, oh, all right, well, there, there's your answer. So, so the, these guys are so eager to, like, like destroy these unbelievable assets at the... It's going to cost now we have to spend a billion dollars to build a new machine from scratch uh, so that attitude is uh gratefully that is changing so uh you guys can talk amongst yourselves for one second while i bring up the next uh critter here give you guys a topic <laughs> da, da, da. Uh, okay, so the next person we're going to have up here is Mike Connolly, uh, and he's going to talk about the finally long-awaited, you know, finally completed book. Uh, there we go. <laughs> Uh-oh. Yeah, what's going on, Mike? You got to... It's a proximity alert. <laughs> I didn't do that. <laughs> All right. There you go. That's my first slide. All right. All right. Uh, with, uh, I'll let Mike introduce himself. I'm very grateful that you came here, and I'm glad that you got the, uh, pulled the book across the finish line. That's so. great. So how do I make the slides move? I'll be Downey? I'll be Downey? Yep. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. My name is Mike Conley, and I'm the co-author of a new book called Earth is a Nuclear Planet. My esteemed co-author is Tim Maloney in the back row there. Stand up and take a bow. And our senior science advisor is Dr. Stephen Boyd. And he'll answer any tough questions. I'll answer the easy ones. Uh, one thing I want to add to... Uh, um, thorium, uh, excuse me, uh, Generation Atomics list of accomplishments is they helped us get this book published. They did a great job. They backed us up literally for years on this project. And it was a big project. Yeah. It was a big project. It took me and Tim about five years to write this book, part time, but anyway, five years. And uh, one thing I want to mention. Um, Eric mentioned the thing about the Fukushima water release. We had Philip Holt, who's in Generation Atomics. Are you here, Philip? No. Anyway, uh, he did calculations on the uh, Fukushima water, and we determined that you could drink one half shot of that water every single day of your entire life, straight from the tank, prior to any dilution, and it would equal nothing more than the radiation you already get from the potassium in your diet. That's how dangerous that water is 
hundreds of news articles, protests over a half shot of water per day that would equal the potassium that's already in your body. Welcome to the world of nuclear fear. Anyway, I'm going to talk about a section in the book um, that we explored that I think is really important, and I think we should talk, uh, people should talk more about it. And the title of this is called uh, Nuke uh, Import Zero. So um, I'm a writer. I'm going to read what I wrote because I'm not an extemporaneous speaker. Um, anyway, while this is a thorium conference, and while I'm a big fan of all things thorium, I'm here to talk about uranium. Because even though the thorium that we have could power this country and the world for the next several centuries, the first phase of any large and sustained nuclear buildout will almost certainly be fueled by fresh uranium burned in Gen 3 and Gen 3 plus reactors and in most upcoming Gen 4 designs as well. This raises three key questions. Will there be enough freshly mined uranium to fuel the initial phase of a nuclear buildout? What kind of mining waste would this create? And how will that affect the perception of nuclear power as an eco-friendly, small footprint, carbon-free solution? Now, you've all seen graphs concerning the material throughput of nuclear versus renewables per terawatt hour of energy delivered. Here's a popular one. While graphs like this present a favorable picture and make us right proud of our preferred technology, they only depict the finished material throughput without considering the raw material or displaced earth from whence the finished material is derived. So my co-author Tim Maloney and I started thinking, just how much raw material is piled up behind all this finished material? We did a deep dive on this, and the details are in our mining supplement in the new book, Earth is a Nuclear Planet, which you should read along with the supplements. Generation Atomic has it for sale somewhere in the back, and if you can't find it here, buy it online. And uh, while I'm on the subject, they will also be putting out the companion book real soon. The l &T Report is a brief guided tour through the research of Dr. Ed Calabrese on Herman Muller's infamous linear no threshold model of nuclear fear mongering, uh, sorry, uh, the LNT model of radiation risk assessment. So, anyway, just how much material is piled up behind all this finished material? Focusing on wind, solar, and nuclear, Tim and I gave these technologies every reasonable recycling advantage to reduce the material throughput. For example, 47% of the steel in this country is recycled, along with 34% of the copper. We also consider the fact that only 43% of uranium is what I call dirt mined by either deep shaft or strip mining, while the remaining 57% is extracted by in situ leaching. It's a process that requires no mining at all, which is pretty groovy. But whether uranium is deep shaft mined or strip mined or leached from underground deposits, the average ore grade at the world's top 25 uranium mines, which produce 80% of the world's uranium, is just 0.08% by weight. Here's a handy table we'd compiled. Now, you'll notice if you squint hard enough that the Canadians' mines have some fantastically high ore grades and some of the highest annual outputs, but their numbers, unfortunately, are outliers. We found that for every ton of uranium-bearing rock that is dug up or strip mined or leached on this planet, you can reasonably expect to yield, on average, only eight-tenths of one kilogram, or just 800 grams of yellow cake per ton of raw material. Now, you don't need to be a prospector to know that this means some mighty slim pickings. And the numbers go south from there. That 800 grams of yellow cake will be natural uranium, which has a U-235 content of just 0.07%. 
to make a batch of low enriched uranium fuel at the 4% enrichment level needed for a typical light water reactor, you need to increase the uranium content, U-235 content of the yellow cake by a factor of six. This means you'll need six batches of natural uranium to make one batch of fuel. To make 19% enriched HALU fuel, the high assay, low enriched uranium for an advanced reactor, you'll need more than eight times as much yellow cake. HALU is a fuel form for most of the upcoming Gen 4 SMRs, or small modular reactors, which are basically small, modular, and improved light water reactors. Fueling more reactors, of course, requires more mining. The problem is the average ore grade on this planet for uranium is so meager that even when we apply a 50% discount for in-situ leaching, the humongous volume of waste rock from digging up or scraping up the other 43% of global uranium is downright embarrassing. Yes, it really is that bad. We poured over the numbers for a solid month, and that's what we came up with. That tall yellow stack, that's the raw material from which the U-235 is derived. Now, we could cut this in half with just, if everybody had reprocessed their fuel like the French do. It's a fuel so nice, they use it twice. But even if the whole world recycled their used reactor fuel for more, more, one more round, nuclear power's raw material throughput per terawatt hour would still be about the same as solar and not even as good as wind. We clearly need to do better than this. And thankfully, there are a number of excellent alternatives. One of them, of course, is thorium, which doesn't require any enrichment, and that means a lot less mining. As John Kutch likes to say, thorium is good to go right out of the ground. Even better, thorium and uranium are found in the tailings of other mines like phosphate digs in Florida. Processing our fuel out of their waste will reduce our mining footprint and their environmental impact. So it's a win-win situation if we can get the cost down to compete with mined uranium. Now, when Gen 4 reactors come along and finally come online, we can feed them whatever's available. New or used fuel, thorium, depleted uranium, downblend and plutonium, it's all good. Because while slow neutron reactors, including slow-spectrum molten, re molten salt reactors, can be picky eaters, a fast reactor will fission just about any actinide you feed it or turn it into something that will. Think of them as compost bins for nuclear waste. And remember, it's only waste if we waste it. But as things stand right now, alternative fuels and advanced reactors, fast, slow, or in between, are largely hampered by nuclear regulations that haven't caught up with nuclear technology. And until that happy day arrives, any massive build-out of nuclear power will principally consist of reactors that run wholly or in part on fresh uranium. Even the natrium, Bill Gates' fast reactor up in Wyoming, will run on fresh HALU fill, fill, fuel pins. Complicating matters is the fact that about 90% of the uranium we can consume here in the U.S. is mined overseas. That number may drop in the next few years as domestic production ramps up, but not, but not by all that much and not as fast as one would hope. Here's a snapshot of current global uranium production. As you can see, nearly 60% of the world's uranium now comes from Russia and her vassal states of Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, and 17% comes from Africa, where China has been scooping up uranium mines. Only 20% of global uranium is mined by our allies, and we don't even have a piece of this pie, at least not one you can see from here. Right now, the U.S. has 95 gigawatts of commercial nuclear power. By mid-century, we will need about 1,700 more gigawatts to match the primary energy grid that Mark Jacobson proposes in his 100% Renewables Roadmap. Tim and I unpack his proposal in our upcoming book, Roadmap to Nowhere, and compare it with an all-nuclear grid. 
We estimate that for a national fleet of reactors to match the performance claims of the roadmap, which proposes to decarbonize all forms of energy and not just electricity, we'll need about 20 times the fissile material we're using right now. And a lot of that material will have to be in the form of freshly mined uranium. Even first-generation molten salt reactors will use a thorium-uranium blend. You need something spicy like uranium or plutonium to get the party started in an MSR. So realize that fresh uranium will be on the menu and in high demand until at least 2050. And actually for a lot longer than that, since any reactor we build now should last until at least 2100. Even longer since every part of an SMR will be replaceable. And most of them are designed to run on fresh uranium. So what's a planet to do? As karma would have it, there is an alternative source of fresh uranium with no mining required. This untapped reserve could power the planet with 10 billion people living at Western standards of extravagant primary energy consumption for more than 200,000 years. They should have fusion figured out by then. I ripped, I ripped this, this picture off from James Conkin's article. There are about 4.5 billion tons, that's billion with a B, tons of uranium in the world's oceans available for harvesting with cheap, eco-friendly, reusable synthetic sponges, and even more efficient methods are in development. But not to worry, the overfishing of ocean-caught uranium would be imposterous. Any amount we harvest is replaced by ocean chemistry, leaching more of it from, rubber, from rocks and river silt. Seawater uranium is abundant, sustainable, 100% mine-free, and 100% renew, renewable. And from all indications, it looks to be commercially feasible and scalable as well. With the development of seawater uranium and the consequent drawdown of uranium mining, the material throughput for nuclear power, even with existing technology, would look more like this. Pretty good, huh? And check out the fourth item on the list. We even factored in the mining waste from digging a repository for a deep geologic storage. By recycling a used fuel and depleted uranium in Gen 4 reactors, and by not mining for more uranium, the raw and finished material throughput of nuclear power will be downright minuscule. As you can see, the difference is the fuel source and not the fuel itself. How's that for decoupling of the world's energy production from the natural environment? There is no way that renewables could even approach a material throughput as small as this, even if we use good old Gen 3 reactor technology, which is what we used in our road trip, our, excuse me, our road test comparison with Jacobson's wind and solar grid. Spoiler alert, nuclear winds. And with seawater uranium, we can also drastically, re excuse me, we can also drastically shrink the material throughput at the front end of the fuel cycle. Gen 4 reactors will lower costs even further while reducing the already tiny waste stream at the back end of the cycle. Up to now, fuel has already, always been a small fraction of the cost of generating nuclear power. But that may soon change. Have you seen reactor, excuse me, have you seen uranium prices lately? They're already approaching the initial estimates for commercial scale seawater extraction. Harvesting technology has improved since then, so commercialization could happen by the end of this decade, if not before. I won't bore you with the details. You can Google it. It's very cool and entirely feasible stuff. As nuclear power expands, uranium prices will inevitably rise unless the source expands or changes with it. 
Ocean-caught uranium could radically change the equation with the potential to power the country for centuries on end without depending on critical materials from overseas to make it happen, what we call import zero. Lucky for us, we have enough steel, chromium, and copper, and concrete to build all the reactors we need right here on the, on, uh, in the United States. But the weak link in any massive build-out scenario has always been sufficient fuel. And waiting for Gen 4 to come along is not a solution. New technology should not be relied upon to make a nuclear build-out work, but rather to make a build-out even more feasible than it already is. Developing this virtually unlimited fuel source would ensure a 100% domestic energy security for the long term, actually for the very long term, even if, even if we were limited to using nothing but good old Generation 3 technology. So it's reassuring to know that we already have the technology to transform the world and plenty of fuel to get it done. It's also reassuring to know that Generation 4 designs like the Molten Salt Reactor, our personal favorite, powered by alternatives like thorium, depleted uranium, and used fuel, will just make everything that much easier, cheaper, and better. That's it. Thank you so much, Mike. All right. Appreciate it. Hey. Will I, oh, just, will, you we can. have some questions for Mike? Yeah. So I got... Oh, hold on. Uh, wait for the mic. <coughs> People at home need to hear you. There you go. Mike, Jim Kennedy. Kennedy. Yeah. Uh, three consulting. Consulting. Here, Mike. I just, just want to point, point out that uh, I was just doing a rough calculation. Right now in the real world, uh, the amount of thorium that you would get as a byproduct or a waste stream from existing mining greatly exceeds 10,000 tons a year. Great. And so you would have zero mining uh, for what would be probably the balance, the entire balance for... That's great, as long as we can get reactors run on thorium. And until then, you know, and hopefully that'll be next year. If it's 10 years from now, you know, whatever. The point being, and even if that is true, which it is... A lot of the SMRs are basically small, light water reactors, and they will principally need fresh uranium or a blend of uranium and thorium, and they're going to last till 2100. So like I said, uranium is going to be on the menu for a long time. Yep. You know, and, and so, so we, we also, also have, have to consider not just forging ahead to Gen 4, but also how can we fuel what we already have? And if government regulations delay or frustrate the rollout of Gen 4 and thorium and fast neutron reactors, and if we are stuck with good old Gen 3, we got to fuel these things. So that's, that's the, the approach, approach I took. Hopefully, Hopefully we won't have, have to do this. this. Hopefully, you know, Gen, Gen 4 will come along and everything will be hunky-dory and thorium and great. But all I'm pointing out here is we already have a solution and things will only get better from here. So take heart. We don't have to get the Gen 4 to save the world. We can get the Gen 4 to save the world even more efficiently, cheaper, faster, and easier. And that's my point. Very no, good. I agree, of course. Fantastic. Fantastic. And I'm hoping that some of those technical slides you make available for some of the work I do, John does, for yep. publications. Well, I got them now. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Is there you got time for uh, one more question? Yeah, if, uh, yeah go ahead. To, to what extent and at what scale has ocean extraction of uranium uh, been? What, what scale have they actually tried to extract uranium from seawater at this point? It's still in the developmental stage. The point being is, Stephen can answer this a lot better than I. He's dug into this. Yes. So, it's a very, very interesting molecule, and more importantly, it's actually a polymer. Poly. Many. So, to answer your question, they're already scaling up to the square kilometer scale. 
the active molecule is called an amidoxime. Very funny name. If I had a, I could draw the molecule in two seconds. I sleep with it in my head all the time. Uh, <laughs> so it can grab a lot. And I stress the fact that it was a polymer. So you have millions and millions and millions of these units with the very special amidoxime hanging off of the main polymer as a side chain. That's why they can uh, scale up to roughly the square kilometer scale right now. Alan? Oh, sorry. Uh, hi, Shirley Rodriguez. So what will be your message for the people who are actually working on advanced reactors? And as a previous designer or of, so, uh, of, of sodium cool fast reactors, including thorium, the people that are here, there's advanced, what will be your message for them to stop what they're doing? Absolutely not all, keep forging ahead on all fronts. I'm just saying that take heart, this is an option if it needs to be exploited. It can be exploited. So my point is, is that we already have the ability to save the world. What we're doing now will just make it even better, cheaper, faster, more feasible. But it isn't a do or die thing. You don't have to get to Gen 4, but it'd be a lot better. better. And we could do what we need to do if we had to with the technology we have now. That's, that's my only point. I mean, I'm a huge thorium fan and a molten salt reactor fan. Uh, don't get me wrong. All right, very good. Okay. Thank you. All right, folks, if you're following along at home, uh, we're coming on a break here. Uh, right before we go to break, I just want to, you know, Mike's book is great. There's a couple other books that have come out recently. The highly affordable brand new edition of the Global Progress of uh, Thorium Reactors, uh, Molten Salt Reactors. Uh, it's, I'm joking, it's, it's astoundingly expensive. So... Uh, but uh, we're going to give one of these away uh, tonight, so I hope you're paying attention because uh, Jen A is going to help us give some of these away during the cocktail hour. Uh, Robert Hargraves of Thorcon uh, has written a very good book, Nuclear, New Nuclear is Hot. I uh, could probably use some cover design assist, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but uh, you know... Uh, you know, the, the contents are really good and uh, applicable to Synergetic. He, he lays out uh, a very good roadmap as to how you utilize process heat. And, uh, and I will be talking about this uh, just a little bit after the break, but there's a fiction book here called False Ratio, and it's like a spy murder adventure novel. Uh, um, and uh, the author, Sirkan, uh, 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 I'm going to murder his name, I'm sorry, but... Uh, uh, look it up. It's it's a pretty good yarn, and uh, I liked it. And uh, I, and they uh, the fellow speaks. You know, thorium is a character in the book, and uh, so highly recommended. So with that, uh, go and do whatever it is you're going to do for the next uh, few minutes, and uh, I will start to uh, howl and scream for you to come back uh, a little bit before eleven o'clock. Thank you very much. If anyone has a tripod I could borrow for a camera, that would be great. It could be a clamp tripod or a three-legged tripod. Thank you. Oh.
I want to speak to you about a new organization called the Eco-Modernist Society of North America. I'm here because we are in the midst of a potentially monumental ecological crisis. It is only through a new environmentalism 2.0 that progress can be made. We believe that our only hope for human advancement and even human survival is through the exponential advance of science in the service of humanity. We stand firmly against the war on science that is predicated on the appeal to nature fallacy, which is the belief that whatever is natural must be good and whatever is unnatural must be bad. This belief has become an impediment to advances in areas such as human health, social progress, and even environmental progress. In the field of medicine, the appeal to nature fallacy has already led to catastrophic outcomes. Resistance to vaccines threatens public health and the lives of children. The unwarranted resistance to GMOs has not only held back the fight against climate change, but it has also hampered our ability to feed the developing world as well. Campaigns against GMOs have also held back efforts to ward off the deadly Aedes aegypti mosquito, which has killed countless millions as a carrier of disease and plagues. The scientific consensus concerning the safety of GMOs is solidly supported in every major scientific organization across the planet. The only thing green about being anti-GMO is the extra cash that is made by overcharging for expensive boutique food. But that won't cut it when it comes to raising crops with accelerating heat stress, droughts, floods, disease, and insect infestations brought on by a hotter planet. It makes no sense to accept the call of the IPCC for decarbonization within the next 12 years and yet reject their conclusion that these goals are impossible without nuclear power, which has proven itself to be the cleanest, safest, and most reliable way of achieving decarbonization. It is the most reliable way to decarbonize simply because the alternatives of weather-dependent power sources are inherently unreliable. And nuclear is the cleanest energy source because it is the only form of energy production that completely encases its waste stream. Super safe, advanced Generation 4 reactors, which will almost completely convert existing nuclear waste to centuries worth of energy, are coming very close to commercialization. In fact, it goes completely against most everything we're led to believe but nuclear is legitimately the safest form of energy generation according to all the accepted worldwide energy fatality data. But there is one thing that nuclear is not safe for, and that is the fossil fuel industry. The fact of the matter is that the fossil fuel industry has a long history of funding the anti-nuclear movement, along with climate change deniers, to protect their bottom line. Solid science is in dire need of a champion. And that is what eco-modernism is all about. Eco-modernism is a new environmental paradigm which looks to reverse the fear of nuclear power and scientific progress in general. Ecology-based modernism is the most direct way to define it. Eco-modernism as a philosophy is described in the Eco-Modernist Manifesto. We believe humanity should not be rejecting technological progress, but rather separate our impacts from nature through the responsible use of technology and urbanization. 
Urbanization is an unstoppable worldwide trend and the best solution to many environmental problems. It offers sustainable development for the human population and is a historic antidote to both deforestation and species extinction as humans move away from using wildlife as their protein source. Vertical, urban, high-rise architecture minimizes the use of land, resources, and energy, enabling walkable cities that facilitates the more efficient use of mass public transit as well. It must be emphasized that our support for technological solutions is definitely not about defending industrial polluters, nor do we accept funding from corporations or industry, nor does our defense of technology imply that we just need to sit back and let things take care of themselves. To the contrary, we believe that humanity is at a crossroads that severely threatens our future on this planet. We reject the idea of resource limits on many levels. The advance of science has a long history of getting around problems of resource scarcity and will continue to do so. Another reason is that Earth is just one of a multitude of worlds available to explore in our solar system and beyond. Comets and asteroids are untapped reservoirs for raw materials. If we could find a way to thrive in artificial ecosystems off-world, we could use what we learn to help sustain terrestrial ecosystems here on Earth. I hope by now you understand the worthiness of our cause. Ecomodernism is really only a philosophy at this time. I want to talk to you about the necessity of turning it into a movement, which will be part of the larger environmentalist movement. For it is only through our presence and participation that there can be any hope of moving environmentalism in the right direction. Our aim is not to divide the environmental movement, but rather to multiply its numbers with the incorporation of many scientific and educational communities that is working to both build chapters of eco-modernist societies and support our growth worldwide. We aspire to increase our numbers by bringing together the numerous supporters of climate action that have been alienated by mainstream environmentalism's wildly contradictory support for the shutting down of nuclear power plants in the midst of a climate emergency and welcome them into our ranks. Thank you.
the last third of this century, our independence will depend on self-sufficiency in energy. The United States will not be dependent on any other country for the energy we need to provide our jobs, to heat our homes, and to keep our transportation moving. Beginning this moment, this nation will never use more foreign oil than we did in 1977. Never. Our imports of foreign oil have been climbing steadily since 1985 and now stand at 42% of our total consumption. We need a long-term energy strategy to maximize conservation and maximize the development of alternative sources of energy. America is addicted to oil, often imported from unstable parts of the world. This country can dramatically improve our environment, move beyond a petroleum-based economy, and make our dependence on Middle Eastern oil a thing of the past. In 10 years, we will finally end our dependence on oil from the Middle East. conversation but you can't have it here <laughs> All right. so uh, very good all right what oh okay <laughs> all right so uh, again if you're gonna keep talking, you gotta go away. I'm talking to you guys. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, uh, I wanna talk about this uh, for a second. Um, can, if, if we have one of the AV guys, can you, can you turn on the projector in the other room? Should just have to press the on button once and it'll kick on. So, uh, uh, so this, this fella, he's from Turkey, and he's like, you know Professor Engine, right? And I'm like, no, what about her? And uh, he's like, oh, sh she's a hero in Turkey, and she promoted thorium. I'm like, get out. I'm like, and he's like, oh, yeah, here... I, you know, they made a tribute uh, video about her. And, uh, and then, so you can look her up. Uh, she worked with Carlo Rubia. And uh, her thing was, uh, her thing was to promote accelerator-driven systems like Carlo Rubia liked. And uh, she was a wonderful woman by all accounts. And if you look her up on Wikipedia, uh, you'll see all her accomplishments as a woman in nuclear. Uh, tragically, she and several of her students died in an airplane crash. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I feel like I got to know her, and we need more heroes like her. So if you give me... A few minutes of your time. Uh, this is a tribute to. Is, is there sound? Yeah, well, we'll find out. No. All right. Well. Mutlaka bir yerden başlamamız gerek. Bizim de kendi hızlandırıcı merkezimizi bir an önce standart. 
<laughs> oh, well, it's closed captioned so people can read. Uh, and we'll play it later. Uh, anywho, while she's speaking, it's a, it's a project. I should, uh, since we don't have sound, I should just uh, scrub through it for you guys. But it's a, it's, it's a video that she made back in uh, 2005 for national Turkish television. And uh, she was, uh, you know, if you read about her, I won't, uh, <laughs> I won't talk for her. You can read about her. You can read her work. And I just found it uh, very inspiring that this uh, sweet lady dedicated her life. And uh, if you read this or you, you uh, look, look at it, you know, she, she, you know, the whole earth was her child and she was a great mother. And, uh, you know, she wanted to make the world a better place. So it was, it was uh, very moving to get to know her. And, uh, <clears throat> and Sirkan, you know, support him too. He's the guy who wrote this book, False, False Ratio. It's a fun read. And uh, I thank him very much for making me aware of uh, Engines. Her name's Engine Eric. And uh, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm grateful to, uh, for, for Sircon to make me aware of her. I wish I'd known about her 17 years ago. So I'll just let it play out here a little bit. How come? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Into every life, a little rain. Um, no, but there are, you type in Engine Eric and you'll see all sorts of, the trouble is they're all in Turkish. So, so this is the only one with English subtitles. I'm sorry. So I'll, I'll put her. I'll put it back up here in a second. But she hits. I think when you hear it, when you see her, when you read it, I guess. <laughs> but but when you watch it, you realize you know she's hitting all the points. You know we could teleport her today, and she'd be like, "Yeah, man. You know, thanks for continuing on the work." Alright. So, anywho, uh, that's that's her name, Engine Eric. Engine Eric is how uh, I was told it is. But you can see this is you just, just do a search, search, an image search. You can see like she's, she's a, a she's, she's a, a hero, hero to the Turkish. Turkish. They, you know, they, they have, have these little splash screens and thumbnails, and you know, she was a real enthusiastic lady. She worked with Carlo Rubia for for years on this, going back in the nineties. And unfortunately, and unfortunately, you can, you can see, see in the center, center there the, uh, the airplane crash that killed her and her students. So, very sad. But, but uh, uh, I dedicate the rest of this conference to, uh, to her memory. Okay, so moving on, while I get this critter uh, loaded up here, uh, we're going to welcome Ganapati Maineni to the uh, stage here. So let's get, to get that thing. Do not save that. All right. Um, Ganapati has been a huge supporter for many years. Uh, let me get rid of this critter here, too. I'm sorry. Making me, watching me do my homework here. Uh, Ganapati, why don't you come up? 
Hey, why don't you give him a hand? Uh, this is also uh, very strategically, I introduced Engine, and maybe you knew her or knew of her, but, uh, but Ganapati is also an accelerator-driven reactor guy, so I figured they should go together. So thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, John. So, yeah, thank, thank you, you for uh, inviting me again. And I started talking about this accelerator. I started talking about accelerator-driven systems by since uh, Google conference in 2010. This is the 14th year, I guess, after that. We actually did a session on the ADS systems at that time. And Professor Furukawa actually gave a talk about his AMSP at the time. We'll look into that later. As you see here, I have many hats. I am affiliated to World Dominion University, Virginia Commonwealth, Commonwealth University, and Virginia Tech. Uh, they're all Virginia universities. I also started a, a, a nonprofit organization called ISOHIM, uh, which is an uh, international symposium on hygiene and matter. So if you think about uh, philosophically and spiritually, we are all hydrogenoids, and hydrogen gives us energy in the form of ATP. So that's where it starts. Hydrogen is the fundamental uh, atomic system, and which has one proton in the center and one electron, and the, the energy force is basically the uh, basis of all this. If you start from that, and we can build up the rest. So as part of uh, what I was doing uh, at that time, at the request of the Indian uh, uh, atomic energy people, I started something called Virginia ADS Consortium. Uh, started in 19, uh, I think 98 or something like that. And anyway, so that became a precursor to Virginia Nuclear Energy Consortium, which is a government body of the state of Virginia, uh, which established Virginia Nuclear Energy Consortium. And to take this concept of hydrogen, uh, basically into the energy system, I came up with this BSE Systems Inc. in 2019, uh, mainly because the proton-driven accelerator systems are going to be complex and they're going to be very expensive. Uh, the idea here is to use the electrons as the driver for uh, transmuting uh, thorium to uranium-233. That is the basis of this forming this company. Anyway, in this talk, I would like to go back to historical perspectives on thorium and Homi Baba, who is the Indian scientist, who is part of the nuclear establishment in the 1950s, also died uh, in a plane crash in near Geneva, unfortunately. Uh, well, anyway, so I thought I, I'd let you know about this in case you are not aware of it. And then we will talk about critical and subcritical nuclear energy technologies, and then the BSC's ASMR, which is Advanced Subcritical Microreactor. I will introduce the topic and then close with a summary. So you might know that uh, Dwight Eisenhower, president, he, August 8, 1953, announced at the United Nations Conference Atoms for Peace. And we are still a long way achieving this. And I think the time may be ripe now that we should take this to heart and do our best to accomplish this, whatever he promised the world. And in 1954, first United Nations Peace for Atoms Conference, Dr. Homi Baba, shown here on the right side, uh, was elected as the president of this unique first conference of atomic atoms for peace at the United Nations in Geneva. And he unfortunately passed away. He was responsible for establishing the uh, Department of Atomic Energy in India. So I think this is very important. He also came up with the idea of uh, nuclear, three-stage nuclear program in India, mainly because India doesn't have uranium. He realized that India has a plentiful amount of 
Thorium, which is a monazite sand around the coastline of India. And here I need to also point out the superconductivity was derived because of the helium that was heated up by the monocyte sand was taken to the Europe to be liquefied into liquid helium. That uh, was the basis of uh, the superconductive science and technology, which is part of this accelerated wind systems, as you see. So it is uh, interesting to note, historically speaking, that Oak Ridge uh, director uh, in 1940s actually proposed the uh, molten salt reactor, fluoride based, and which was implemented in 1960s, which took uh, almost 25 years from the concept to the realization of the program under the direction of Weinberg. Uh, Alvin Weinberg, uh, I think we need to really remember this and then work towards really pushing the thorium technology in the world because uh, you have seen the reasons why it's so important. The goal he has set out is cheap and abundant nuclear energy is no longer a luxury. It will eventually be a necessity for maintenance of the human condition. And that's a similar concepts from Homi Baba, who also started a thorium program way back in 1954 in India. So why it's very important? If we want to get clean air and water for, the, for humanity, the only way we can accomplish that will be with thorium energy, from my perspective. So we'll look into this. This is the three-stage Indian nuclear program, as envisaged by uh, Dr. Homi Baba, they, since India has only a small amount of uranium, they were using candles to produce plutonium, and that plutonium will be used in the uh, fast breeder reactors where the blanket of thorium will be converted into uranium-233. So actually, uh, they built a prototype fast breeder reactor near Chennai, Madras uh, in India and which was supposed to be operational in 2014 and finally the fuel was loaded into this FB, PFBR uh, last month. It was announced by the Prime Minister of India. So uh, then uh, that uranium-233 that will come out of this uh, uh, a series of these uh, FBRs uh, they will separate the uranium-233 and then build this uh, ASW, AHWRs. And this is the plan, and this will probably take 100 years for completion to have this fuel cycle to be closed. So I think we need to think about alternatives of doing this, and that is only possible with uh, the ADS, ad accelerated driven systems. And you know all these things, mainly U.S. is the leader in the light water, light water reactor technology, and unfortunately, U.S. has phased out itself from this technology because it's too expensive because of the safety concerns of such a system. And recently, Jack Devaney, who, was the, uh, who started Thorcon, he came up with this book where he states that underwriter certification of nuclear power is the only way to bring these systems to be successfully back in a commercial economic way. I think that's where I think we need to make progress, mainly because the control systems that are required are very expensive. Uh, that's the reason why uh, it's becoming uh, difficult, I think, in this technology. So historically speaking, accelerators and fissile materials, as you see, uh, Lawrence has proposed in 1915 hyper accelerators for producing fissile materials. And this was taken to heart by Professor Furukawa and the colleagues in Japan, and they came up with the uh, accelerator molten salt breeder reactors, AMSRs, which was actually presented at the Google conference in 2010. And in 1952, 
Louis, Professor Louis, who is from Canada, proposed use of thorium with intense neutron generators. These are all very old concepts, and as I will show you, India thought about using the ADS to short circuit this three stage program so that thorium can be implemented rather quickly. And that was the reason why I got involved into this program. And of course, as I mentioned, BSC Systems is, uh, has a design that can be built within the next two to three years, if the funds are available, that can take thorium uh, itself and make it as a uranium-233 as a fast breeder. So this is India's vision uh, in earlier to use the ADS to basically produce uranium-233 in this process and short circuit their three-stage program. And uh, they realized that this technology is so complex and expensive, uh, basically that is put on hold. And they're actually collaborating with uh, uh, the Fermi National Lab, Fermi Lab in Chicago to build this ADS systems, hopefully in the next couple of decades. So here I would like to look at how you can produce neutrons that are required in these reactors. It can be done either with protons, high energy protons, that is up to at least 600 MeV energy, and you need a lot of power for, from these, or electrons as ADS drivers. As you can see on the left side, the proton energy required for getting the required neutrons for these projects is going to be very expensive. It may cost several billion dollars to develop, and it's going to take decades long. For example, SNS is already built, which is, a, which is producing neutrons, but that is a pulsed machine. That is not viable for nuclear reactor technology. And Whereas electrons only require about 50 MeV energy, and the number of neutrons produced with this system is not high enough to be practical for mega, multi-hundred megawatt scale projects, but it can be used for a megawatt, tens of megawatts. It seriously can be implemented. So we talked about uh, the the professor from Turkey has talked about uh, Mira, not Carlo Rubias ADS, which basically is an energy amplifier where thorium can be used with these uh, neutrons that are coming out of the ADS system. But unfortunately, uh, the costs involved are so much uh, that basically was. Uh, I think basically dead. And there is another system that was in 1995 by Charlie Bauman, who wanted to do accelerated transmutation of waste from Los Alamos National Lab. And that project cost was about $100 billion in 1996, so that dead uh, as a result. And now we have the SNS, and that is a pulsed machine, but that technology can be further developed with uh, quite a bit of time required for that. So there is actually a, a project in Belgium, which is known as Amira, which is supposed to be uh, based on this uh, proton-based accelerators. And it is expected to be operational up to only 100 MeV acceleration uh, energies by about 2030s. And a similar program for uh, the transmutation of waste is being pursued in China, which is called CADS, and that is also going to take quite a bit of time. And this uh, basically is the current status. And if you look back at uh, Professor Kurukawa's design of AMSB, uh, he stated at that time in 2010 it requires more than uh, $20 billion and several decades to bring this up, and unfortunately, uh, this is not being taken up by anyone yet. And he envisaged, but 
that if we build about 20 to 25 of these systems around the world, uh, we can power all the nuclear power plants with thorium, which is uranium-233, uh, to meet the energy needs. So, in fact, what we have come up with a similar system, but based on electron energy, uh, which is only about 50 MeV required. This is a, our plans to build this, which can be built uh, within the next two to three years if the funds are available. Uh, I could say that confidently because uh, the system we are going to see that is built at the university is supposed to have been done within 20 months. So if I think we will be able to build the required electron source for this uh, within a year and a half, and the whole project can be completed by 2029. And that's what we hope to do when the funds are available. So I actually presented uh, this concept uh, to the Virginia Nuclear Energy Consortium Authority, and we hope to build a research center in Yorktown. And uh, Oak Ridge was uh, really very happy to work with us until we found out that the thorium fuel cycle will not be supported in the US. So we had to go to India, and hopefully, by the end of this year, we may have some support for this project. And in this process, we are actually organizing an international nuclear hydrogen conference so that we can bring all the players together so that hydrogen economy can be implemented with this kind of distributed energy uh, based on ASMRs that are using thorium uh, as a fuel. So, so what we are trying to do is uh, we are seeking world community support for developing economic, super safe, and efficient ASMRs, pro providing clean air and water for humanity, as envisaged by USA's Alvin Weinberg and India's Swami Baba. ANS, BRC, BSC, DAE, uh, in collaboration with the India's largest power corporation, National Thermal Power Corporation, we are organizing this conference in August. Uh, please get in touch with me if you would like to get an invitation. Uh, you will be the guest of NTPC. They will take care of all your requirements uh, in India. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I, have I have a quick, quick question, question for you. you. And uh, if any of you else have uh, questions, uh, start lining up at the mic. Uh, my question is, uh, do you think uh, the accelerator-driven technology, like, uh, can't believe I'm bringing them up twice, but like Shine and the guys who are making the nuclear medicines and, and isotopes, is that also under your con consideration? I mean, so basically, yeah, yeah. the uh, North Star is using uh, IBA, uh, rhodotrons to do the same similar thing for producing isotopes like actinium-225, which could be byproduct of our ASMR as well. And also Niawave, another company uh, in Michigan, is also using a 30 MeV electron linac producing copper-67 and actinium-225 as well as uh, uh, technetium-99. So uh, NRC has already approved those. and. I think David is going to discuss about the safety of the MSRs. So our technology is really very simple. And with all that, I think US could make the uh, lead in this. But unfortunately, I think the head is in the sand. They won't see it. They could be the world leaders. And as uh, envisaged by President Dwight Eisenhower, U.S. could provide the clean energy for the world, and unfortunately, we are not. We are a failure because of the, the technologies we are implementing here. Very good. Well, let's give Ganapati a thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I, I guess I have a quick question. Um, I like to say the extent to which civilization can expand is linked to energy. 
China and India have realized this. Hopefully, Europe and the U.S. will figure this out as well. We are here in Texas. Uh, my question is, what do you think it would take in terms of time and money to get to a 10 megawatt kind of pilot setup? 10 megawatts thermal. Uh, it will be less than three years. And how much money? Uh, $50 million. I think the reality is a lot of this stuff's going to have to be privately funded. So, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if they could build the, uh, whatever they're doing here, MSRE for 30 million. Yep. So all we need is another 10 million dollars for the uh, electron system, electron beam power system. It's, they, all the elements exist. There's nothing new here. Well, just, just ask next lamp if you can put, put an, an addition, addition on their facility. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just, just say put, put up three walls, walls instead of four. Yeah. So it's yeah. cost savings right there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, thanks, thanks again. again. Got, Got it, buddy. buddy. Uh, so, uh, I cannot tell you how happy I am that uh, our next speaker has uh, been able to come down. Uh, Ned Mamula was uh, uh, involved with the uh, USGS, correct? Ned? All right, he's shaking his head. <laughs> But uh, more recently, he's been involved with a company called uh, GreenMet, and uh, uh, Ned has spoken at one other of my conferences, and uh, or our conference, and uh, one of the great unaddressed things, like I said at the beginning of the conference, we talk about subjects no other conference talks about, and what you're, if the those of you who are moving on to. Uh, U.S. Nick in Houston after this, you know, I'm pretty sure you're not going to hear about uh, the critical materials aspect of uh, advanced reactors and, and all that. They, and so it's kind of one of those things, it's like whistling past the graveyard. <laughs> so, Ned, why don't you come up and help the audience understand the somewhat uh, not awesome kind of dire situation we have <laughs> when it comes to how are we going to build these things when we really don't have the material to do so, correct? So thanks, and let's hear it for Ned. Thank you, John. Well, John, can everybody hear me okay? John, I want to thank you for the invitation to come here. I really... I'm really glad to be here, and I want to thank my colleague Jim Kennedy for giving my slide deck a sanity uh, look over before uh, presenting it to this group, okay? Uh, I am humbled to be here with you all. You know, we have uh, a lot in common, and I'm going to show you in a minute this idea of thorium and uranium, nuclear energy, and critical minerals is a lot closer than you think. I'll tell you one thing we have in common is the good things that we are bringing to our respective trade spaces on the one hand. On the other hand, we've got to drag policymakers and politicians kicking and screaming to these discoveries and to these good things that we have to offer. So I'm united with you in that. I'll show you in a minute. But I am, uh, first of all, Ned Mamula. I'm, with, uh, uh, I'm the chief geologist at Green Tech Minerals Holding, otherwise known as GreenMet. We are a mining, mineral, metallurgy advocacy firm, and we're in D.C. on K Street. Uh, I was formerly with USGS. That's where I got my minerals background many years ago. And up until a, a year or so ago when I joined GreenMet, I was actually running the DOE Critical Minerals Program, directing that uh, critical minerals program, small and such as it is, but still. Uh, they don't have any geologists in the chain of command, so I got a, I got a great opportunity to, to work with them on that. But I had to move on and do other things. Today I want to talk to you, and by the way, I, I want to uh, let you know that I know I'm the only thing between you and lunch, so uh, I'm going to be, I'm going to be, I'm going to be Johnny on the spot. I'm going to be be getting uh, my message out to you quickly and efficiently, I hope. But I want to talk to you about uh, something that uh, you feel strongly about, and that is American mineral wealth. And there's two things today that uh, I want to touch on. First of all, American mineral wealth, and this goes for most of the world too, but especially our country, we have 
two things. We have an embarrassment of riches at home, domestic. And for the sake of this talk, I put on the second subtitle, we have an embarrassment of import reliance from abroad. And that's the topic John Kutch wanted me to touch on today. Why in Lord's name are we importing at wild, wild rates? And it's getting worse every year, and I'm going to show you how we keep a handle on that. But why do we have these imports? Who's keeping tabs? How are they keeping tabs? And what have they found? And that's what I want to touch on today. And by the way, your, your uh, intro today on the spiritualness of thorium and, you know, cathedral of energy that goes for this, too. You look at a map of our country, you look at a map of these deposits, and you can't help but be struck by the fact that we have everything we'd ever need. And as my great colleague Jim Kennedy said to me once, and it was so elegant, he said, rare earths are not a resource issue. We have plenty of that. We don't know what to do with it. And I said, Jim, Eureka. It's the same thing for the other critical minerals. We're losing smelters. We're losing uh, processing facilities. We're losing it. So things are in the ground, but we don't know how to handle them. So let me, let me roll with these slides. Uh, let's see here. Now, as John said, I was here uh, at TIAC 9 in St. Louis. That, I call that the other solar eclipse. That was back in 2017. So. Uh, that was a fun time, and I spoke about uh, sort of the same, but I restricted my comments mainly to rare earth elements. Um, this time I want to find out what has changed since 2017 till now, and I've broken it up into two administrations. This one here, the Trump administration from 2018 to 2021. We have had, for the first time in U.S. history, a president of the United States define what a critical mineral is, I mean, he didn't do it, he ordered it done, so we have the definition of a critical mineral in Executive Order 13817. We have a secretarial order that goes along with that, and also ordered the release of USGS professional paper 1802. Guys, if you don't have this, search usgs.gov pp1802. You want to download that? and you want it in the upper right hand or left hand or lower right corner of your laptop, and you want it to sit there. It is one of the most unbelievable sources for critical minerals and uh, nuclear that you're going to have out there uh, uh, to refer to. Also, uh, we started to get the DOD uh, involved in their industrial base supply uh, uh, reports. And for the first time, we had the, the USGS compile a list of critical minerals. And of course, the executive order defined what that should be, and the list came out because they met those criteria. Also, the Department of Commerce, although it was one year late, put out the report on calls to action called for in the, executives, in the executive order. And then finally, uh, the president uh, put out Executive Order 13953, declaring a state of emergency uh, via a presidential determination about uh, China and the control of rare earth elements. So you had these actions, and then what you had in the, under this administration, you had some, some similar good things happen. There's a lot of DOE funding for out of DOE FE, also EERE is the, the other half of, of, of DOE. In the LPO, their loan program office, a lot of money going out there for research into critical minerals. I don't necessarily agree with a lot of how it's spent, but it's going out there, okay? Um, also, uh, the Biden administration did put out Executive Order 14017, simply titled U.S. Supply Chain, and that is a worthwhile read, believe me. You didn't hear the word supply chain up until, what, a couple, three, four years ago. All of a sudden now, it's a big word. And then I won't bore you, you can read the rest of those. The, the list of the critical minerals put out in 2018 was re-upped in 2021, 2022, sorry, and some minerals were taken away foolishly 
Okay, uranium was taken off of the list of critical minerals. Potash was taken off the list, uh, potash being the component of fertilizer. I like to eat, thank you very much. I guess you guys do too. Okay, I'm not happy about that. Uh, rhenium, I don't know why. Uh, strontium, and here's a real disappointing fact, uh, helium. <laughs> helium, we need helium. The government's out of the helium business now. I don't know if that's a good thing, maybe it is, but helium's off the list. Rhenium's off the list, strontium's off the list, potash is off, uranium is off. I don't agree with these. Um, okay, that's just Ned. Zinc went on, nickel went on, copper went on, nope, oh, nope, copper didn't go on. There was, for the first time I can remember, I think USGS succumbed to, shall we say, a little bit of politics. Copper should be on there. Lo and behold, DOE has a list of critical minerals, and copper is on there. Hmm. Okay. Anyway, we'll see what the next update, copper should be on there. That is such a no-brainer, I can't believe it. There has been uh, a big push in this administration for mining reform. Uh, it's really not reform. They want to get rid of the claim business. They want to end hard rock mining as we know it. This is probably not a good idea. This is where most of your critical minerals come from versus leasing. You have leasing and you have uh, hard rock uh, claims and then you have saleables. Three classes of minerals. I don't have time to get into it today. We, we can talk more about that. What I want to tell you though is we've gone into an era here in the last two to three years, two years of negative mining where we actually have more mines closed uh, how can I say this? There's a negative number of mines being opened, if that makes sense. In other words, we're not opening mines, we're losing mines every year. The permits are being revoked, they're being closed, they're not having their environmental things reviewed, it's, it's, and of course, environmental lawfare is just destroying our mining uh, sector. This is a problem. So, okay. How to keep track and what to do. I told you, go to usgs.gov, Mineral Commodity Summary 2024. You might say, wait a minute, we're in 2024. They're always a year ahead with the title. This is all 2023 stats. I love USGS. I started my career here and I spent a good chunk of my early years here. It is a venerable, venerable, historic, unbelievable organization to work for and with. When the, its twin cousin or sister or brother, whatever, the Bureau of Mines was shut down, the USGS took on a lot of the responsibility and the data gathering and the, and the and repository. I saw these cardboard boxes coming in by the thousands into the basement of headquarters in Reston, Virginia. They do an admirable job, but they do not do what the Bureau of Mines did, and that was the deep second and third order analysis of mineral forecasting, geopolitical forecasting, um, mining technology, research, all of the great things that the Bureau of Mines did, and it is gone. And you know who complains the loudest about the Bureau of Mines not being here? Foreign scientists and engineers because the bureau of mines would produce reports from other countries better than those countries could produce for themselves so it wasn't a, a national hit it was a global hit and it was a cheap hit because they wanted to reduce the number of federal agencies and they picked the wrong damn one the massive budget of the bureau of mines when it was closed are you ready for the massive number is everybody's 120 million and they fired 1,200 people, half of whom were world-class mining engineers, scientists, geologists, hard rockers. As great as the data gathering capability of USGS is, and this is one of the three, I'm gonna show you the three most popular figures in every year's mineral commodity summary. This is sometimes referred to as the tornado chart. And, okay, it's, no one can argue with USGS data. It's the gold standard. My problem is it's hard to work with. 
you can rip this sheet out of the book and walk away and you would have enough food for thought for a long, long time. But it should be easier to get to and easier to talk to about, uh, to talk to a policymaker about this. Policymaker, well, not only them, anybody, might just, well, you can leave this on your nightstand and it might put you to sleep if, you, if you're kind of an insomniac, you know. Uh, the other popular diagram in the mineral commodity summary is the global. You've all seen this. It, maybe you have, maybe you haven't. This is usually figure three. Every year it's the same, except for the number of countries we're importing from. And they're in colors. There's the code. I won't bore you. You can look it up. And you'll have these slides, right, John? All these up. A relatively new diagram in the mineral commodity summary shows you what the USGS considers primary mining that bullseye in the middle are your, are your, um, your primary minerals mined in this country, okay, metals. And then as you move out of, this, out of the bullseye, you're seeing co-products and byproducts, and the concentric circles are 20%, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100% of the value of the, of the principal product. So this little diagram here is worth a lot. You could tear that out of the book and you'd have a, you could sit and write a thesis or two or three just on that. The other go-to has to be publication of the USGS critical minerals list. And as I said a minute ago, I don't agree with some of their decisions, but they have a mathematical way to arrive at what should and shouldn't be on the list. And I respect that, okay? Um, but it comes out and it's very well done. So these two are how they're reported and who does it and how they do it. And, and I feel comfortable with this, okay? But more needs to be done. Again, this is not workable for most, but on here, let me tell you what you're looking at. 58 commodities, okay, on the vertical axis. The bars, the blue bars are kind of a distraction, okay? You don't need them. You can convert this to a table, but it's really bland to look at. On the right are the countries where these commodities are sourced from, and on each line they're listed in the order of, of um, uh, what do you, uh, in other words, the country furthest to the left is the most, and then in, in the order of diminishing import numbers. You know, if you go down halfway and you say, well, look, here's, uh, we're importing peat from uh, uh, Albania at, uh, you know, we don't care about that. What we care about is the critical minerals, thorium, uranium, critical minerals. And to get that information out of here, this one, like I did seven years ago, with, with this is a 2016 version, you have to dig and tear the data apart. The data's all there. You have to dig it out. And this one here, you can see that the blood sweat, there's some coffee stains on there. There's a lot of uh, magic marker juice on that page. But from this, I've come up with a, a plan. I just take and whack the 50% mark. If we're importing it below 50%, I just take that off for the time being. And I say, here you have 50% imports and up. Okay? 48 commodities greater than 50%, still unworkable. So what I've done here, I've said, okay, we're getting rid of the onesies and twosies, the Albania, the Serbia, the uh, Peru. The, these are the countries, the heavy hitting countries on the right hand side in red, China in blue, Russia in their Soviet uh, ilk. And then the other black letters just say others. If we're importing something from Canada, I'm not gonna worry about it right now, okay? And then I left the commodities there. It's not up to me to change that. It would be, you know, but I did put an arrow pointing out rare earth elements. They're still grouped for the sake of this. But in reality, the rare earths are broken out. And I'll show you that in a minute. But this is not enough. The USGS has the list of critical minerals. There it is there on the left. And they have this tornado chart on the right. You need to put them together and start color coding these things and producing reports saying, look, for magnesium, these countries, we're importing this percent and so forth and so on and make it more workable. And it would be for policymakers a bigger help. 
Here are just the minerals being imported to the United States at 100%. So the first 15, there's 30 now, first 15 are alphabetical because they can be, they're all at 100%, right? And the, the second 15 you see there along the blue line are all the rare earth metals. So there's uh, 29 or 30 at 100%. And this is probably the most painful chart I'm going to show you because it, it tells you, and look in the right now, look at the countries where they're coming from. So we are really uh, in a headlock. Uh, the Chinese have us in a headlock over these. And by the way, um, uh, I want to point out, and uh, Jim helped me with this, look, if you look in the critical, in the uh, rare earths listed, you've got neodymium, praseodymium. Those are required absolutely for magnet making, for your you know, standard magnets. But it is the holmium, the terbium, and the dysprosium that is necessary for the high operating temperature magnets that are really, really important. Okay, uh, And so I've color-coded those orange and red, respectively. Scandium and yttrium and yellow, yeah, some people don't real, don't acknowledge that they are rare earths, but there they are. Okay, so those are the, that's the numbers, and that's what they look like. Okay, now it's time in a few minutes left to step back and sh let me show you how I took the analysis of this. Number one, we're importing from no less than fifty-seven countries. Okay, fifty-eight commodities plus the 15 rare earths, if they're counted separately, gives you 73 commodities, more than 25%. Okay, let's jump down. 48 commodities, or 62 at 50%, and the 30 I just showed you at 100%. Uh, you can see how bad they get, it's the bad meaning how serious it is as you get up there into the... Uh, into the really critical and the rare earth metals. Here's how you can evaluate those three things. 70% of the imports to this country of our critical minerals and a few others, 70% of the 100% of consumables, 70% of that is coming from adversaries. Okay? Is that a problem? Yes. I already told you what, the, what was added and removed from the critical minerals list. I'll skip that. I'll just say that the mineral imports now are out of control and that we could be, I think we are headed to a black swan event. Everybody know what that is? Okay, a black swan event is rare usually. Hopefully they don't become unrare. Uh, oftentimes it could be war. And uh, it would be, you know, who would, who would be in there? How about, our, how about Rusi? How about Rusi? Russia, right? Ukraine, China, Israel, Iran. Not that we were at war with Israel or any of these, but I'm just saying these re represent flashpoints over resource wars that are actually ongoing right now. So think of that. Black swans are usually a surprise, kind of like the Arab oil embargo. Most of you lived through that. It's, that was a surprise and a, a disappointment in the way we handled our oil. There was no shortage of oil. It was the way we handled it. And the escalation of trade restrictions. Is that happening now? Yes, very much so. Let me show you. Bear with me with these headlines. I just threw this together for the, for the sake of this PowerPoint, but look, the second half of last year was horrible. China trade restricted the United States from gallium on August 1. Those are some of the, just the pedestrian uh, links to the media. Okay, there's others better, but I just have these here. The same day they restricted germanium. A couple of months later, they trade restricted, uh, well, the, the, uh, we were told by the administration not to worry about rare earth elements, that vital metals up in Canada was going to supply everything we needed. Good. And then on October 6th, uh, they went bankrupt. So, 
And then a, next, a week later, the Vietnamese police arrested Lu Tuan. He's in jail. All his lab equipment, I guess, is confiscated. All of the samples he was working with, all of his colleagues are probably in prison with him. Hey, the Chinese do not want rare earth production done outside of China. And these guys are, well, they play rough, okay? Also, lioness, on again, off again, on again with Malaysia. You know, that's on hold. I think it might be up and running now, but we don't know. China later that month restricted graphite. Are you kidding me? Now you have the three Gs, gallium, germanium, and graphite. Three of the most critical minerals. And one thing they have in common, those three and three or four others are the main critical minerals that we need for what? The grid, the electrical grid. And China knows it. So the next time you hear about blackout, brownout, I want you to be thinking, maybe it's not the power generation, maybe it's the ability that we don't have the material we need. Then toward the end of the year, China banished, uh, China uh, actually, uh, well, they shut down rare earth processing technology, done, okay? So that was the way 2023 closed out. So there's a word for what's going on here in the U.S. and uh, uh, our so-called critical mineral policy right now, okay? And the word is uh, not a black swan event. It's, it's probably just a good old-fashioned butt-kicking is what's happening to us. And it's happening because why? We don't have a critical mineral policy. We don't have a mining policy. We have a patchwork quilt of... Yeah. Okay. And our little friend there in the lower right-hand corner couldn't be happier. You see him there, smiling away? It's perfect for them. They're, they've got all the cards. Okay, how to analyze, uh, let's get down on a third order. First order, USGS, second order, I showed you the numbers, third order. Okay, the what, the so what, this is the so what of the so what, okay? Can the U.S. adapt to a critical mineral trade restriction? No. Embargo? Mm -mm. Uh, well, wait, we'll use our stockpile. Uh, we don't have a stockpile. It was all sold off after the Cold War. Dang it. Stable supply chains? Whose? Where are they? Imports from allies, that's right, that's what we're going to do. We're going to borrow from Canada and Australia, we'll be fine. But no, they have problems too. They have problems like we do. Here's the thing, there's a, there's a, there's a buzzword out now called friend-shoring, friend-shoring, okay? You give me what I need, the critical minerals, okay, and I'm going to do, so we're going to be friends and we're going to share. And fr Folks. Our country has to mine things in order to be able to friendshore them. These guys want friendshore this way and nothing that way. It doesn't work. We look like a joke on the world stage. We're not mining when we have an embarrassment of riches. This is not good. And you can read there. Uh, there's no real national policy, and I said that, and there's no freaking Bureau of Mines. Nobody at the federal level representing the mining industry. Not good. We are the only G20 country or the only industrial country in the world without a Bureau of Mines. I had my assistant research every country going down, I think 100 out of the 200 countries. All of them have some kind of Bureau of Mines, Bureau of Minerals, Bureau of Commodities, something. We have bupkis, okay? This is, this is. And then EO 13817, that was a good start, but we need to start mining now. Here's the problem. John, how am I fixed on time? What, I got five minutes? Okay, well, there's a negative attitude on mining, and you can see for yourself. Reforming our mining means really eliminating it. The brass ring is to get rid of mining and lock down all federal lands. Meanwhile, 
Full blast on the other side of the earth, China's going wild. Mining, minerals, metallurgy, rare earth institutes, full bore all day long. And there's my little friend again, he's happy. Okay, their economy, their military, they have a burgeoning, apparently a burgeoning middle class. They need minerals and metals now. So I expect their exports to, be st to, to start to be reduced anyway. But more than that, these guys have in their culture metals and minerals. They have for thousands of years. Look on the right-hand side there. Metal is part of their chi. How are you going to fight that or how are you going to compete with that? Plus, these guys are state-owned enterprises. We're, we're, you know, we're capitalists. They can take a loss all day long. Now, this is where I grew up in Pittsburgh, PA, okay? And uh, that's my hometown. There's where I grew up. There's a city skyline in the back. That's where I worked for a couple of years. That is gone. They cut that up and barged it down the Mississippi, and they barged it to China, and they made scrap out of it. Are you kidding me? So, you know, how do we compete? We can't get, we don't make stuff, okay? They're making stuff and they're just eating our lunch. And I can prove it right now. If you look from 2000 to 2015, those are the number of mines, start, mine startups, critical hard rock mineral mine startups, not coal or uranium. These are critical hard rock minerals in this country, Australia, and Canada. Look at the green bars. Look how sad. Look how sad. Between zero and five, you know, it went up a little bit, down a little bit, and then under President Trump, it went up pretty good, and now it's down to zero. And then I said, remember I said a couple minutes ago, and now it's below zero, because permits and revocations of active mines are being taken away. So we're in, first time in American history, we're negative mining, and you have to be careful how you explain that to policymakers. Some of them don't get it. And I won't go through this in much detail, but it takes about 10 plus years to develop a mine, Hey, we have a problem with workforce, too. I heard somebody say here, we have a nuclear workforce issue. Same thing in mining. Kids need to know that they can come into mining and make a fortune out of school and not worry about it. Here's a global trend. Look at the U.S. All, all the numbers below are in brackets, meaning negative, except molybdenum. <laughs> okay. Look at China. Look at Zambia with their copper. It's unbelievable. Congress, regulatory help? Nah. They propose these same bills year after year. They go nowhere. So the mineral, our mineral wealth really is ours, not Washington's. So right now, Washington has a stranglehold. And uh, what we need to do is have uh, a, uh, an American mining template look much like American oil and gas and energy did. We came out of that, and now we became energy independent, energy dominant even. We need to get toward mineral independence, or we are in trouble. This is ridiculous. I don't care what political party's in there. They should be uh, thinking about this is the This is the bipartisan issue of the century, our resources, right? Now, I wrote a book on this topic. There it is there. I was going to discuss it more, but I'm afraid John will criticize my cover art. But what we need to do is recalibrate the federal role. Bureau of Mines people, okay? Upgrade the university geology and mineral pro mining and mining engineering programs. Come on. Protect our environment with, a hey, listen. It's not disinformation or truth telling. I just say it's an out and out lie. When I'm interviewed, and I'm interviewed a lot, I just say to people, it is a lie that we can't have a clean environment and mining at the same time. That's not an opinion. It's a lie. We can have both. This is the United States. So you need to ask your congressmen, senators, you need to get involved and talk to them. Say, look, we need this. Here's my new book, Undermining Power. We need to throw off some of the disinformation about mining, minerals, and what the hell is going on. This is ridiculous. Okay? And just so you know, in closing, you know, the Chinese... They have a program. It's called Dragon Bridge. Anybody ever hear of Operation Dragon Bridge? Okay, real quickly. They're paying indigenous tribes pay in Canada, and I was up there, I know that's true, and they're paying uh, Indian tribes, they're paying them 
to lawyer up and foment trouble for mining. And they're also paying NGOs, ENGO, e environmental non-government, to file lawfare. So our mining, you know, it's, it's, we're strangling ourselves. The Chinese know they're using our laws, rules, and regulations against us like you can't believe. These guys are masters. And in a way, in a grudging way, I admire what they've done. Here and in their country, they are the masters. And we are not. But at one time, we were the masters of rare earth. So basically, John, I'll end it here and just say to you that thorium, uranium, nuclear, critical minerals, many of which are needed for the uranium and thorium industries, we are brothers, okay? We need to unite and we need to get these policymakers smart and tell them, look, we can do this and still have a good environment. We don't need to be victims of disinformation. And that's what's happening. And the Chinese know how to play that card very well. So I'll end it here. John, thank you again. Right here. Yeah. Thanks, brother. I really appreciate it. You want me to close? No. no. Let's just leave it. Oh, leave, yeah. it up. Leave, leave it up. up. People no, are going to leave. Yeah, I'm going to leave it up. OK, thank you. Uh, well, uh, yeah, you guys can, uh, you're going to go into diabetic shock, shock if I <laughs> make you sit here for one more second here. Did, um, no, let's you go. got a question? I do, yeah. yeah, okay. I'm from Canada, and uh, I am hearing about what you're talking about. Is there anything more specific you can say about uh, other countries' influence in Canada in regards to mining? Dragon Bridge is the name of the operation. No, no, no. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Operation Dragon Bridge. It is the name of the operation being run okay, against the great mining economies in the world by the Chinese. Canada, Australia, US, sort of Sweden, big one, okay, where they can get in and foment unrest and disinformation about mining, okay, and it's successful. Canada is starting to fall victim to that. The indigenous people are not happy, and, um, you know, you're government's going to have to figure out how to handle that. Is your book a recommendation for Canadians as well? Like, is that the last one you, that last book, is that for Canadians as well? Listen, I would say whatever I say about our country, I wouldn't be a hypocrite. I'd say yes for, to Canada, our great friend. Listen, in my book, Groundbreaking, America's Quest for Mineral Independence, I, I spent a whole chapter saying how we here should do what the Canadians and the Australians do, and that is they love their mineral wealth. This is the only country in the world that I know of that actually shuns their mineral wealth like they're embarrassed of it. And oh, we would never use our wealth for geopolitical influence. No, we wouldn't do it. It goes on all the time. It's ridiculous. Others? Uh, uh, can it, and then can it be the... uh, what, what happened to the political lobby in Washington for the um, mining industry? There used to be something called the National Mining Association, and uh, I mean, I, I see your organization based on K Street. Are there any others? What, what, what happened to this, this feature of the, uh, of the mining industry? Okay, National Mining Association, Association. NMA, National, National Mining Association based on Constitution Avenue in DC. Most of their clients are coal, okay? This is not coal, this is hard rock. AEMA, American Exploration and Mining Association, those are the hard rockers. They're out in Spokane, okay? You know, that distance sort of saps a little bit of their political strength. They're working hard, but this is a deeply ingrained thing, and I don't know how we're going to get rid of it except through education. Others? Sure. No, I, okay. I think we got to okay, pull in the... Oops. Ned's, Ned's the best. <clears throat> So I won't hold you, but what I do want to say very quickly is that uh, we're going to have a lunch time presentation by Dr. Jim Conka, and uh, it'll start in about uh, 15, 20 minutes or so. Uh, so, and when you're uh, eating the food in there, you know, do me and the earth a favor, you know, eat what you take, 
uh, don't be pigs. Uh, you know, sh make sure there's enough food for everyone to go around. I mean, we're not going to run out, but you know, uh, try not to throw away food. It's a, it's a bummer, and it's you know, it's hard on the earth and everything like that. Uh, I'd, I'd rather you didn't. So there's a big room over there with lots of tables. There's more video projectors in there if you're a slow eater. And uh, there's also house sound in there. So you can eat and listen to the presentation. And uh, but Jim will be in here <coughs> later. So enjoy your lunch. And uh, thank you so much for your attention. Chris Bergen, I uh, work with Rick, sort of, on the uh, Air Energy Reality Project, and uh, I'm co-administrator. He founded it, about 1,200 members, about 50 countries, uh, I think the majority of which are Canadian or American. The last few months, several people from Africa seem to have been joining. But uh, at the moment, I'm going to talk about eco-modernism. Greetings on behalf of Eco-Modernist Communications, which is not directly linked to Energy Reality Project. Ecomodernist Communications is a legally registered nonprofit dedicated to the promotion of ecomodernism. You may be more familiar with this if you have listened to the Ecomodernist podcast or watched the Ecomodernist soapbox on YouTube. We hope to play a major role in popularizing the concept of ecomodernism so as to move out of popular culture's current dead end thinking and reboot to a new and better environmentalism. 2.0. We must all examine our collective human condition, looking towards the best solutions that science has to offer in overcoming problems, and to advocate for real science-based environmental and climate action. So what is eco-modernism, and why does it need to be supported? Eco-modernism is enabling energy abundance to allow civilization to peaceably progress into a Star Trek or the Jetsons type of future, but that's why we should also, see, but while that is happening, we should also see wildlife flourish as it did only one or two centuries ago. Nursing our shared planet back to health is our motto at Ecomodernist Communications. In a broader sense, ecology-based modernism is another way to define who we are. A wide focus on clean, non-antagonistic modernity, by that I mean non-antagonistic towards other humans as well as towards nature and the oceans. Uh, non-antagonistic modernity is what distinguishes us from other valuable pro-nuclear podcasts. That difference is crucial for many reasons. First and foremost, because the broader context of eco-modernism allows us to move beyond the preaching to the science literate choir and engage other communities that are beset by the same anti-science hysteria is holding back scientific advancement on many fronts. What we're offering is a roadmap that in many ways is far different from the eco-austerity which much of today's popular environmental movement seems drawn towards. Promoting a modern society at peace with the planet distinguishes us from the many other influential environmental groups. That difference should be pivotal for moving environmentalism out of a 20th century mindset, which is why Eco-Modernist Communications has given voice to so many leading scientists, academics, authors, and journalists, such as NASA Hall of Fame astronaut Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz, best-selling author Mark Linus, Pulitzer Prize-winning author Richard Rhodes, and many others, including a few in this room, as guests or as co-hosts. 
yes, the best defense is a good offense. And in the case of nuclear power, eco-modernism offers a broader vision of nuclear energy being driven, being a driving force towards a brighter, hopeful future that unfolds through the exponential advance of science and technology. It is with that in mind that we feel our show is a rare combination of environmentalism and futurism that strives to capture the imagination of the possible. What we are presenting in our podcast is not just a sense of optimism, but also a sense of urgency as well. While mainstream environmentalism has, in our opinion, definitely lost its way, the one thing they do get right is that mankind is at a crossroads that severely threatens our future prosperity and even our future existence on this planet. And yes, we're faced with a climate emergency that can not only threaten our human civilization, but significantly alter the general life cycle across the whole planet. We've done many podcasts related to the climate crisis with the purpose of directly engaging local grassroots environmentalists and climate action groups. In particular, the book Climate Gamble has a title which is exactly our message to the environmental community. Stop gambling away our future on a failed theory. If you say it's a climate emergency, act like it's a climate emergency and embrace the best tools, which certainly includes nuclear power. Among the other climate-related eco-modernist podcasts, we spoke with lead scientist Dr. Will Steffens, who in a report on, in the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences outlined the danger of our planet slipping catastrophically into a hothouse Earth, as well as interviews with famed Arctic explorer and scientist Dr. Peter Wadhams of Cambridge University, also the highly regarded atmospheric scientist Dr. Ken Caldera of Stanford University. I should point out that our focus on the climate is certainly aimed as much at the general public as science professionals. Restaurant or convenience store workers, cab drivers, beauticians, corporate officers, and high school students should all know the basics of how certain energy types create greenhouse gas emissions, which affects climate. What we are saying is this, we have a stark choice between modernity and chaos. If we collectively fail to act with a profound sense of urgency in the defense of all sound science, then our many efforts to save this planet from a climate catastrophe will be for naught. Failure is not an option, which makes our, act our actions all the more import imperative. That is why we are looking to assist with the founding of the first chapters of Eco-Modernist Society in North America. There's already at least one in Europe, none in the U.S. or Canada. Let's get that started. Another goal of ours is to expand the eco-modernist message to the airwaves as eco-modernist radio across college radio and community stations around the nation. Again, we hope that those of you who don't know our work will check out our audio podcast as well as our video op-eds, The Eco-Modernist Soapbox, on YouTube. If you've checked us out and like what we are doing, uh, yeah, we'd appreciate some support, purchasing some online merchandise, which can spur the Ikramanis message. Your donations can help us to update our website, production equipment, and continue to participate in conventions and forums. Direct contributions can also be made at our website, ikramanispodcast.org, and volunteers are just as valuable as money. If you're interested in volunteering with us or have ideas for us, please contact us, ecromodernistpodcast at gmail.com. And with other podcasts, give us a good review online. And on behalf of Ecomodernist Communications, I'd like to thank all those who have been involved with the original Ecomodernist Manifesto, those who have promoted eco-modernism, like the Finnish Eco-Modernist Society and the Breakthrough Institute, our many podcast guests and co-hosts, and each of you who are attending this Thorium Energy Alliance conference. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. All right, so can I have my microphone back before you walk away with it? No. 
I really wanted to make a video about Brownian motion, this jiggling motion you can see under a microscope, because Brownian motion does something incredible. It creates a bridge between two worlds, the atomic world and the macro scale world. And in that in-between world, Welcome. This is the Echo Modernist Podcast. Our philosophy is based on sound science and free from the outdated dogmas of the 20th century. This is the Eco Modernist Podcast, and my name is Rick Maltese. And I'm Phil Ord. I have with us Dr. Wade Allison. He's the Emeritus Professor of Physics from Oxford University, a fellow of Keble College. He has taught for over 40 years. He published Fundamental Physics for Probing and Imaging in 2006, which is an advanced textbook for his course at Oxford on physics and medicine and the wider environment. He is most famous for his book, Radiation and Reason, The Impact of Science on a Culture of Fear. He has a new book, which we are about to discuss, entitled Nuclear is for Life, a cultural revolution. I want to start by just briefly discussing your intent with the various books when you publish them. Well, there's three books altogether. There's starting with the fundamental of physics for probing and imaging, which was a student book for my course. So at the end of writing that book, I gave a popular lecture to the alumni of my college. And I was surprised, first of all, that they knew absolutely nothing about nuclear or radiation. So I set about doing that. And that came out in 2009. And in 2011, of course, the Fukushima accident occurred, and the book was very interesting. It was rapidly translated into Japanese, and I've been over there four times. But at the end of that sequence, I realized, first of all, I'd learned a lot more. I'm not a biologist, but I've spent a great deal of time studying it and talking with doctors and oncologists and the like. So uh, I, I particularly like your subheadings in the titles. You say radiation reasoning, the subtitle, the impact of science and a culture of fear. We have people that are generally frightened that we, just, we meet every day that are not aware of radiation. Radiation, even in, in its ionizing form, is really pretty harmless. In fact, compared with fire and biological risks, radiation is almost no risk. And people think we don't know about this sort of thing, but we've been using radiation in medicine for over a hundred years. 
and not low doses of radiation, but actually high and very high doses of radiation for people's health. It's just that they haven't taken on board the fact that this is the same radiation, the same kind of effect as you get in the environment from a reactor, even when it goes wrong. What is non-ionizing radiation? Ionizing radiation is hard enough to be able to break the molecules, in particular the DNA, but also the other molecules in your body if you shine on them. And non-ionizing radiation is it's not powerful enough to do that. So all it can do is heat you. And we're familiar with this. If you go out into the sunshine, that is non-ionizing radiation. So ionizing radiation pretty much begins at the UV spectrum, right? Yeah. Like the microwave oven is a really good source of non-ionizing radiation. And it cooks the things that you put in it. But you're talking about 800 watts of radiation. Whereas at Fukushima, you're talking about 10 to the minus 10 watts per kilogram or 10 to the minus 11 watts per kilogram. Millionths of millionths of, of the amount of radiation. And yes. there's nothing like enough of energy there overall to heat you so you can't feel it right. which worries people but that's because it's so weak you can be burned by radio waves and microwaves and even white light if you have enough quantity and you can be burnt by uv there's two new things happen one is that in the breaking of these molecules you can kill the cells now that's different from just heating so either the cells get replaced or they get mended and so on. The tissue is alive. It means it reacts and it does something when it's subjected to this sort of effect. And that's been happening to life from radiation and from oxygen for the last 3,000 million years. And this is the problem that life on Earth solved to be able to survive radiation and oxygen. I think it's a big misconception that radiation ac accumulates in our body. It doesn't any more than light or sunshine accumulates in your body. It can heat you, it can even cause skin cancer, but it doesn't hang around. It may leave some damage, and the question is what happens to the damage, but it goes through and out the other side. That's interesting. So what about things like iodine that theoretically you have to take to avoid damage? Well, you're talking there about radioactivity. Now, radioactive atoms are atoms which can and do slowly emit radiation. So it's the same problem, but you're looking at the source of the radiation being on you or in you or something. And if your name is Mr. Litvinenko and you've been given enough of it, you're in big trouble, but that's very rare. So the substances, or I guess you could call them elements, that go into your body, depending on their properties, they'll stay long or they'll eventually get washed out or, or taken out of your body. That's right. There are yep. some that are in your body which have always been there. Potassium-40, which is a variant of the normal potassium that we have in our body, that's always been there since the beginning of the formation of the Earth some five, six, seven thousand million years ago. And that gives you a constant dose of about 0.3 millisieverts per year. And that's there all the time. It's radiation doesn't accumulate. Radioactive substances can. Oh, they can accumulate yeah. and they can be washed out and yeah. so on. But they don't do anything until they emit their radiation. That is what yeah. potentially causes the damage. So what radioactive isotopes do people need to be worried about accumulating if there's a nuclear incident? What people don't realize is they don't ask themselves the right question. They look at the people from at Fukushima. How much cesium-137 did they accumulate? Tens of thousands of people have had the cesium-137. You look at what else we know. Well, there was this accident in 1987 in a place called Goiania in Brazil. Goiania, G-O-I-N-I-A, 
you can look it up, the doses, the amount of radioactivity that those people got from cesium-137, exactly the same as people accumulate from Fukushima, so just a, but about 10,000 uh, times End more. zone warning I track, see. warning. Yeah, I cut off Wade Allison for those watching. Sorry, folks, uh, online. We're gonna we're gonna prepare for our next speaker, and you can hear me only because I'm talking loudly, and that mic is uh, the. See, anytime anyone doesn't use the microphone, I just press a button and oh. you hear everything in this room. Oh, that's cool. But it <coughs> doesn't sound as good. <coughs> Excuse me. Are, are we? Are we? Yeah, we're, we're on the internet, so yeah, wait, say hi. Hey, people. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> oh, very good. Yeah, okay, I'll take you off. <laughs> Audio.
But uh, uh, Jim Kaka has uh, very generously agreed to speak about, you know, a really, really astoundingly interesting and important topic here. And uh, radiation dispersal devices, or what is colloquially known as a dirty bomb. <laughs> and uh, so without any further explanation, uh, I will hand it over to Jim. If Jim wants to take a moment to let people wander into the room, it's up to him. Uh, otherwise, he can get going. And uh, thanks a lot. The people at home will be able to see you. So, and you'll be preserved for posterity. But Jim, thank you so much for doing this. You're welcome. I really appreciate it. But it's a bizarre topic, so I'll kind of babble for a little bit before I really get started. Um, so. The funny thing, I mean, RDDs, radiation dispersal device, or dirty bombs, um, is a subset of a larger uh, CBRN category, chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear. Hold on one second. Oops. Hey, dude, there's nothing on the screen. Oh, uh, is that mine? Because uh, I didn't do that. Let's see here. What happened? Give me one. Is it on in there? I don't know. No, it's not. Um, you have slides? Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, I could wing it without it. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I'm wondering what, what happened because uh, it was working until we switched over. Uh, that has power. Did something happen here? I, I don't know. I don't know. It's it's off next door. Well, I thought this was purposeful. It's sabotage. It's Chinese. What's this? Oh, there you go. We've got two now. That's oh, they're on there. All oh, right. Okay, but they're on now. Oh, no. Is, is it on next How door? How did I didn't do anything? That's oh, very okay. close. Uh, okay. Don't. Do not touch those. <laughs> I didn't touch shit, dude. So yeah. I'm, well, it, what I'm hearing is something is glitchy. All right. Well, uh, Jim, take two. We'll do. We'll go with the glitchiness and see what happens. Okay. So again, dirty bombs are a subset of the larger category of weapons: chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear. And the initial and deadliest example was mustard gas in World War I. In fact, almost all of the terminology that, that we think of as nuclear, like detente and mutually assured destruction and all that, came out of World War I mustard gas. Um, and because the chemicals are, easiest, are the easiest to, to disperse, then biological and then radiological. Nuclear weapons, of course, are different because they're not an agent to be dispersed, but they're just a very, very big bomb. So the real weapon in a dirty bomb is public panic. And the best defense, defense is a rational, rapid response. And it has to be fast, and it has to be rational, and it can't include fear-mongering and uh, linear no-threshold dose kind of thinking. So dirty bomb effects are much closer to a Radway spill than to a nuclear bomb. Okay. Um, but again, the response must not be similar to Superfund cleanup, <laughs> which takes years, but must be rapid and immediate days or the attack will have been a complete success. And the key to this is incident command. So any of you who understand incident command, uh, you know, fire and police um, and FBI stuff, um, that you, you will recognize that term. So again, not a dirty bomb. This is a dirty bomb. So if you have, say, a 25 gram season 137 source, which is about 2200 curies, it's lethal at one meter dose in, in about 10 minutes. Um, and it's, you know, a thousand rem per hour. But uh, in a, you know, 1500 pound ammonium nitrate fuel oil bomb, as, as was detonated at uh, Oklahoma City, it's not lethal because it's spread over 10, you know, city blocks and it comes out to less than a microcurie per square foot because the surface area in a 10 by 10 city block is about a billion square feet. Yeah, get up on that bike. <laughs> so, so a billion square feet is a lot of surface area and if you have a good car bomb or a good truck bomb you, and you disperse it like you want to, the whole point is to disperse it and contaminate a large area, 
Um, you know, you're talking about a billion square feet. So dirty bottoms are self-limiting in the sense that the more uh, dispersed it is, the, the less the dough. So there's, there's kind of a critical um, uh, critical, uh, critical point at which the dispersal makes the dirty bomb not very effective in terms of, of effect. But it's actually the fear that matters. Sure. So again, dirty bombs, you use, use a, a conventional, conventional bomb or method, so you can either use a car bomb or you can you know, even you know, dump it out the rear of a, of a crop duster, but, uh, but that's not, you know, the, it, it's the bomb that gives you the headlines, okay? So the bomb wakes everyone up. If you just drizzle it out the back of a crop duster, no one's even going to know what happens. You know, so that's, that's one of the issues. So as uh, Sig Hecker quoted, they're weapons of mass disruption. Okay, that cause panic disproportional to the actual danger. And the whole point is to contaminate vital infrastructure and trigger large economic consequences. Now, every day that Lower Manhattan is shut down costs about $60 million. So if you actually detonate an effective duty bomb in downtown Manhattan, and everyone freaks out and no one goes to work or anything, you know, for a, and it takes a year to clean up, then there's your half a trillion cost and that's that would be considered a huge success by by, by a, a perpetrator sure um, while most radiolo radiological sources are small with little real consequence large rdds over 50,000 curie actually are feasible and they could have major consequences logistically this is about the same as 911 not easy not super hard doable but again logistically about the same um, and it's imperative to reduce the, the vulnerabilities, lessen the impact, and mitigate the after effects. And most likely, the first dirty bomb attack uh, will be against a U.S. military base overseas, because it's easy to move stuff around outside the United States, very difficult to move it around inside the United States. Now, the threat's real. There's several credible designs and plans that have been found in, in records. Um, two, two actual dirty, dirty bombs were deployed by Chechen separatists against Russia. One was foiled and one failed. And then there's these 38 Alizon uh, shoulder-fired rockets that had uh, season 137 tips. And it's kind of interesting. Now, according to Homeland Security, they thought they wasn't real. Um, but according to a Moldova uh, minister who I talked with, he said, yeah, it was real. And the Russians came in and took them away. Now, suicide bombers are not deterred by the risk of death. So handling a large radioactive source does, isn't really a deterrent. In, in the old days, we would say, oh, they, they'll kill themselves. Well, they won't kill themselves right away. <laughs> they'll have plenty of time to actually put this thing together before they die. Um, and sources like you know, Cobalt-60, Season-137, and Strontium-90 are relatively easy to obtain in large amounts from, the, from industry, because they're industrial materials. And security issues related to radioactive materials are focused uh, on special nuclear materials used to produce nuclear weapons. So the you know, Cobalt, Cesium, and Strontium kind of slip through, through the cracks, because they're not special nuclear materials. And they're not covered by many of the non-proliferation treaties and strategies, although we are getting better at it. Now, this is the dirty bomb material of choice, is overwhelmingly cesium-137 chloride powder, because it's very dispersible, it's a hard gamma, uh, it chemically it, and, and physically it behaves like potassium chloride, salt substitute, um, so, and it's wonderfully dispersible, that's the issue. Now, there's a lot of different sources, some are large, some are small. Um, most of the large ones, as you can see here, in, in, in the mega curie and thousands of curie levels are all cobalt 60, season 137, and strontium 90. So that's, again, the big ones of those sources. And even as, as you come down to teletherapy and blood irradiators, um, it takes a while. You, you get below the curie level before you get um, other radioisotopes involved. And of course, things like smoke detectors that have americium in a very small amount, teeny amount, really hard to, to get large amounts of them. Now, if you look at numbers, um, there's about 200 to 300 uh, industrial sterilization units that, that are in the 100,000 to, to, to million Curie range. Uh, research irradiators have season 137, cobalt 60. They're in thousands of, of um, uh, Curies. 
in about 100 worldwide. Cedar radiators, which was a, a big thing in the former Soviet Union states, um, is about 800 to 20,000 of those. I'm sorry, 800 to 20,000 Curie. And again, it goes on down. Only when you get well below um, um, Curies do you get a lot of material. Now, some of these bigger radiators look like this. You pretty much put your... Uh, Put your box of turkey, <laughs> turkey parts on it, on, on the thing. And of course, the larger this, the source, uh, the faster you can move that conveyor belt and the more money you make. So there is a, an economic pressure to increase the source larger and larger at each time. Now, where we get these kind of radioisotope producers in large amounts, cobalt, cesium, and strontium are shown here. Um, this is a little older slide. I'm sorry, when I was at, at Los Alamos, um, there's a couple more that have come online. But again, this is kind of where it is. Notice there's none in the United States. Now, there are two primary non-nuclear radiological threats. So there's the dirty bomb, the car bomb. RDD, and then there's the uh, gamma, uh, sorry, the cobalt 60 gamma death mobile, which is kind of funny, which I won't talk, <laughs> I won't talk about much, but essentially it's a large source because again, the large cobalt sources that are in the 500,000 to million Curie range, range they, have they have to be resupplied, resupplied because the half life of cobalt 60 is five years. So they have to be resupplied every five years. So there's trucks riding around, driving around with a mega Curie source in the back. Okay. Okay. Now, of course, of course they're, they're, they're well shielded, shielded but, but if, if you, you just, just took off the side and back shielding, not the top, because you don't want to be you know, seen from the air, and not the front, because you want the driver to survive a bit, um, you could drive around and just irradiate you know, crowded streets, irradiate a lot of people, get a lot of casualties. The problem is it's not a bomb, and they wouldn't know that they were dead for a couple of days, actually. Um, and so no infrastructure contamination. And I hate to put a value on human life, but uh, um, it wouldn't cost more than a billion dollars to recover from that. All right? Now, and you're more likely to get caught because it's a huge source. On the other hand, a car bomb, casualties are very low, okay? much less than 500, and that's really from the car bomb, not, not any rad. Uh, the LD50 depends upon the dispersion. If you are efficient in dispersing it, then the, 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 the individual dose will be very low. Major infrastructure contamination. This is what you want from your dirty bomb. You want to contaminate downtown Manhattan. Because every time downtown Manhattan is closed, every day, it costs $60 million. So if you contaminate it and everyone freaks out, and then it becomes a super fun site cleanup, and you get EPA involved, then you're talking year or two before anything could happen. And then you're talking your half a trillion dollar cost. So that is an effective result. It doesn't matter if you kill anyone, because the RAD won't kill anyone but you will shut the place down. So the, the 10 top targets in the United States, you know, Lower Manhattan, uh, Michigan Avenue in, in Chicago, you know, San, uh, San Diego, if you shut those places down for a year, you cost quite a bit. And this is the terrorist choice. Hate to get at the head of terrorists, it's very disturbing, but uh, okay. So most likely the, the real threat is a, is a dirty car bomb. Um, so say you put, you know, a thousand pound uh, 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 ANFO car bomb, and as soon, as soon as the bomb explodes, a plume of entrained radioactive materials and soot is created that begins to spread out from the point of source, um, and the speed and size depending strongly upon the blast configuration, the weather conditions, and the urban canyon effects of those areas. Now, the, by, by, by urban canyon, I'll, 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 you'll, you'll see what I mean. So, it's, so look at the top right. You have a, a time scale. Wind direction is from the, is from the uh, lower right to the upper left. So the bomb explodes, and then you get this, this small and trained plume right here. Um, and then that, that you, this is the urban canyon effect. Okay, So at first it spreads down, can, quote, the urban canyons uh, delineated by large... Um, uh, buildings, and in a metropolitan area, they're dominated by large, large buildings. Then, you know, about 10 minutes later, after that, you get a, a, a very small uh, plume that's lofted high and goes, goes very far. So the first thing you do is delineate the zones of, of, uh, radio, uh, of radiation. So if you have ground zero, then you, you, you want to find the one rem per hour 
line, and then the 0.1 rem per hour, and then the 2 millirem per hour, because that's, that's the zone that the first responders have to deal with, and, and you need to know those zones so you can restrict the time you're in those zones if you're responding to this. So who makes the decisions on what to do? Um, to call in sec secondary and tertiary responders like the, uh, the, the DOE RAP teams or the, the uh, National Guard civil support teams, you know, who calls those in? Um, who advises sheltering in place while you're dealing with this? Or who advises to evacuate the area? Who, who calls for a massive washdown of the affected area by fire hydrant water? Um, and who declares the initial response over? Well, that is the incident commander. And it's gonna be a local incident commander, even though the, by law, Oh, I suddenly got high in volume. Um, by law, uh, the FBI is the incident commander on dirty bombs. However, they have, don't want anything to do with RAD. They don't know anything about it. They want anything to do about it. Um, so they'll say, I'll oh, call DOE, call you know, the, the civil support teams, who also will not take command. They, they refuse to take command. They will support the incident commander, and that will be a local hazmat captain or fire chief or something like that, because they're, they're trained to deal with things like this, and they have some, some training in RAD, um, and that's fine. So, again, the first responders will be police and fire, and with any dirty bombing um, training at all, we'll be able to secure that area and map out those different zones, especially the two millirem per hour zone. And then, within six hours, Okay, DOE and uh, the National Guard say, once you call us, we'll be there in six hours. Okay. Um, then they, they'll come and pretty much advise very well. So within one hour, local hazmat teams can arrive to assist first responders, but you need to know it's a dirty bomb, and that's often the case. So pretty much you have to assume, if you have a car bomb in America, you need to assume that it is dirty. Um, oh, I'm sorry. The, so, so these are, are, are the locations of the civil support teams and the RAP. Every state has a civil support team, um, and every region has a, uh, uh, a RAP team. Now, the incident commander should be local, and I say that because they care about their city. Okay? I, I don't want to say otherwise, but someone coming in from another part of the country isn't going to really care about their, your city as much as you do. Okay, so that's why it, it needs to be a local incident commander. And then you, 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 you place, um, you pretty much again delineate the area. You either tell people to, to shelter in place, uh, don't go outside because the threat is outside, it's not inside. Uh, building, building um, modern building uh, AC systems are very good at filtering out this kind of material. And uh, used to be people said, oh, turn off the AC because you'll drag um, particulates into the building. It turns out it's just the opposite. If you turn off the AC, you'll get what's called a, a chimney effect. And you will then start to, to suck particulates into the lower floors and move them up. So it's kind of kind of strange in that regard. Oops. So this is this is tough uh, um, to read, so I, I won't go over it, but we've come up with a 12-point guidance, 12-step program <laughs> for dealing, for, for, yeah, sorry, for, for dealing with a dirty bomb. And this is based on Sandia, uh, um, LAN, uh, Los Alamos, and Homeland Security work. Um, and so you go this step-by-step, step. so, you know, and, and we have it a double-sided, you know, um, uh, heavy laminated thing, you just throw it in the truck or the car because you'll never use it, but if you do, it's there, and that's great. So, what you want to do, pretty much, now this is controversial, absolutely controversial, um, but the, how do you deal with this? Okay, You keep it an incident. You don't declare the incident over, because if the initial response is over, it devolves to EPA. Nothing will get done, so for a long time. Um, also, EPA is by law required to pretty much capture, corral every drop of water that's contaminated. So if they're in charge of washing this place out, yeah, it's kind of ridiculous. So um, the other thing is to you know just evacuate everyone and then slowly clean the place up like DOE cleans up contaminated sites. 
really fast, right? Sorry. <laughs> so anyway, you have to wash the heck out of this affected area within 72 hours, and I'll talk about why. Um, and again, it's a local incident commander can decide to do this. By law, an incident commander cannot be held responsible for any effects during the response. He cannot be sued, he cannot be fired, um, you know, because it's an incident. Once he declares the incident, oh, the initial incident over, then everything else comes into play, including legal issues and stuff like that. So this is kind of a bizarre intersection of, of technical and, and social and law. So how do you wash down an affected area? So a 10 by 10 city block um, affected area is about a billion square feet. That's a, that's a large area. And when people talk about, oh, we have developed, and, and this is great, they have, uh, developed uh, solutions to leach cesium out of cement. Yeah, well, a billion square feet, you have that much of that solution on hand? What is it? Is it in Jer Jersey and tank cars, you know, ready to roll across the bridge? No, you don't. There's no way you're going to clean up a billion square feet with special solutions that you have to manufacture. I mean, just at least not in, in any time um, that, that's relevant. So, so you pretty much have to wash the heck out of it with fire hydrant water. Um, and you need to get it into storm drains and out to whatever, like the Long Island Sound or, or the Lake Michigan, whatever you're, you're talking about. And you know, this sounds horrible and the public just, oh my God, no. But if you're talking about a couple of kilograms of season 137, which is absolutely horrible, diluted in 100 million gallons of water is, is nothing. I mean, that's just, that's just the way it is. So again, this is this weird fear. All radiation is bad. You know, you know, no threshold dose hypothesis comes into play, even though no one even knows what that is. So it's, it's, it's kind of a weird, a weird thing. Now, various types of solutions, again, have been tested, but the surface here is a billion square feet. So 100 fire hydrants operating for 24 hours will deliver 100 million gallons of water. And the fire department knows how to wash down buildings. Okay, this is their expertise. Don't let anyone else do it. Just let the fire, firemen do their job, and they know how to do it. Um, do not attempt to contain the water, or encourage it out, but encourage it out to sea or any other large body of water, just like we do stormwater drainage. Um, now there is cesium re removal efficiencies from building and paving materials within the first 72 hours. And the reason I say 72 hours is because after that, cesium will begin to diffuse into concrete slowly, but it will begin to diffuse into it. And once it's diffused into it, you have a problem getting it back out. And since it's a hard gamma, uh, it'll still be pretty much dosing things. Uh, again, depending upon the efficiency of the dispersal, it won't be dosing a lot, but it'll be dosing enough that everyone gets freaked out and the whole place shuts down for a year or two until we clean it up. So the way the material is, is deposited is just very light aerosol deposit, that, that third level that I, I mentioned. Um, the effects of soot chemistry on cesium chemistry, uh, effects of soot on cesium chemistry um, is important. Uh, resuspension and mobility, meaning if you do this in a dry day and then a big wind comes up, then you will resuspend it and move it in, in, in a secondary sense. Um, track, tracking and traffic effects, people walking on this or driving on it, it'll actually, um, you can think of it as two to a thousand uh, foot pounds um, in, in, you know, in terms of driving it into the material. Um, and then there's the bomb pressure insertion around, around the bomb site that's not very, very, well, it's not a very large area. So if that happens, you can clean that up, so. Now, it turns out if you just rinse this off with fire hydrant water, uh, the aerosol part comes up 100%, okay? And we looked at, again, we looked at materials, uh, you know, limestone, granite, concrete, grout, asphalt, uh, uh, stainless steel and aluminum, metal, glass, wood, rubber, plastic. So it's pretty much the cement, um, concrete, and asphalt that are the ones that can pick this up the most. The others won't diffuse in much at all, even after a year. So if you look at this, you pretty much washing it down is very effective if you do it quickly. Uh, bomb pressure, again, you know, 
crumbling begins to occur. So, so it's kind of hard to, to talk about washing down. But that's just the, the immediate area around that intersection or wherever the car bomb occurred. And the thing about diffusion coefficients is that they're mostly controlled by the volumetric water content. Okay, so um, the wetter something is, if it's a porous media, the higher the, 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 higher the, the diffusion coefficient. So this is the diffusion meaning that the random molecular walk through a porous media, okay, with, without the, the movement of the water itself. Um, so in granite, again, it's very, very low. Um, cement, it can get very high if it's wet. Now, this is funny because if it happens and it's under dry conditions, there won't be much, much diffusion. But if you have a little bit of drizzle, is it enough to wash it off the material, but enough to wet up the material so it diffuses in faster? It's kind of a bizarre um, requirement of conditions to be perfect. Um, so anyway, so you know, if you leave this stuff on the building for a month um, in an area that has any rain at all, like New York or, or Michigan, um, it won't diffuse into granite, again, more than one hundredth, uh, one hundredth of an inch, but it could diffuse into concrete over 10 inches. I'm sorry, two inches. Um, and that's, that's the sweet spot. So you can't get it out without defacing the, the, the buildings um, or bringing in 100 million special, you know, gallons of special material to wash it off. Um, and that's, that's where, where your cost comes in. So that's the $500 billion price tag for this weapon, and that would be a successful attack. So they don't care about killing people, the car bomb. And Sandia did a bunch of this work um, in, at, um, at New Mexico Tech, their energetics lab. Um, they blew things up. It's fun to watch. I have some videos of it, actually. Um, yeah, and so if you are not, if, if, if you're you know, in the area, if you're not hurt by the car bomb itself, if you're not hurt by the car bomb, you are unlikely to be contaminated to any significant degree. Degree, And so the best thing there is to just go home, take a shower, bag your clothes, take a shower, don't use conditioners or fixatives or hair gel, <laughs> but you know, just, you know, just wash yourself off well. You're good, okay? Which sounds kind of funny, because there's a lot of uh, you know, debate upon how to respond. It's like, okay, we need to keep everyone in that area so, oh, yeah, right. So you're going to contain a million people that are freaked out about a car bomb, uh, you know, a dirty bomb, and you're going to corral them? I don't think so. Um, and so, but that's okay, because unless you're hurt, you are not going to be contaminated. And, and, and we, we've shown that. Also, the main, the, the main part of the dispersal in a good car bomb is about 500 meters. Oh, I'm sorry, 500 feet. So... As, you, as the first responders approach, you need to basically stop at 500 feet, assume it's a dirty bomb, and if you have any monitors at all, then you need to just, you know, like, like um, oh, I usually bring my, my little, ah, uh, my little can, can, uh, Canberra alarming do dosimeter. They're the military hardened, actually, which is very nice. Um, and you basically walk in until it starts telling you you're above a two, mil you know, two, two rem per hour. And then you go to the 1.1 1 .1 rem an hour, and then 1 rem an hour, and then you get the hell out of there. Um, and so you kind of rotate people, and you just basically can walk this off where, where the affected area is. Any questions? I'm, I'm ahead of schedule. Yes? Let me go back here. Uh, great talk, Jim. Um, two, two questions. Uh, one, has there ever been a dirty bomb detonated in the United States? No. Okay. Uh, second question is about, um, uh, I read about a, um, a theft of a quantity of cesium, I think it was either 134 or 137 in Brazil. You probably know about this. Yeah. Uh, okay. They stole it from a, I think it was like a decommissioned hospital yes. or something. Yeah. yeah. And, it and was, is that yeah. this sort of the, is that where... That's what you kind of think the normal thing would, would happen, okay? And they didn't know it was radioactive, you know, when they stole it. Um, and they o opened it up and it had this pretty blue glow. I'm not kidding. <laughs> And, and unfortunately, I hate to say this, but unfortunately, some children get in there and it's pretty blue and they start putting on their faces and stuff like that. It was, an, it was a mess. Not that many people died. I can't remember, like, 
10, which is bad. I mean, it's horrible, 10 people dying. But, uh, but it's not a massive, you know, rad event. Um, the other thing is, you know, I mentioned Chechen uh, separatists tried to. They put two together. One failed to detonate, and the other was foiled before it, it, it was set to detonate. So that was, you know, good. Um, but, yeah. yeah. But where you're going to get this is you're going to get it from the irradiation industry. Because it only costs three, cure, three bucks a curie. For, <laughs> for cesium-137 chloride powder. That's a deal. Um, and, but, you know, you need to have a sympathetic food irradiation manager in Riyadh, whatever, um, who can order this stuff for you and give it to you. It's not going to happen in the United States. So you have to smuggle it into the U.S., which is tough, you know, tough to do now, because uh, we're, we're pretty much monitored pretty well. Um, so you, that's why I say the first attack will probably be against the U.S. military base um, in some place like Riyadh. So. All right. So I, I know you, you probably know a little bit about the sealed source recovery accident in Seattle. Is yeah. there anything closer to a dirty bomb than that? Yeah, the, the amounts of those weren't that high. So th this, is, this is where the L&T comes in. It's right. like, you know, my God, you just mentioned anything. Um, and and it you know, sends fear through everyone. But yeah, those, the, the sources were not that hot. They were not that big. So the, so that, but that was like a little bit of material, and yeah. maybe a tiny fraction of it came out of the building. Right. And so it is, like, did we learn a lot from that, or just a little bit? Because I know we, we had like some response learning. And yes. Some... Yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it was okay. It was actually handled not badly, and no one was actually hurt. Um, so that, that's pretty good. That's, um, what was I going to say to that? Uh, okay, I'll think of it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for bringing this up. I was actually walking down San Francisco like four days ago thinking about this idea, uh -huh. um, and something came to mind. Someone told me once, dilution is the solution. To um, pollution, yep. <laughs> and is it really that simple? Like you said, hey, if you're not impacted by the explosion, you're fine, go home, take a shower. Yeah, like that's it, it, it is. See, this is, you know, RAD is so weirdly misunderstood purposefully. I mean, we purposefully, not me, but not us, but we purposely, as, as a country, scared the heck out of everyone about nuclear. And it was intentional during the Cold War. I mean, the Cold War was supposed to scare everyone about using nuclear, and it worked, actually. It just kind of got the, the huge difference between nuclear power and nuclear weapons wrong. But, you know, oh well. Kind of hard to deal with that, but um, but yeah. So so it's really hard to do this, and it's really hard to give someone a really big blast of rad. And even those people that have had it, you know, the DUE sites, most of them didn't die from it. Uh, in fact, Atomic Man at, up at Hanford, where I am, um, he got the biggest blast of anyone. He, he died in ripe old age from heart failure. It had nothing to do with the rad, uh, and they had to work on him in hazmat suits. It's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, in, in, in the hospital. Oh, I, I just want to say. So thorium, uranium, plutonium, anything else except cesium, cobalt, and strontium are not good as, as, uh, as, as dirty bomb materials. So the idea, when everyone says, you hear this all the time, oh, spent nuclear fuel, oh, you can make a dirty bomb out of it. No, you can't. Um, you know, it's, it's solid oxide, metals, ceramics, whatever the form is in, it's not dispersible. Um, and, it's, and it's much harder to get those materials. I mean, you can just order cesium you know, chloride for three bucks a curie, why, why go anywhere else? Bargain. That's a bargain <laughs> price. <laughs> so one more question. Yes. Yeah, if you had um, the issue with cesium with concrete, why wouldn't you just seal it in? Because it's still a hard gamma. Yeah. So it, it would have to diffuse in about three feet in order to become not important. And that's, you know, so it diffuses in a couple of inches and then it kind of stops. Um, yeah. And again, it, it depends upon the, the quality of the concrete. So if you're looking at Chinese concrete from the 90s. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Jim, <laughs> you're a star. That's a, a hard, hard gig, gig doing the lunchtime, lunchtime talk. talk, so, uh, you know, oh, Jim, Jim, I'm, I'm really appreciative of that. that. Uh, again, uh, I, I, can't I can't tell you how much. Uh, the, uh, uh, we will do something here. Um, so there's my, my friend, uh, Engine. I'm just, just going to take, take 
a couple, couple minutes, minutes here because I, I don't want, want to force anybody, anybody to have to go immediately after people ate. ate. You know, you know, so, so I'll take all the nodding and sleeping here. You know, I'm not, not going to talk for more than a couple minutes. So it's just, just a, a, I'm just, just going to give you an update, update here on uh, where where thorium licensing is at. Uh, and, and from, from a very personal, personal perspective, perspective, Jim Kennedy, Kennedy and I are working together to get essentially three thorium licenses, right? right? You, know, uh, you, could you could say, say where it's a possession, possession license, uh, uh, a license to basically sell it, and a license to do stuff, stuff to it, you know, convert, convert it, change it. it. So, uh, very 30,000 30, foot level uh, explanation is when Jim. Jim Extract some, some rare earth bearing phosphate, phosphate rock out of his source, wherever it is, below ground, above ground, <clears throat> and it starts being digested or ground up or separated. At some point, thorium something falls out. Right? So the thorium, maybe a little bit of uranium. Jim's mine is mercifully unbelievably pure and actually doesn't need a license because it's below the level of uh, needing needing a license. It's uh, below five, five parts, parts per million, million, I believe, right? It's, it's like three parts per million for... Very, yeah, very low. It's, 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 it's way, way below threshold. threshold. But, but, you know, if we're, we're going to go, go to the trouble of building a facility, you don't, don't want to use it for a couple, couple years and then throw it away. we like, like to be able to bring in material from, from other locations, locations and that's when you really, really need a license. So... Uh, and, and so, so this, this is a little, <clears throat> this is, uh, I, I found, found this to be very helpful with, with folks in DC. Oh, shit, man. The, the, look behind you. The, oh, man. So, something down there is getting something to flex. So. Well, get down, can you get down here and jiggle the cables while I talk? Oh, God. So what are people seeing on the internet? They're seeing you and the audience. So they're not they seeing... Have, they have seen you and the audience since uh, five minutes ago. Oh. There it is. That was it. Don't know what I did. Uh, put it back. <laughs> That's not the video. There. No know. kicky. Yeah. All right. So now are the people at home seeing this? Uh, I can change it to that. Yes. All right. I don't know how we're ever going to keep people from stepping on this stuff. All right. So, <clears throat> picking back up where we left off. <laughs> uh, uh, shit. So, <laughs> picking back up where we left off, uh, uh, very quickly, these are your six magical steps. And so, uh, a little uh, tangent to the subject is uh, critical materials. When people are like, oh, I got a mine. Or I got, you know, some placer sands. It's like, great. Uh, now do the other five steps. Because until you get to that last one, magnets and metals, <clears throat> you're not going to, you don't have anything. You have essentially a pile of rust, right? You know, so it's, it's useless. So uh, having a mine, extracting it, concentrating it, separating it, all that stuff's good and necessary. But until you get to the part where you're, Electro winning it or some other process until you're making metal You're not making anything. You're not making anything that anybody can really use and so uh, And then you can see in there in the lower right hand corner at some point in there the thorium whatever thorium oxide thorium chloride Something falls out of the process and that's where our ability to manipulate the material comes in uh, mercifully, it's very easy to turn thorium chloride into thorium oxide, which is what clean core thorium energy needs. Uh, and uh, thorium tetrafluoride is a one-step process also. You heat the thorium chloride up and you, you bubble some hydrofluoric acid. So that's, you know, a little tricky to work with that, but it's, not, you know, you're not talking about a 50-step process. Uh, it's, it's fairly straightforward, uh, albeit you know, a little spicy. <clears throat> so, this is my last slide. It was only just two slides. Uh, so, we're in the process of going to the NRC, submitting, and what's interesting is that 
for what we're doing, there is a very, very clear cut set of rules on what's considered side stream byproducts from an industrial process. And it's tempting to think that, well, we're going to conform to and apply for a license under those very well set out rules. And it, it, you know, it's tempting to say, well, we'll just keep working on it. You know, license or no license, because we've followed our part. If the NRC can't, you know, honor us with, you know, response and a full license, then <clears throat> that's the sort of thing that, uh, you know, they're going to force people to do if they want any sort of mining to take place in this in this country. So it sort of goes back to what Ned Mamula was saying. But you can see the the cartoony example there, the facility. It's a very straightforward facility, uh, and it's not particularly big, and it's very well protected, and it's co-located with a rare earth uh, uh, processing facility, and there's already a lot of people looking for this material. So clean core thorium energy needs hundreds of tons right now. Copenhagen Atomics would like to get their hands on a lot of this material right now. Uh, Dow, uh, Dow and uh, W.R. Grace have uh, spoken about uh, the uh, catalytic nature of this and how they might consider getting back into the uh, thorium catalyst that they used to make back in the 90s. So that's, I'll leave it there. It's optimistic. I think that's an optimistic view that, uh, that we're finally getting to the first real steps of uh, reintroducing thorium as a commercial product. All right. So now it's 1.15, and I invite, I'm, I can't tell you how great, you know, all the speakers I'm so grateful for, but to the fact that we got Dr. Holcomb to come uh, out of his glorious retirement, <laughs> semi-retirement, to uh, talk to us. Uh, We've, we've had a really, really great success this year. Put that on your success thing is uh, uh, ANS 20.2. And, uh, and uh, so uh, that was years and years of work and a little bit tedious. <laughs> but uh, because of uh, David's leadership, uh, I got to tell you, uh, no joke, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Holcomb, Holcomb is... is, is, is for, for, a, for, for a national lab, lab guy, Dr. Dr. Holcomb, Holcomb is extraordinarily brave. Uh, he's, he's taken on his own management and stuff to say, hey, we need to support work with thorium. And I'm very proud of you for, for doing that. So we should all be very grateful for him. So thanks. All right, very good, excellent work. Oh, that needs Actually, I'll start with a question for John because he didn't, you didn't have things on your, your last talk on there. And one of the things I actually wanted to know is because of that, I don't like HC, hydrofluoric acid on there. And I really like the stuff that Molten Salt Solutions is doing now with inorganic, uh, non aqueous, oh, sorry, organic, non aqueous uh, chemistry for production of actinide fluorides. Uh, and and I, I, I didn't know whether you guys are working with at all with, uh, that's a land spinoff on, on uh, producing uh, you know, uh, actinide fluorides, but including thorium, without having to do things like oh, HF uh, and really high temperatures. temperatures and you know, the, uh, the, the, the organic, organic stuff, stuff is really, uh, uh, yeah, say, the, the, the non-aqueous organic stuff, I think it's cool. Uh, but, but again, again it's, it's another one of those nascent technologies, technologies that needs a whole bunch of maturing, but there's a company out, off trying that right now. And I just didn't know whether you guys are working with uh, you know, the, you know, something other than the traditional inorganic chemistry. We're, we're trying to convince the NRC to work with us. We don't want to show them anything new. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably your best, that's that's your your best, best answer there. We're trying not to yeah. freak them out. It's hard enough to get them to... Uh, do the things they need to do. Um. Okay, well, first, um, I'm David Holcomb. Uh, I work for Idaho National Laboratory. Uh, and um, say, we are the nation's nuclear energy laboratory. 
we're in favor of nuclear power. We're in favor of, of making, uh, we're trying to help uh, people as we can. Okay, oh, I'm not in the, okay, I'm not in the shot. Sorry, I had both audio and video I have to get to. Right, I'm sorry, I'm not real media friendly. I try uh, there, okay. Uh, my, uh, I'm basically, uh, because I do work for the National Labs, uh, Labs we are, our business is the science and technology and implementing the policies that the federal government sets out on there. We are not, you guys are advocates. We're pleased uh, you know, that, you know, that you provide you know, inputs to the, to the government as to what we should do. That's what the citizens get to do if we're right to petition their government. But that's not us. So I'm not gonna talk about advocacy, about what the government should be doing and stuff, because that's not what the national labs are for. We're there to help when you do get things going with the science and the technology. And some of that stuff is in secure areas, some of it's not, but that's what I, and so, you know, my talk is not this great inspirational type thing. I'm sorry, that's not what I'm here for. I'm not here to advocate. We have some very good people doing advocacy and I'm you know, it's nice to see, you know, people taking advantage of the fact that we have a democratic society and we get to advocate uh, for, th for things. Uh, and so we're, I'm very pleased when you do that because it gives me more work, frankly. I'm into doing interesting nuclear things. Uh, but so my talk is instead on something that we need to do and that we agree on and is not gonna be controversial with any of my lab management or anybody else that for me to talk. You will notice that there is a rather dearth of National Lab staff here. There is not because National Lab staff are not in favor of doing this. It is because, again, this is an advocacy organization that you ha have, and that's not the purpose of the National Laboratories. And so, you know, we do things like radiate your fuel for you on there, do, do, do the salt testing. You know, if you want to do the electrolyzer demonstrations on there, those, we, we do those. That's the type of stuff that, we, that, we're in, uh, that we, we support because it is the science and technology elements on there. People who make decisions are the ones who win elections. That's not us. Okay, so without further ado then, I'm gonna talk about you know, looking at how you do safety. Uh, on there, because this is important. Let me tell you, this is a big part of why our reactors are expensive. Uh, on, on there is because, you know, it's only nuclear power that can do a large land denial accident. I mean, yes, we've done Bhopal. We've do, we've done, you know, we dropped airplanes out of the sky. Lots of people get killed. A lot more than in, in, in any nuclear scenario uh, uh, there. And yet, nuclear power is the one that people remember. How many people remember the you know, various plane accidents? And yet, how many people remember Chernobyl? How many people re remember Fukushima and Three Mile Island and wind scale? The, they are remembered because of their duration. We have the potential for that large land denial accident. And you know, in my opinion, we need to make it so that that's not credible, that we, we're not gonna do that again. Because if we're, I wanna see 10 times uh, as much nuclear energy. I'd like to see you know, 50 times as much nuclear energy as we have today. And if we continue with today's technology and the today's method on there, we, you know, are we going to start seeing these things instead of once every decade or once every two decades, once every year? That's just not acceptable. So we need to go ahead and do better than what we ha that we've done in the past. Part of the things I think is molten salt reactors. Frankly, I've been an advocate of them for a long time, and you know the fact that they they look different. But we're but again, I'm going to be more uh, sort of uh, bureaucratic on this. We can talk uh, offline uh, where I'm not in media presence about my opinions on things. But this isn't my opinions. This is just let's do safety right. I right hear so. We set out, how do we do this? We've known, you know, it was 1946, they did the first Atomic Energy Act, which said, oh, all nuclear power is for the government. Well, in 1954, we decided, well, that's not so much. In, in the US, it's gonna be uh, done uh, in the private sector. And, uh, you know, and the NRC, in this case, it was the AEC until 73, uh, is gonna be able to set out whichever standards that protect the minimum, uh, health and safety as they, they think is advisable. 
Again, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, you know, they provide the rules to implement the legal requirements. Again, reasonable assurance of adequate protection was the rule you know, back when Edward Teller founded the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards uh, on there. The challenge is what's reasonable and who defines that and how do you, how do you go about that? Again, molten salt reactors, every nuclear power plant, same thing. Don't let the stuff out. Hold it in, uh, and that's what containment is on there. Provide adequate cooling. That's one of the things we have someone who's an advocate of using a, an accelerator because you can turn off the heat uh, on there because you turn things off, but because we got fission for work, and, you know, we have decay heat for quite a while. And so our other thing is you know, uh, if you don't cool the fuel, eventually bad things will happen. Same thing with control the reactivity. Turns out molten salt reactors make really good prompt burst reactors, so you probably can drop a few dollars into them and without really doing bad things, but uh, most other solid reactors, that's not a good idea. Again, safety functions have to be uh, uh, you know, achieved during normal operations, including anticipated operational occurrences and design basis uh, accidents. We're also looking at, you know, beyond design basis. I've been an advocate for a long time of looking at a maximum potential accident as to essentially take all the energy sources inside containment and dump them all uh, on there. Not very many other reactors would really like to see that. Maybe micro reactors can, pro uh, can survive that, but uh, molten salt reactors are kind of distinctive. And the safety functions have to be included throughout the plant life cycle. That's part of those things that when you're taking the plant apart and bringing it down, you're probably not going to affect people a long way away. Uh, but it's really not a good idea to, uh, to go ahead and say during the deconstruction phase, uh, you're affecting your neighbors. Again, efficient and effective safety adequacy is you're just not going to deploy unless we can lower the cost of this. Uh, there. Again, you've got really desirable performance and safety characteristics, which we can use to leverage the time, cost and time uh, to doing this, but right now we're not. Right now, our licensing strategy is based upon the safety characteristics of the large light water reactor. Uh, and they're simply because that's the only thing we're deploying uh, on there. The NRC is very responsive. We've got a nice process for going ahead and evaluating their adequate safety. Well, how does low pressure, low chemical potential energy, uh, you know, radionuclide retention in the fuel salt, negative reactivity feedback, all these things impact uh, things, but they're not directly related into the safety adequacy. Uh, again, again, not saying you don't do the fundamentals. Quality assurance of the things you need to do quality assurance on. Uh, again, uh, yeah. Narrow spot where this microphone works. Uh, yeah, and I, we're not on the right slide either. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay. Sorry, I was worried about too much feedback. Okay, it's working. All right. You won't get feedback. We got a person in the back who's helping us with that. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, again, safety functions are all. Okay, I will hold this so it will stay close to me. I like to walk. I'm sorry, I'm the first person who's had this problem, but. <laughs> Okay, um, good design, proper construction, adequate maintenance. You always have to keep the, do the fundamentals. Uh, again, however, we're not a large light water reactor. We're not a sodium reactor. We have different pieces, and that means we're going to need customized tools and analysis methods. It's not something you're really different. It's just, again, Preventing unacceptable releases of, of materials is the principal safety function. If you look 10 CFR part 20, uh, for those of you who like the numbers uh, on there, that's the only thing that really puts numbers on there. It says how much uh, radiation you can release to the public uh, there. You know, the challenge is to contain uh, the challenge is to contain it in the SSCs employed to prevent or release radionuclides are different. You know, we 
right now we've got rules. We finally got in 2018 to apply functional containment so we didn't have to apply exactly the same set of containments as a light water reactor that we can look at all the physics and everything together. Again, low pressure systems, we don't really need these massive containment structures that you have in a high pressure system. Uh, again, the performance requirements for normally salt wetted credited containment layers are substantially different for things that don't require uh, requ uh, during normal operations. For example, if you use a guard vessel around your molten salt reactor, it's not normally touching the salt. Well, if you're crediting the guard vessel on there, maybe the guard vessel is made out of 304 stainless. I got a lot of confidence at 304 stainless in 100 hours, hours or so of the accident duration. And then I can use, oh, wasp alloy or something really exotic as my re reactor vessel because I wasn't crediting that. That's what functional containment can, may maybe allow you to do, is to not use credited things as the first thing is the stuff which is, to which is touching, your uh, touching the fuel salt. Um, tritium is going to be a problem. I haven't heard anybody really mention that on there, but tritium is, or uh, you know, anything which comes out during normal operations, just because it leaks through, it doesn't leak past. You know, it doesn't have to have holes and stuff. It goes right through. And then your heat exchangers is where it doesn't. Your heat exchangers don't work unless you have thin walls, and they also don't work unless they're hot. And so you've got you got to come up with something for trapping tritium. I've got lots of ideas on there, uh, diff different options for that. But that is uh, sort of one of those major elements that w if we don't understand, you know, we're not going to be able to leak large quantities of tritium out for reasonably good reasons. People with the linear no threshold arguments can make arguments about whether, how much we should be concerned. But, uh, but living in today's laws, we, we should be concerned. Again, functional containment, as I said, it's now the rule, a law of the land. You know, individual layers don't have to be leak tight. Matter of fact, you could have no leak tight layers and just have enough ones to keep, you know, t here's two orders of magnitude, this one, two orders of magnitude, this one, two orders of magnitude, this one, and eventually get low enough levels of leakage to say that's okay. Um, Fuel salt is one of the barriers. We just consider, okay, the things come out of that xenon, krypton, some of the iodines come out of this, the tritium comes out of this. and But most of the stuff, cesium, strontium, well, if it's born inside the salt, it's not going anywhere. Uh, on the other hand, uh, much of the cesium-137 is a daughter product of xenon-137, which has few min a 3.8-minute half-life, and so most of that's m money that could be born in the cover gas and wasn't in the fuel salt to start with. Again, normally salt rated layers might not be code rated, uh, and therefore you're not crediting them. So again, ASME boiler and pressure vessel code, which is 10 CFR 5055A, is all over you know, the requirements for light water reactors. We may not care because we didn't credit the stuff that's touching the salt, the, start, the stuff that's only touching it for a few hours. Well, that's not, I mean, I can do a 304, uh, the low pressure 304 code case is not real hard to do. Again, NRC safety goals, reasonable uh, assurance of adequate protection of the public and the environment. Again, either part 50 or part 52. Again, looking at the large light water reactor. There are all those general design criteria. Look at how they were created. Why were the general, why do they exist? Well, we looked at large light water reactors and what do we need to protect ourselves against? We did this after 1965 when the Ergen report came out, which said, well, gee, if we actually had an accident where we melted a substantial protection part of the core, we probably can't protect, uh, you know, that's, that's probably not something we can contain. Therefore, we need to figure out how do we make that adequately unlikely that we can still build reactors? And so they came up with a series of, well, if we do this, then we do this, then we do this. We worry about missiles. We worry about containment. We worry about control. We worry about all of the elements that are part of the reactor to prevent accidents and prevent accident escalation and to mitigate the, uh, mitigate the consequences of accidents. Um, so the existing rules really are quite good. Well, this is where we're, we're sort of highlighting how did we go into um, uh, you know, uh, 20.2, uh, which is ANS 20.2, which is a design safety rules, the equivalent to uh, Appendix A for light water reactors. And I will have to credit John wherever he's wandered to on there because he provided Vince 
which is wh why this worked. Uh, because Vince Latowski was our secretary. Uh, my skill sets uh, don't, uh, you know, are not uh, really well aligned with uh, making sure that we captured all the comments and that we got the voting process to go forward. It took us eight years to get a consensus standard out for this. It's a lot of work. And John paid Vince for, ba for the entire time to have him participate in this. And that we wouldn't, uh, that would, it would have been a lot more uh, harder to do that without uh, uh, that. John, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, again, advanced reactor design criteria, which they decided where well, we needed to figure out equivalent of the general design criteria, which for light water reactors for the advanced reactors. Molten salt reactors were not popular. They said, well, we're too immature. DOE isn't going to spend the money on doing the advanced reactor design criteria for, uh, for molten salt reactors. But they did it for sodium and for high temperature gas cooled or modular high temperature gas cooled reactors. Well, we did, and then there's also the probabilistic way of looking at accident prevention and accident endurance, which is really a good way of looking at. I mean, you looked at Three Mile Island where they said, well, this little part here, this little part here, here if this, this happens and this happens, happens, then you can combine all these things to get a representation of the risk. Well, they did all these things, but they really never looked at how do you do this for a molten salt reactor simply because... It was perceived that we were too immature uh, to be uh, worth investing in. Industry thought different. National labs thought different. Uh, universities thought different. And so we did things through the American Nuclear Society uh, and here as a consensus standard, and that's exactly what we're supposed to do. And again, we're saying... You can use the, the, the techniques that we're using today, which is a combination of, uh, of mitigation and, uh, and prevention on pr provide reasonable assurance of adequate protection. But the earliest nuclear power plants really relied upon mitigation. They didn't rely much upon prevention simply because we didn't know the physics of what was going on that well. And if you don't know what's going on, it's kind of hard to say, well, this is what's going to happen with this accident, and then this is what's going to happen, and then this is what's going to happen. You look at, what's it, Dresden 1 or Fermi 1 uh, on here. They had these huge stainless steel vessels that were, you know, that were intended to go ahead and contain things, but they were also only 200 megawatts or so. We have to K-heat more than that now uh, on there. So you worry about uh, exactly how did you represent things. Again, the safety adequacy transition as, went, as you, the accents, the accent escalations, when it really got too big. Um, plants that can mitigate th about this then really don't need to worry so much about prevention. And that's one of my things is how do you make things cheap? Um, and I actually have to apologize. I didn't update these on the slides I sent to John. That the, the top blue box where it says prevention should be prevention and mitigation, which is the deterministic and probabilistic things are, you know, both do prevention and mitigation. So if you look at the probabilistic things, they do the risk triplet. You know, what can go wrong? How likely is it? What are the consequences? And try to build a, 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 a prevention and mitigation framework. And then you get principal design criteria, which is what the NRC judges you on anyway, which is said, this is built this way uh, uh, in there. And you can do that, the reactor class minimum design criteria. And you also have the, you know, so the other thing is just a pure mitigation approach, which is what's the worst things that can happen, which it gives you containment and distance on there. Uh, I don't, th in the US we used to do, we built everything out in Idaho and say, there's a long distance away. Uh, if we're going to build Indian Point, probably can't do containment. Uh, no, sorry, can't do uh, d distance so well. There's way too many people. And the way that's happening is, you know, right now we're trying to put more and more reactors near where people need them. So we don't have the huge transmission issues. Again, the principal design criteria, uh, so just so people know it, it's the way that they establish what are the things that you actually, the NRC puts in your check mark. That's what goes into your license, in your, whether it's an ITAC or something, or inspection, testing, analysis, and acceptance criteria, that they actually tell you, well, this is the thing you actually need to do to know that you've met your license condition. So that that's eventually what all of these things come out to, is your series of principal design criteria for your plant. Again, understanding and modeling the accident phenomenon really gives you the, uh, you, know, you, you still have to do the fundamentals, which is 
what can happen? Well, gee, if I pour salt on the floor and then it, well, it will flow down this or it will react with my concrete. And, you know, it's just the classic sets of good, of, of good engineering. Just because we're a di different reactor class doesn't mean you get out of good engineering practice. Again, we did we did something like this based upon fundamental uh, safety functions in 2021 at ORNL. Uh, again, we it, 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 while it was DOE sponsored, these are mostly the reactor vendors, the universities, and uh, who are involved with that. And then my slides are auto advancing for some reason, but oh well. Uh, again. You still have to do uh, the, the fundamentals, which is things like, well, gee, what happens if you spill salt on something? Well, we need evidence for that because the NRC only lives on what's the evidence base you have. We said it, nothing happened. Well, we're now doing things like dumping uranium chloride and plutonium chloride on the floor in you know, and various quantities and watching it flow getting characteristics. What's the temperature rise when this happens? How much splatters? What comes off in the gas? Oh, you were counting on having a, uh, a ceiling mounted heat exchanger. Gee, did you get snow on that that formed an insulating layer that prevented you from adequately transferring the heat? So we're, you know, there's, there's a lot of evidence from history. Not all of it's quantified, uh, not all, of, and very little of it's got uncertainty bounds on it. But we really, that is where the DOE is spending its effort right now, is trying to get the inter, separate and integral effects tests that will underlie this, the basic safety of molten salt reactors. Again, I already talked about this mostly, that the regulatory guide 1.232, again, lots of numbers uh, uh, in my, as far as regulations on there, but no equations in my presentation today. Uh, but we did not have uh, design-specific, design class-specific design criteria for molten salt reactors, and that's what we needed to cha change, and that's what ANS 20.2 sought to do. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, say, uh, there's simulated, okay, frankly, a lot of this, uh, when you're organizing one of these things, basically, it looks like the integrated decision-making panel process to, uh, that's used in 10 CFR 50.69 to create a risk-informed categorization of plants. Uh, and so I think this is then my last slide was talking about, we finally did release it. Eight years uh, for most of this was at least a, me uh, a meeting a week, you know, a couple hours. It's amazingly tedious work to do standards. If, on the other hand, we have any young people in the audience, almost everybody in the standards is really gray, and you should, and they're very worth uh, getting you guys uh, getting to know, and you could make a real big impact on the future of nuclear energy if you want to get involved in the standards process early in your career. I advocate, you know, strongly to do uh, to do that. But it, it will be something that you will spend a lot of time and patiently go through the wording, patiently respond to multiple rounds of voting from people who don't know anything about your technology but have very strong opinions about how your standards should be worded. Uh, and uh, patience and consensus building are the key words for any standards process. Uh, again, uh, we can support 10 CFR 50 or 52 based process with this. We're not really good at supporting a part 53 process yet. It, we just basically say use the ASME ANS uh, standard for uh, non LWR PRA. Uh, maybe the next version of this in five years will get better at supporting a part 53 approach. Or if we get a new, another uh, version uh, which is based upon framework B and a maximum containment uh, accident approach, uh, we maybe even have a part 54. We'll just see, see where we are. ANS requires every five years for you to re go over your standards again and see if they need any modifications. And I may still be there, uh, but it may be time for a younger person to decide that they want to do things. Uh, things. It's been a long time on that standard. And that's really all I had for you guys today. I got a uh, question, question for you. For you. Um, what, what, uh, what, what is uh, your take on Part 53? Where are we with that? And does it do what you think it needs to do? 
Well, well in my, my opinion, opinion part, part 53 is a viable way of demonstrating adequate safety. Uh, I think that it will come out in a reasonable period of time because the commission on March 4th said chop off all the extraneous bits and go for sort of the minimum process to go forward. I also think Part 53 is very challenging to apply to, a, to new technology because you have to build all your accident models. And if you don't have numbers for your accident models, you end up having to put conservative values in. As soon as you start b stacking conservative values after conservative values after conservative values on there, you've made an unaffordable plant. I think Part 53 is very likely to be used heavily for when you have second and third generations of third of kind type plants. They look it looks very appealing for doing that. Uh, I have been I think thought Framework B was where where a lot of the new plants would go, but a lot of the small plants need something which is a derivative of uh, 15 New Reg 1537, which is how we license our uh, non power reactors, and so I've been advocating to do something which is a maximum containment or maximum potential accident containment strategy, which I'm hoping will be the next thing that the NRC takes up because, you know, part 53 will help particularly uh, people like new scale, uh, which has already got a license on there, but for people who are looking at doing things, which will look just, uh, you know, looks like something we already have a lot of experience with. We also can do something that looks like a this part uh, part 50 or 52 approach, which is what the early licensing documents for terrestrial looks like. Again, my point on a lot of this is not that these processes don't work, but that at the moment there are no reactors in the licensing process. And the reason, my opinion, for a lot of this is that we're not even going forward is that we've made things too expensive. And, and if we can't come up with some way of lowering the price of the overall reactor and the overall licensing process, we're not going to win. And I'm hoping that, that a maximum potential accident way, uh, way of licensing might lower the, process, uh, the costs enough to, uh, to enable that. Very good. And effectively, we, have, we still don't, don't have Part 53, correct? Yes. Uh, it's supposed to be published this fall. Uh, the commission said go do this, and the NRC is working feverishly to do that. We're pretty, we, we sort of have a pretty good outline based upon the votes and the instructions in you know, what, what's going to be in there. And hopefully, you know, it'll be valuable. I mean, natrium is, you know, you look at who's doing things in the, uh, on there. And so, first next generation they may be able to do this uh so yeah it's a valuable path forward go forward get this part resolved and then step forward in the next into the next one because uh, right now i don't think micro reactors have a decent path forward i don't think molten salt reactors have a decent path forward you can you can force fit them into the existing frameworks but the problem with force fitting them is that it costs too much not that you don't get adequately safe plants, it, uh, plants, but we have to lower the price. If we can't lower the price, it doesn't matter for all the other technologies because no one will build them. Thank you, David. Thank you so much. Uh, that guy is a national treasure, and it's, uh, I'm glad he's still working, and he's working with our... Good buddy, Jess Jean, and uh, wish uh, Jess was here. So next, uh, we have Jim Kennedy, James Kennedy, Caldera Mining. Caldera is uh, going to pull off the first new vertically integrated mine to magnets to metals facility, and uh, I'll let him take it from here. Thanks, right. Jim. Do me a favor. Give this to Cannon. <laughs> we give him a microphone. I want an assist from Cannon. <clears throat> okay, so little report card. John covered some of it. One of the things we got done uh, recently was we got a publication out, and there are a number of people in this room that contributed. James Conca did, John Kutch, um, uh, Ned Mamulo were uh, contributors. There were 17 contributors or, um, or peer review experts on this paper. Uh, this is the only paper ever published that uh, interrogates China's monopoly at every stage. 
It's the only paper ever published that uh, that uh, codifies the the um, the true measurable subsidies that exist for China. It also lays out all of the structural advantages, um, and <clears throat> we intended for this to be a template um, for for our government, for uh, investors and for uh, people dumb enough to go into rare earth mining to use as a tool. Now, what's interesting about this paper is, uh, you know, we started doing the research on this and we went back and looked at documents produced in the 90s. And next to our paper, I have referenced over there, I wish I had a, oh, do I have a pointer? Um, Cannon, Cannon needs a microphone, I need an assist, Cannon. So, uh, it, can, it, can you give Cannon the microphone? He's gonna he's gonna help me out. So, for 20 years, the United States has been completely naked. We have been completely exposed at every single level in the value chain for critical materials uh, that are needed in nuclear reactors, in electric vehicles, and weapons systems. And um, for 15 years, that John and I have been working together. Uh, we have been pounding on the Pentagon. We've been pounding on the Department of Energy. We've been beating up on three administrations. Uh, and we never really pissed anybody off enough until recently. And um, so I'm saying all this because we produced the document that pointed out what we were saying for 15 years, but what they were ignoring for 15 years. And so, Cannon, if you can do me a favor uh, on the uh, little the thing over there, uh, the Chinese uh, writing. Uh, there are four. There are four policy positions that were stated by the four most powerful people in China during uh, when this was published, which I think was 1990. So, Cannon, uh, if you can do it, and if you can't, just give it to Ben because I think he's got better eyes than you. Uh, but can you can you read for me the translation of the four most important people in China? Uh, um, what what are they saying? Do you see that up there? Yeah, I do, yeah. Uh, combine the military and civil. Combine peace and war. Give priority to military products. Let the civil support the military. Thank you, Cannon. Now, you would wonder, why didn't anybody find this information? Well, this information was published in a 800, 900 page document produced by Congress. It's called the Cox Report. And John and I marched around Washington, D.C., showing this to everybody and then showing them how all of these things were integrated into a multi-tiered system of subsidies, hard subsidies, soft subsidies, and structural advantages with the sole purpose of doing all of those things that were outlined above. So what they said to the whole world for us all to hear was to use the economy to strengthen the military. You know, that's, that's the entire thing. And so this document uh, shows that China's real goal, and I don't begrudge them. God, I wish we had a government here that did stuff like this, right? No, they're doing what they need to do for them. What we're doing is we're ignoring it, and they put it in black and white, and we ignore it. So this is a really important document. John's got it posted on the website. I encourage you guys to read it, or at least send it to somebody you don't like. Um, so anyway, that was, a, in fact, this document uh, is influential enough that uh, I uh, had a conversation with a bunch of people from Rand Corporation who recently told me that this document had worked its way into their planning, and if you guys know what Rand Corporation does for a living, that's a big deal. All right, Rare Earths. I'm sure you're sick of it, but we're gonna do it anyway. Um, this is the most amazing thing. So here's rare earths, right? There's, there's 16 commercial elements. And what almost no one understands is five of them represent 90% of all value derived from rare earths in the entire planet Earth, right? And the two that everybody knows best, they're neodymium and praseodymium. And there's this famous magnet called the neodymium iron boron magnet. 
And everybody thinks that's the magnet that makes EVs go and it makes wind turbines work and it's what's in your, your, your Westinghouse medical imaging system. Not quite. If you have an NDFEB magnet, by the way, look at, I, I got ahead of myself. The NDFEB magnet is a miracle. It's 35 times stronger than a, a standard ferrous magnet, right? Miracle, fantastic, what's the problem? The problem is that if you look down on the lower chart and that little yellow box at about 65 degrees C, the strength of that magnet starts declining and as temperatures go up, it keeps declining. So if you think about having an electric vehicle uh, that has uh, rare earth magnets powering the drive motor and the brakes, how long do you take by the, from the time you leave your driveway until that electric motor has a friction temperature above 65C? You don't even make it to the first stop sign, right? So even if you had earbuds, you know, earbuds, an NDFEB magnet is not, it, you can't make quality earbuds because there's, a, a, there's an air friction situation going on because it's still just the speaker. So the NDFEB magnet on its own is really good for toys and novelty items and a curiosity so kids can get hurt in a high school lab. But other than that, it doesn't have any many high value uh, applications. In fact, that, that yellow block is an end magnet and end magnets aren't even rated. Nobody even cares about them in the commercial sense. When you get to the M magnets, the H magnets, and go all the way to the AH magnets, you're continually needing to dope that NDFEB magnet with more uh, terbium, dysprosium, and homium. And it's the only way you can get stability. Right? That's great. What's the problem, Jim? Well, the problem is the only country in the world that can separate terbium, dysprosium, and homium is China. Consequently, no matter where you mine this stuff on the planet, you're shipping it to them for separation, which means they control it. Which brings us back to their theme. Their theme is everything they do economically and commercially is to, to build them up and to strengthen them from a military standpoint. So now, what do they do? They control your ability to participate in an advanced economy. They literally pick who gets to build electric vehicles. They pick if the military can, re, uh, can resupply and build weapon systems. It's all up to them. So, um, <clears throat> the, and there's an exception. The exception is the samarium cobalt, right? But the thing about the samarium cobalt is China is the only one in the world that can separate samar samarium. And in fact, samarium prices are so low, even if you figured out how, you wouldn't bother because the cost of separating exceeds its market price. So the samarium cobalt magnet, which is the legacy magnet in all U.S. weapon systems, is also 100% dependent on China. So they've got us. They've got us economically, commercially, militarily. And they do all of this uh, through controlling just this tiny, tiny window of technology called separation. The other problem is thorium. And John and I have struggled with this issue uh, uh, with, with Congress, with regulators, you know, for a decade and a half. So um, typically, and when I say typically, I'm talking about a mine or resource that can be developed outside of a third world country. In every case, all heavy rare earths are highly associated with thorium. So what happens is Western mining entities try to avoid thorium, end up mining rare earth deposits that are almost or exclusively light rare earths, right? So... You, they don't even have the terbium or dysprosium to send to China. And so we've been telling policymakers for well over a decade, 
You're never going to solve this critical material problem until you solve the thorium problem. And John, and, and we're two tracking it, and I'll cover that in a minute. And, and a side note, a side note. How did all this happen? How did we come, how did the United States, Japan, and France fall from being the world's leaders in, in critical material resource separation uh, metals and magnets? Well, the NRC and the IAEA changed the, uh, the regulations slightly, which affected a, a definitional change of threshold for source material. And 100% of our country's heavy rare earth resources were shut down and all of the technology for rare earths were willfully transferred to China. Now, it's been 40 years and the black magic for separation is so complex that even today with lots of government money, we have a string of failures for companies claiming to be able to solve the separation issue uh, and they're getting nowhere closer. So this is all very complicated, and I just like to tell people this one too. Uh, this is a side index point two. Jim, why is it so hard to separate rare earths? Come on, it can't be that hard. Well, you know, you have, you have, you have 15 uh, uh, elements that look exactly the same from the outside. Every single rare earth has seven electrons in its outer shell. And the size difference between the biggest and the smallest is so small that they are not, they don't lend themselves to, uh, to separation. And to prove this to you, I'm just going to have somebody in the room guess how many countries in the world can separate all 16 rare earths? One. How many countries in the world right now can, can enrich uranium to, uh, uranium to make a weapon? 10, 15, 20? So that's the difference. The difference is to, make, to separate these materials is, is much more difficult than to make weapons grade material uh, from uranium. Anyway, back on topic, sorry. Okay, so how is it reported in the press? They always tell you we're heading the right direction. We're winning the game. You know, we just gave away some more money to these guys, and those guys have promised the world. And I know they went bankrupt twice, but the third time's a charm. You know, they keep telling us we're on the right track and things are getting better, and they give you these bar charts that make it look like we're really making progress. But this is what these bar charts really look like. The fact of the matter is it's just that three-card Monty game. You know, they're not telling you the truth about anything. The resources that we're mining, all of the cr super critical rare earths are still passing through China. And without those super critical rare earths, all of those things at the far end where we're claiming our progress, China still holds 100% control. This is never going to change until we actually accept and deal with the fact that China has built a brilliant monopoly uh, that, that anticipates our actions, and when we apply our predictable actions, it actually strengthens China's monopoly. So, for example, uh, in 2015, uh, all of the funding that went into uh, uh, creating new mining resources, rare earths, ended up being a massive debacle because China allowed and in fact helped create a bubble and when the bubble popped the Western countries had spent the equivalent of about six billion dollars doing uh, um, exploration producing uh, detailed reports 43 101s uh, a lot of downstream work evaluating and defining resources and after 2015 there were 400 bankruptcies in rare earth well, guess who got to pick through the ashes at everybody else's expense and pick up resources, right? That's what happened. And it's happening again right now. You know, the, the, uh, uh, the Western com uh, companies started talking a little brash and started talking about moving up the value chain.
And as they talked about moving up the value chain and getting into China's sandbox, the Chinese government simply said, we believe rare earth prices are too high. And for 18 months consecutively, prices fell. And right now, according to Benchmark Capital, 97% of the producers of uh, praseodymium and neodymium outside China are losing money, right? And who are the 3%? Suppliers to China. So they basically pulled the rug out from everybody again. There'll be bankruptcies again. Anyway, where am I going? I have no idea. <laughs> Looking forward, um, as John said, we're two-tracking our solution. Caldera is, uh, is, is working with uh, John, TEA, and we're trying to get a, a possession and sale license, and then the other entity would have a, a, uh, a license to configure downstream products. This is for our project in Missouri. Is this cutting out? A bit. I wore out that microphone. And, you know, despite the black letter law, which is definitively clear, we should be able to get a permit, um, the pathway is pretty uncertain. There's, you're certain to spend a lot of money. You're not certain to get what you want. Uh, concurrently, uh, we continue to push a piece of legislation. We believe we have uh, sponsors in the House and in the Senate, and we believe that the legislation which would allow for the basically what number one is offering, uh, um, the, the ability to pull these things out and to manage them and then to transfer them and then to upgrade those materials into downstream products. Um, we're working on that legislation. There's a tremendous interest in critical materials. Uh, so we believe that they, it, this bill would have, be able to attach to a larger bill and be part of a, a larger critical materials bill. And a lot of this is, uh, was possible because this report uh, got uh, a lot of attention and it has literally changed policymakers' uh, uh, understanding of the entire nature of rare earths. The fact is not one of them understood that an NDFEB magnet that didn't have heavy rare earths in it was essentially for toys and novelty items. Uh, so it was a great educational opportunity we were also able to break out from, from Chinese regulations the, the exact functionality of, uh, and, and ratios of their subsidies and then all of the other things that, that make competing with a sovereign monopoly impractical or impossible. Anyway, that's it. Um, if you guys have, I don't know how long I talked, John. I'm sure everybody's sick of me, but whatever. Uh, just wait one second here. Does anybody, anybody have, have any questions, questions about uh, uh, rare earths or critical material, material supply chain? chain? Got to get, get in front, front of a microphone. microphone. Sorry, there. Can't there. there we go. Hey, Jim. Great talk. Um, so what about calling their bluff? What about like when oil prices are low, we fill up our little reserve of oil? We get a low, if prices are low for these rare earth elements, I'm assuming they have a long shelf life. Let's buy a shitload of them so we have a buffer so that we have time to like develop our own and keep the price high um well it, it has been historically documented that something like the strategic reserve has never been used once right i mean it's 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 not practical and general motors is not going to do it toyota is not going to do it no but no private company is going to jump in there and go hey you're selling below cost let's buy a bunch of it the, the truth is these private corporations are saying hey, they're selling below cost, and until you do, we're not buying from you. So, so th this is the problem. It's, it's, it's the greed and everything's pushed. All of, all of the onus is pushed upstream, right? Get, go get a sales contract with Walmart and wait to get paid 180 days later. And what about the federal government doing it as a safety feature for our, for our own national security? The, the federal government can barely grasp the issues, quite frankly. I'm, I'm just going to say that. I, I, would, I would say that you can use the SPR as an example that the U.S. is one of the worst commodity traders in history and I think is even forbidden from uh, doing options on, uh, on the commodities. So I agree it's a good idea. Um, I'm just going to ask kind of each person that presents, how much 
do you think you need financially to get these projects that you're going up and running? And do you think that this can exist without massive subsidies from the U.S. government? So we have demonstrated uh, that it's impossible to produce a rare earth magnet outside of China because of the subsidy structure. That is a fact. The Department of Energy came to its own conclusion. Uh, in fact, in the real world, every rare earth magnet fabrica fabricator of NDFEB magnets operating outside of China loses money on every magnet. And so that's forced every fabricator to move inside of China, which allows China to knock off their IP, to knock off their systems, their, you know, their, their, their processes. And it's particularly been difficult on Japan. Uh, the Japanese are the leaders, the undisputed leaders in uh, magnet fabrication. And when they were forced to move their facilities inside China, China simply knocked off their, their equipment rebuilt it, sold it to Chinese companies cheaper, and uh, it, it, you know, it, it is, they, they just built a very good mousetrap, and they've anticipated Western responses, and every time we respond the way they expect us to respond, we end up in a worse position. Okay. Uh, since, we're, since we're in Texas, can you comment on the status of MP materials and, and maybe energy fuels, because I think they're working on this. Uh, MP Materials is in the same position it was before, and it will be the next time they uh, they um, they bring that thing back to life. Right now, uh, everything they produce, they lose money on. And by the way, everything they produce goes to China. Um, it, it as I told the Pentagon in 2009, the MP the Mountain Pass deposit is incompatible with U.S. economic and national security needs. It's it's a dead end. Um, Energy Fuels has got the right thinking. They've got a permit. Uh, they're very interested in monazites. Uh, but realistically, um, the entire inventory of available monazites in the United States and continental United States can't be more than 5,000 tons, which means you're going to get 2,500 tons of rare earths. And that's the end of it. I don't see them importing them from Brazil. I see lots and lots and lots of problems there. Um, but monazites are the answer to almost everything, um, and uh, they're do they're they're on the right path, for sure. No, no, no. We're gonna talk. I'm gonna do this talk. Oh, here. We here. Go. I, I, can I give Jeff? Yeah. Can I give Jim a tough one? Sure. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I guess the overarching question is: wh Why do you have to be so fixated on? On, on magnets, but let, let, me, uh, let me digress from that. The, you and I have talked about this many times. Uh, the, the entire rare earth industry from mining up to making a compound is a to total loss leader. Yep. We know that, we agree on that, and that's how China built their business by getting into the downstream and owning the downstream, uh, as well as owning the upstream, of course. But why wouldn't you or any other uh, enterprising person in the rare earth industry just go to Ames Labs or some other lab where there's a million brilliant technologies and do tech transfer and say, okay, we're going to make this compound, which is uh, uh, you know, used for something else in industry, whatever it is, which is um, utterly dependent on rare earths and non-substitutable, and we're going to build that. Sure. Gonna... Um, that would be good for Jim Kennedy. And it's a very small market, but the reality is, the the four the four or five elements up here at the top they represent ninety percent of all rare earth value in the world. When you go to metals and magnets, it's ninety five percent of all value. Think about how crazy it is. I have a I have a pile of powder right here, and the piles of powder are ninety percent of the value. Now I make the world's strongest, most durable magnet for high temperature, the value only increased 5%. What do you think's happening? What's happening is China has such a huge subsidy right there that it owns that forever. And that's where all the value is. That's where the markets are. And that's where our, our governments, our, our Western aligned governments and industries need help. The highest value of rare earths is magnets and high temperature magnets so yeah i can sell a lot of compounds but and i'll do good but my country my allies our industries 
they need access to magnets and they need access to high temperature magnets. So that's the focus. Um, and, and so, you know, that's, that's the answer. It, you, you've got to crack that one. Very good, Jim. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you very much. whisper in his ear. <laughs> All right, so uh, so the, this next talk here, he's, oh, he's creeping up on me. I'm going to freak out. Uh, so uh, one, of our, one of our superheroes uh, from the time Rusty came to uh, TIAC, who knows, whatever. But, uh, you know, the, the fact that Rusty and Doug have gotten so much done in such a short amount of time is... Uh, you know, famous and well-known. Oh boy, come on, mouse. Uh, and yeah, you can do it till. Independence will depend on self-sufficiency in energy. The United States will not be dependent on any other country for the energy we need to provide our jobs, to heat our homes, and to keep our transportation moving. Beginning this moment, this nation will never use more foreign oil than we did in 1977. Never. Our imports of foreign oil have been climbing steadily since 1985 and now stand at 42% of our total consumption. We need a long-term energy strategy to maximize conservation and maximize the development of alternative sources of energy. America is addicted to oil, often imported from unstable parts of the world. This country can dramatically improve our environment, move beyond a petroleum-based economy, and make our dependence on Middle Eastern oil a thing of the past. In 10 years, we will finally end our dependence on oil from the Middle East. I'll talk, but I will not dance. Uh, really appreciate you being here. I, I want to just say that, that this partnership we have between ACU, between Natura Resources, um, is a partnership that's unlike any others, but it's a collaboration that's designed to get things done and move forward. And so we've taken the challenging task of advanced nuclear reactors, we've broken it down into a, a large series of smaller steps, and we've said, how many can, can we do, what can we tackle in parallel, and how can we tackle it together? Uh, a university, uh, a lab, uh, an industry uh, sponsor, and we're working together. And the goal here, again, is to get things done. Uh, we believe this technology will make the world a better place, and we're not interested in doing it um, in our grandchildren's lifetimes, but we'd like to do it soon. So we're moving forward with that. And so that's the exciting story I want to tell you about. And uh, so, so I'll start this story and let Doug finish it for us. So where are you? You found yourself in Abilene. Thank you very much. Appreciate your finding this. I uh, hope you enjoyed our little airport um, or the scenic drive here. It is a, a great time of the year. We have our wildflowers in bloom for you. Uh, where is uh, Abilene? You found it. 
But Abilene Christian University, you'll be on campus tomorrow. It's a, a small liberal arts university that's centered here in Texas. But we are growing, and we're growing not just in number, but we're growing in quality, and those are the important things to us. And I'll say that the ACU mission is to educate students for Christian service and leadership throughout the world. So when we're thinking about this technology, we're thinking about doing the research on it, but we're also thinking how can that technology be deployed and make the world a better place. So Next Lab, sponsored by Natura Resources. Next Lab stands for Nuclear Energy Experimental Testing, and we're really focused on finding global, global solutions to the world's critical needs. And if you heard me talk before, you've never heard me talk without it talking about these, and I don't want to waste a lot of time on it, but the why we're doing what we're doing is important. Okay, We are trying to do things that matter to the world. The world is full of people billions of people that do not have a clean, reliable energy source that doesn't put their own health at risk. And so we have about 40% of the world's population that is, is, is using animal waste or some sort of biomass as their primary energy source. And when you do that, you burn that in your home for heat or for cooking, you end up breathing in those fumes, your, your standard of living is very low, and you suffer from it. So if we really want to bring people out of poverty around the world, then what we need to do is provide energy that's clean and affordable and safe. Another critical need is a need for cancer. And I, there's not a chance in the world there's one person in this audience that doesn't know somebody that's dear to them that's suffering from cancer right now. Cancer, one in two of us during our lifetimes will suffer from cancer. And last year, one in six people died of cancer. There's a lot of treatment out there for targeted alpha therapy. We just need to get our hands on these alpha emitters and other types of medical isotopes that there's a shortage of around the world. And we can do that with uh, this technology. And then the third thing, talk about water. A third of the world need clean water. Um, we use it for drinking, but in addition to that, a lot of uh, sanitation. If you're talking about agriculture, if you're talking about West Texas, water is always an important thing for us. And so these are critical needs of the world. When I talk about water, you can replace that with high process temperature heat for industry of a variety of sources if you want to think more broadly, but this is a, a need the world has. This quote from the United Nations says, nuclear energy is indispensable for eliminating poverty, ending hunger, providing clean water, affordable energy. And that's why we think molten salt reactors provide the answers to the critical needs of the world. So I appreciate uh, Dave's earlier discussion about the safety of them and the importance of molten salt reactors. I'm going to continue to build upon that. The mission of ACU's Next Lab is to provide global solutions to the world's need for energy, water, and medical isotopes by advancing the technology of molten salt reactors while educating future leaders in nuclear science and engineering. We need to develop the technology if it's going to bless the world, but we also need to develop the workforce that's going to enable it to not just stay in one lab, but be deployed across the world. And so that's what we're focused on. You'll see several of our young students from our labs here with us today, and you'll get to see them tomorrow also if you come to our labs. Why molten salt reactors? So I might still be preaching to the choir, but let me just remind you. Sometimes the choir needs to be reminded of what, what we're talking about. Why are molten salt reactors why we're pursuing? Why is that our focus? Well, because nuclear power is currently the safest energy source in the world, but we can make it safer. Uh, nuclear power is currently the cleanest energy source in the world. If you talk about volume of waste produced or how well we are containing it, but we can make it cleaner. Um, it's efficient, we can make it more efficient. Uh, old nuclear did one thing, produced electricity. New advanced nuclear molten salt reactors are multifunctional. They can produce the medical isotopes that doctors need to treat cancer while we're also producing the electricity and pr providing sources of high process heat to produce pure water. They're scalable. We can build reactors that are small to very large grid size things so that we can make the right size supply for the right needs so we don't have to have the huge distribution lines starting across the country. Carbon free, obviously, reliable. Uh, the state of Texas really took a, a gut punch two years ago when we had a winter storm and when millions of people were without power for most of a week. We had uh, hundreds of people across the state die because our electricity wasn't reliable. And so there's a human cost to have an unreliable electricity. Finally, uh, molten salt reactors can use a very wide variety of fuel types, including thorium, and that might be uh, important to this group. So two key requirements we talk about. What's different about the reactors we're talking about building or we are building at ACU and the reactors that are deployed around the world today? The two main things is that we're, first of all, we're using molten salt as a coolant. Um, how many people in here have seen molten salt? In person. All right, great. Some of you have. Um, a lot of those hands are people I work with. Um, I, I will tell you, 
Molten salt is just your table salt. You raise the temperature up enough and it turns into a liquid. As soon as salt transitions into liquid, it's a molten salt. And so if you would like to see molten salt, I encourage you to come see the labs to, tomorrow at ACU and you can see molten salt in person. Uh, this picture on the right is just a little beaker full of something. It looks like an oil or something else. No, it's a salt. You raise the temperature up above the boiling, uh, before, above the melting point and it will melt. And why do we want to use molten salt as our coolant instead of water? Well, it does great things because it allows us to operate at very, very high temperatures while simultaneously operating at low pressures. So a high temperature gives us the great thermal efficiency. This graph, if you like to geek out on it, right? We, we're more efficient at converting thermal energy into electricity if we start at higher temperatures. Um, we're also able to provide that industrial heat that the industry needs. A lot of industry processes require very, very high temperatures, which means you're either burning hydrocarbons or you're using crazy, crazy amounts of electricity or you're using nuclear power cooled by molten salt. Why, why, why is the low pressure important to us? Well, low pressure means that we don't have to have the huge containment domes, the expense, the cost, the risk, the danger associated with a high pressure system. And it's never, you, the salts never uh, transition into a vapor and so you don't have that high pressure, you don't have that danger. And if you use molten salt as your coolant, then you also allows you to have our second key feature, which is to use liquid fuel. Uh, Current technology takes solid fuel, takes uranium oxide, puts a metal cladding around the outside of it into long fuel rods. And when that fuel rods start to have structural integrity as, as the, the uh, fission products build up inside the fuel rods over the course of life, when, there's, when you're questionable about the structural integrity of that fuel rod, you set it aside. And the moment you set it aside, you then call it in this country, we call it spent nuclear fuel or high level waste. There's still a huge amount of energy content in there, but we're throwing it into the waste pool. That increases the waste production and decreases our fuel utilization. If instead of using the solid fuel rods, if we take our, our fuel and we dissolve it in the molten salt, just like dissolving your sugar in your coffee so it's spread throughout the coolant, you no longer have a structural solid fuel rod you have to worry about the structural integrity on, and you can use essentially all of the fuel. So fuel utilization goes way up, Simultaneously, you're not throwing it in the waste stream, so your waste production goes way down. And so that's a huge advantage for using liquid fuel. As an added bonus, if your medical isotopes, the fission fragments and captured uh, isotopes, aren't uh, captured behind that cladding, but are free to move through the coolant and be extracted from the coolant, then you have access to those medical isotopes. And we can start thinking about other, other ways to treat cancer. Obviously, you can't melt down if you start with a liquid, and this is a more efficient way of using thorium. If you want to use thorium in a reactor, putting it in a liquid fuel, the molten salt reactor is the most efficient way of, of going about that. So these are two key requirements we're talking about. So what have we done here at ACU? What have we done at Next Lab? You get to see in person. In 2017, we started a little project. We started a, a loop that was melting salt. Uh, 2018, our molten salt test loop came online. And, and so for the last five plus years, we've been circulating salt on campus. And in 2018, the Department of Energy heard what we were doing. Ed McGinnis came and looked at it and he said, this is, the, this is the future. This is what we need to do. We need to develop this technology. We need to do it faster than China is. And we might have missed that boat, but we're still working on this. They love the vision. They love the idea of how can we take this technology and bless the world. And they loved what we were doing on campus and educating students. And they said, how are you getting from this small test loop to deployed to the world? Come to DC and tell us about it. And so following up in early 2019, uh, Doug Robson, who will speak next, myself, the president of Abilene Christian University, President Schubert, we went to DC and we told the Department of Energy our path forward to go from this little simple test loop to uh, deployed technology around the world is we'd like to build a molten salt research reactor on the university campus. And that's our first step. And we can do that. We understand how to do it. We have the resources to do it, but we need the Department of Energy to provide fuel for us. We need that uh, molten salt, uh, front, that the salt the flyb salt from Oak Ridge that's been sitting there since the 60s. If you can provide those things to us, then we can move forward with this. And it took them most of 2019, but before the end of the year, they gave us a programmatic letter of support. And that's when this project really took off, this, this goal to build a reactor. At that point in time, Doug Robinson stood up Natura Resources. Natura Resources is a, has a, a purpose to uh, answer the world's increased demand for reliable energy, medical isotopes, and clean water. Kinds of sounds familiar. Not by chance, right? This is from the beginning. This has been a, a collaboration. 
But, but Nature Resources focused on commercially deployable, right? Not how do we take the research product from the lab and how do we deploy it to the world? Because again, we don't bless the world by having a really cool reactor on the ASU campus. That's the starting point, but that's not where it ends. The way you really uh, uh, help the world is by making this commercially deployable. And so that was the focus of Natura Resources. Natura Resources stood up what we refer to as the Natura Resources Research Alliance. It's four different universities that all have sponsored research agreements with Natura Resources. So Abilene Christian University, but also University of Texas, Texas A&M, and Georgia Institute of Technology. So these are some principal investigators from all four institutions uh, working together meeting at a meeting we had at Abilene Christian University. What are we doing? We're building a molten salt research reactor. What does that reactor look like? It looks a lot like the molten salt reactor experiment that was built on the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in the 1960s. So for four years, this reactor operated there. You have some pictures of the core. You have pictures of the the control room and uh, it operated very, very successfully there. So it's not a question, does this technology work? Because it was demonstrated uh, 50 plus years ago. We're, we're using, we're building off of that. As, as we think about the, the challenges of licensing this technology, we're doing things as similar to what was done 50 plus years ago as possible. And so we have a lot of shared com, uh, concepts between the reactor we're building on the ACU campus and the reactor they built at Oak Ridge in the 1960s. The shared concepts is we're gonna use the same fuel, uranium tetrafluoride in the same uh, salt, uh, lithium fluoride, beryllium fluoride, eutectic mixture. They're both loop designs. They use graphite as a moderator. They have a drain tank at the bottom of it uh, that's put all of this radioactive um, system underneath the ground in a trench. We're going to have a short lifetime. We're not trying to build a reactor to produce electricity for the next 60 or 80 years. We're building a research reactor that will collect data for us for the next handful of years. It's also a low pressure system. So all that is very similar and um, very, very familiar to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Where we're simplifying things is we're saying we don't need to use high enriched uranium. We'll use low enriched uranium. We're not going to build a 10 megawatt or 8 megawatt reactor. We're going to build a 1 megawatt reactor thermal. We're going to use nuclear qualified stainless steel 316 instead of some of the more exotic uh, Hasloid N type uh, elements. We're not going to have a freeze plug to keep the salt up in the, the reactor loop. We're not going to reply. We're not going to rely on a frozen slug of salt, but we're simply going to use pneumatic pressure to hold it up there. Makes it much faster to release the pressure and drain the tank. We're not going to rely on control rods for safety, um, and we're not going to have any cooling water anywhere around. So we've simplified things as much as possible. So what are we building? This is a cartoon of what we're building, but I think it shows the, the concept. So let me just talk about the picture for just a moment, and then I'll run through some of the layered safety features that really mimic the things that David said earlier to us. If we start in the very center of this thing, the big volume in the center with the vertical stripes, that's our core. It's filled mostly with graphite, but salt comes in the bottom at relatively cool temperatures. The blue, it gets warm through the fission process in the core. It goes out through the top through a reactor access vessel, through a pump, through a heat exchanger where it loses its thermal energy, it goes back down to the bottom of the core and it's a simple loop. Forced uh, uh, flow of fly salt through the core. At the very bottom of all this is a drain tank. Uh, the only thing that keeps the salt up in the loop while you're operating is the pneumatic pressure on the drain tank. And there's a pipe to the left that goes up through a valve that equalizes pressure at the top and bottom. If you want to shut this thing down, you don't scram it. You don't insert control rods. You simply flush it, right? You release the, the air pressure and allow gravity to do its trick. And so this system is, is walk away safe. Um, and all of everything I just described is inside of what I, you can think of as a large oven. Uh, it's a reactor, so we can't call it that. We refer to it as our reactor thermal management system. But as you go out from that, the, the, if we talk about the layers of safety here, as David mentioned, our first layer of safety is the salt itself. Radioactive material is retained in that salt. If you come tomorrow to the labs, you'll see what happens when, if there ever was a leak of salt. It doesn't flash to steam and drift around the world. And if it had radioactive material in it, radioactive material would drift around the world. But it falls. If you have a catch pan, it falls into a catch pan. And as it cools off, it becomes a solid. And so if you have any impurities or any radioactive material, it's right there in your solid chunk in the catch pan at the bottom of the, of the tank. Is it a mess? Well, maybe it's a mess. But it's a mess right there. You've contained and you control where it's at. You fix the leak. You melt it. You put it back in the system, you're good to go. Very, very different than a water-cooled reactor. So our layers of safety, salt first, then the primary pump loop, 
Then you have the th reactive thermal management system. This is a metal catch pan inside of an oven. Outside of that, you have the reactor enclosure, the outer boundaries of this. And then beyond that, you have the reactor cell. So very much as David was talking about, you have layers of safety that cumulatively ensure that if something goes wrong, there's no release of radiation to the environment or the people. It's a low pressure system. You shut down via a drain. It's passive heat removal. So you don't have to worry about any sort of active cooling even during a shutdown due to decay heat. That's what we're building. We're building it. This is a picture of the reactor enclosure. So some early engineering designs. The reactor enclosure is about 10 feet diameter, 20 feet high. You can see a life-size two-dimensional picture of this tomorrow on campus. To support all this work, we're doing lots of, of research on campus. Uh, lots of different projects. Uh, the left-hand column here is a bunch of salt systems. Uh, tomorrow on campus, you'll be able to see uh, the uh, molten salt test system. It's a 50-gallon system that's finished the uh, water commissioning phase, and we're pure in the, act, in the process of purifying salt to, to fill it with. Uh, the second column is uh, a bunch of chemistry that's required, and you can tour the radiochemistry labs. The third column is instrumentation, data acquisition, filters, and all this is leading up to the very bottom right, the molten salt research reactor. A um, lot of work happening here. If you want to see these projects, please come to our labs tomorrow. Let me give you a quick update on what's happening with our Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, we can't build one of these things in this country without the permission of the government. So uh, we find ourselves um, where we, we have to go through this hurdle. Is it the most efficient hurdle? Can it be streamlined? David addressed this again. We hope for a future, a better uh, licensing process. But what we're doing is we're moving forward right now. And the easiest way to get a reactor license today is to come with a small reactor, a research reactor in particular. And so that's the pathway that Natura Resources and ACU is going. University and toured our facility and heard project firsthand, and so they're very excited about it. A third of the fourth will be here later this month. Um, we've been invited to. Uh, is that working? Is, is everyone still hearing me? Yeah. yeah. All right, we're still good. In, earlier this year, they invited me to go to DC to present to the commissioners about how. Advanced research reactors, we're going to help with the deployment of advanced commercial reactors. So they understand our role. They understand not only what we're trying to do, but how we're trying to build this reactor so we can collect the data, we can understand how it works, and so that we can then move forward. We, being Natura, along with the Research Alliance, can build those reactors at a commercial scale and deploy them to, to benefit the world. We've answered over 300 questions to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. We have uh, one you want to count it, left, and we're very close with that, so we're very optimistic. We're about to, to wrap, wrap up the construction remit uh, discussion with them. Uh, we have already uh, gotten our environmental assessment uh, report from them last month, and it contains officially a finding of no significant impact. So their words are, it's either so small as it doesn't matter, or it's actually unmeasurable type of impact. Uh, we're going to build a, a small reactor inside of a pre-existing building surrounded by a lot of concrete. There is no safety risk or environmental impact to this. And that was pretty exciting to us because we have just built the building to put this reactor in. Uh, using a never used before regulation from the Atomic Energy, Energy Access, access can, can you, you apply, apply, you can apply to build, build a reactor in a pre-existing pre multi-purpose and in parentheses, i.e. University, University Research, research really close parentheses. parentheses. That, that's, that's what it says in the regulation. regulation. Never, Never been, been done before, before but, but we, we employed, employed that. that. So, so we, we, built, we have built the building to deploy this. this. <laughs> Again, Again, going, going forward and moving and doing things in, in, in uh, parallel. parallel. The, the construction, construction is expected later this summer, and uh, uh, the picture on the right is uh, Chair Hansen here, touring ACU with Alan Christian University's President Phil Schubert, Doug and I. And this is the report that we got from the NRC about our environmental assessment. So, so what, what is, is that facility? facility? It's, it's a, what, what we refer to as the Dillard Science and Research, Research Center. Um, um, it's, it's a 28,000 square foot facility, but you're, you're going to get to see it tomorrow, so I won't say a lot about it. It, it was uh, at a grand, grand opening in September, and so, so we are still, still in the process, process of moving in. in. You'll, you'll see uh, a uh, uh, labs that are up and functioning. functioning. You'll also see labs that look like they're still mostly empty. Let's go, they're still mostly empty. We've just barely been in a few months in this facility, and we're continuing to use it in something we're expecting to grow over the time. If, if you, you want, want to see the nation's, nation's only advanced, advanced reactor test, test facility, facility, then, then I encourage you to come, come tomorrow and tour this. So, let me tell you, it's tomorrow morning. I think you have this in your facilities, but um, 
it's a new facility. So if you just take in Dillard, I'll tell you there's a, a, a dorm on the ASU campus that's called Dillard Hall. You, Google map might take you to the wrong place if you just stick in Dillard. Um, if you stick in 949 North 16th, you will go to the wrong place, okay? North 16th has a two sides of town, an east north and a north. So I'd encourage you to get the address right when you stick it in there uh, and so you can show up. The building's pretty distinctive. And so if you show up the wrong place, I think it's going to be pretty obvious. But love for you to show up at 9 a.m. tomorrow. We'll have some coffee and donuts for you. At 9.30, President Schubert's going to greet you and welcome you to our campus. Uh, Doug will say a few words. I'll give you a few reminders. And then you'll give a, be given a couple hours to tour the facility, our labs, ask questions, walk around and see things. So I encourage you to come i appreciate everyone's uh coming to to see this um if inside the the, the most exciting uh part of the building is this research bay you have this large trench where you have a deployment um, of a, a research reactor and so this is our life-size two-dimensional version of our molten salt research reactor and the exciting thing is, is that this reactor can be built off site, put on a flatbed, brought in here, and then lowered via crane, just like this poster is, down into the research bay. And that's sort of the way we can demonstrate for the first time a small modular reactor being deployed. And so if um, you're uh, interested in seeing, you want to see the nation's first advanced research reactor, then you're going to have to come back to Abilene in a couple years. It's not there yet. But we're going to welcome you back when that day happens because we're excited about it. Um, I want to wrap up my comments by showing this slide. So this is a slide from Idaho National Lab. So uh, Dave, I stole this from Idaho, and we're very thankful. This is an exciting slide. We've slightly modified it, I will say. So this is advanced reactor deployment, uh, and this was exciting to us because late last year was the first time our project got added to this slide. So we're excited. For years, Idaho's had this slide of all the different advanced projects. Uh, most of these projects are projects funded by billions of dollars of federal money, um, and they've been on here tracking it. The thing that's happened, the evolution that's happened over the years is things have a tendency to sort of slide to the right. Um, delays, things happen. We understand that. Uh, delays happening. Um, but we did get added, so the circle at the bottom next uh, molten salt research reactor by Natura Resource ACU, we're really excited to be added on there. Uh, two things were on there, Dome and Lotus, uh, popping in 25 and 26. Those are actually sort of facilities in Idaho that will be used to test advanced reactors. And so they missed, though, the nation's first facility for testing advanced reactors, the CERC. So we added that on there. So the very picture on the left, we added that. So we modified the slide. And then... A couple weeks ago, Idaho, uh, Idaho National Lab updated this slide, and um, a couple of these things you'll notice um, are no longer happening in calendar year 25, but sort of moved over to the 26. So the uh, Project Pele and Marvel have sort of slid up to align with uh, where our project is. So we're excited. We were literally on this leading edge of advanced reactors being deployed. Uh, we're excited about that. We, um, we, we have a path there, and um, that path is to lean heavily on uh, the uh, the, the collaboration that we have here between the university, the other research alliance, and all of us being funded by Natura Resources. So let me give you a summary of where we are. Natura Resources Research Alliance is leading the way in molten salt reactor uh, development and deployment. Uh, ACU is licensing the first advanced uh, university research reactor with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. It's the first new research reactor in over 30 years. It's the first advanced reactor ever. Uh, ACU has completed our Science Engineering Research Center that will house the molten salt uh, research reactor. So we have a licensing underway. We expect a construction permit this summer. We have a facility that we had the grand opening on last fall, and we're, we're working in now, and you'll get to tour tomorrow. And so we're on the path to be the first operating advanced reactor in the nation. And that, that's very, very exciting. But more important and more exciting than just having a cool toy on one university is Natura is now positioned to be one of the first commercial reactor vendors capable of deploying this technology and meeting the world's needs. Very, very thankful for Natura Resources' sponsor of us and all the other sponsors that have helped uh, get us to where we are. Uh, Natura Resources has a brand new cool website and encourage you to check it out. And that website includes this video that I would like to show you at this time.
you only get to tout the results of a well that you've never drilled once. And you're gonna be wrong when you go around telling people this is what we've done if you haven't done it. Um, what we like to point to is what we have performed, what we've actually done. I think the big thing for those of us at Natura that's what has attracted us to this project is the mission behind it. How can we take this technology as a chance to, to really bring people out of energy poverty and change people's lives, give them pure water, produce medical isotopes that will cure people? How can we invest in that technology while at the same time we're educating students? Our research focus at Abilene Christian is on those questions that bear into people's lives, that make a difference in how people are able to live through their life journey. And the tour gets that. The whole reason that they exist is to, to help us take this technology to the world because it matters. Oh, we've chosen a unique path, and that's enabled us to go from a relative unknown three, four years ago to a leader in the field. So this building is an example of that. We don't have to give you a drawing of a building, a projection of a building. We can walk you through the building. That world-class facility, one of a kind, the first since 1960 to demonstrate this technology, will give us the answers we need for commercial deployment. The team is is broken down on several levels. At the, at the, at the highest level, we have four universities. University of Texas, Texas A&M, Georgia Institute of Technology, and Abilene Christian Universities. A team of experienced leaders who understand energy, who understand nuclear, who brought in partners that have expertise in these areas is exactly what's necessary to ensure you got the right people. To have a test bed where we're actually gathering real-time data and performing real-time experiments um, is going to greatly benefit us moving forward on the commercial design. Turn is the partner that says, okay, we take what we're learning, we apply it to the real problems of the world, and then we commercialize that and take it to the market. Look at what we're doing. Look at what we've done as we continue to perform. That's our obligation. We have to continue to perform. As we continue to perform, then we would expect those engagements to increase right alongside the work we're doing. We're talking about a world where we have essentially unlimited quantities of clean energy. The opportunities are endless for the impact that we can have. And here's Doug Robson. He's who you want to hear from now. Uh, hold on one second for both of you guys. For both of you, I just uh, I wanted to do this now instead of uh, during the cocktail hour, so you could uh, have sober people acknowledge it. Not that there's anything wrong with somebody uh, tipping. Yeah. yeah. So every year we recognize uh, one or two uh, groups or folks for you know the Thorium Prize. So I wanted to give this uh, to you guys. You're gonna have to share it so you, you can fight over it. It's kind of like a dagger, so whoever gets it first. <laughs> but, but here, it's, it, and what it says is, uh, Dr. Russell Powell and Doug Robeson, Advanced Reactor Pioneers, Abilene Christian University Natural Resources, 2024 Thorium Prize. So thanks, guys. So guys, you really are heroes to all of us in here, and, I, and we're suiting you to your hospitality. has been, been uh, second and on. Texas really does things right, and you know you got a beautiful facility here, and you got a beautiful outlook on why. You know, I always ask that too. I'm like, why? Why would we do this? I don't care about the how. And uh, so I'm going to hand it to you, Doug, and you can talk more about the why because you're the best. Thank you, Doug. So I got a quick pop quiz for you, and there's an, uh, uh, John, you can't do this because you already have a challenge coin. Any Natura researchers, you can't do it. Any Natura people, any Next Lab people. What is the fundamental energy? Whoever, raise your hand if you have the question, answer. What is the fundamental energy that powers every nuclear reactor in the world? 
No, sir. Sorry? No. No, no. Almost. What? Solar, solar. <laughs> no. Yes? Huh? Love. <laughs> Anybody else? else? No. no. The Star Force. No. no. Where is the Star Force? Huh? No. 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 Spirit? Resources. Uh, money. 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 Who, Who said, said money? money? There you go. <laughs> Would you, would you, Rusty, Rusty, would you give that to him? Yeah. Money, I, you know. So Natura's job, so Natura funds the research at all four universities. Uh, <clears throat> I worked 40 years, 150 miles down the road in the Permian Basin. Uh, my company, EXL Petroleum, uh, revolutionized the oil and gas industry. If you've heard of shell plays or hydraulic fracturing, or that's what we did. In fact, this project was funded for six years out of recy recycled oil and gas profits. So there's all, already we're recycling here. If we can put as much power on the grid with this technology as what we did in the Permian, that would be a job well done. The challenge Natura has, our, our job is to fund this research. And I want you to understand that fundamentally this reactor performs three duties. It is a research reactor. So it's research and education. We have 150 researchers slash students on the project at any one time. I guess at this point in the uh, four or five years that we've been at this, we have cycled maybe close to 1,000 students through that. Secondly, it demonstrates that you can get a license from the NRC. The NRC has never licensed an advanced reactor. There's two companies that have filed Construction permits have been docketed by the NRC. That's Natura slash ACU and Kairos Power. The third is this reactor provides data to support the commercial reactors. Straight to commercial has been a failure because if you're talking straight to commercial and advanced reactors, the NRC has consistently said the data does not exist. To support that, start with a test reactor or a demonstration reactor. That's where we started. We started with a research reactor. One of our researchers, Rusty, from the University of Texas, made the statement that we need two weeks of operational data to support the commercial reactors. I'm not sure if that's true yet. I need, I've learned it just because one nuclear physicist says it doesn't mean I want to hear two or three say the same thing. Um, so let me remember very briefly, this is what's going to happen this year. Uh, we are going to get our construction permit approved, every indication from the NRC that's going to happen. We're going to file the application for operating license. We are going to complete the detailed engineering design that's being done by Zachary Engineering and Zachary Nuclear at the end of this year. That'll be the first detailed engineering design completed on an advanced reactor period anywhere in the country. Natura has already begun two years ago the des initial design work on the commercial reactor. Uh, we have already started early engagement, very early engagement with the NRC on the commercial reactor. This is a one megawatt thermal reactor. That's a limit imposed by the DOE. Our commercial reactor is currently designed to be a 250 megawatt thermal, 100 megawatt electric uh, reactor. Still a small modular reactor, still transported on the back of a semi, still fits all those qualifications. That work has already begun. What's really interesting is over the last two months, and I can't, a lot of what I should talk about, I can't talk about because we're in a non-disclosure agreement, so we're getting into the uh, kind of the inside corporate strategy of Natura. But two months ago, we were approached by a, a, a group that we are now looking at utilizing this reactor, this design, as a commercial reactor. We had not anticipated that possibility. It would be a much smaller reactor. If that is indeed the case, Natura may see two product lines moving forward, a micro reactor that will be this design that are already will be approved by the end of this year, as well as our 100 megawatt electric, 250 megawatt thermal. So that's, that's the task before us. Uh, the way we get there is we get there through partnerships, just like ACU. If you look at ACU, you saw the University of Texas, you saw Georgia Tech, you saw Texas A&M. That collaboration 
Uh, ACU quarterback the effort. That the quarterback is never the biggest guy on the field. ACU certainly not as big as these other universities, but has led this effort. Natura is doing the same thing. Natura did not exist four years ago. I thought I was retiring when I came to Abilene. That lasted about seven months. We are partnering with, for Zachary, example, Zachary Nuclear. That's a 100-year-old company, uh, 100 partner companies inside, 22,000 employees. We're partnering with Zachary. We're partnering with Teledyne Brown. We're looking at other strategic partnerships. It gives us the ability to take what's being done here, to engineer, to fabricate, to deploy, to operate. And so the same approach is the ultimate success of this project and success is commercial deployment of reactors that are affordable. That's what sustainable energy means it is going to be done depending upon the joint ventures and the partnerships we enter into and the capital available. And that's the last key to be unlocked. So I, I know John wanted to save some time for Q&A. Rusty, I'm guessing you should come back up because uh, somebody might ask me a physics question. And I will punt that to you. So anyway, thank you for being here. We're very excited. We got to attend the uh, conference last year in Albuquerque. and very honored that every, it's not easy to get to Abilene. We get it. Somebody, I think Greg was, or David was asking, why don't we have a direct flight to Denver? We don't. So thank you for taking the time and effort to be here. <laughs> That's great, Doug. Um, so, so questions? questions? Stand, Stand up and say your. your uh, this is Ganapati Mainani. Is it similar to MSRE? Is it capable of 10 megawatt thermal or? So it would be one megawatt thermal. No, you're restricting it, but can it be operating at 10 megawatt uh, thermal? Yes, absolutely. It can be made bigger. Absolutely. So that that actually was what we went to when we in the last couple of months when we had the um, opportunity arise. Can we take this design and deploy it as a smaller reactor? And we can, and we can upgrade to 10, 15, maybe more megawatt thermal without affecting the reactor design. It really becomes a function of what is your, uh, you know, the rest of your exchange system looks like and so forth. Yeah. I heard you mention that in your talk earlier. I was, I was thinking of that. Uh, hi, sure. Here, Shirley Rodriguez, uh, you claim that this reactor is SMR. Can you please uh, specify or elaborate on what aspects of this um, advanced reactors are modularized? So we're going to, dem as Dr. Tao mentioned, we're going to demonstrate. Well, I think one of the principal characteristics of a small modular reactor is off-site construction and then transportation and placement into the research reactor bay. So this reactor, we, it will be constructed off-site and then transported to Abilene on the back of a semi. There's a 40-ton crane in the reactor bay. We'll lower that reactor down into the, into the reactor trench. So it's, are you meaning the, the, the vessel? It's only the, the vessel? The, the vessel, that's right. Okay, thank you. First of all, thanks so much for this work. It's so inspiring. I've been an SMR fan since maybe 15 years. It's incredible what you guys have accomplished. Deep tech, hard tech, high capex deployments, there's this phenomenon called crossing the chasm, going from pilot to commercialization. Valley of death, yeah. Valley of death. How do you guys envision navigating the valley of death? Money. Data centers. <laughs> Data centers, I think, is the greatest example right now. We just filed a, uh, I responded to a request for information that came from Google and Microsoft and Nucor. Um, what AI has done to data centers, if you pay attention to the amount of power being used by data centers and where they're going to get the future power, it, it was, has always been a problem. AI has turned that large wave into a tidal wave. And so the data center industry that is loath to use carbon, uh, and, and quite frankly, they couldn't pull the amount of power off the grid that they would need to pull off the grid, uh, and renewables don't work. And so that RFI that came out, those three companies need 10 gigawatt of power by 2030 to 2040. That would be a thousand of our reactors. That's just those companies. And we're under non-disclosure with other 
hyperscalers that are needing the same. The conventional thinking is that as industries, and it's not just data centers, you look at clean air capture, you look at manufacturing, refining, not to mention base load power, as they see that they are not going to be able to get the power that they need for the industry, they're going to start swimming upstream. How far upstream do they swim? Do they swim? And, and this group has already said they would swim upstream to the point of mining. <clears throat> well, between here and mining is, are they going to become the capital provider for nuclear reactor projects? That's one path forward that is starting to develop. We won't know until it happens. I think what we do know is federal support in and of itself is not enough. Uh, the other is that there is a thought that a sovereign, whether it's in the Middle East or wherever the case may be, will step up and say, we're going, we have to have this power, we have to have this technology, and we have to move forward. So that's how you cross that chasm of death. The chasm of death is we will deploy this reactor because of the pathway we took, but you get to that first of a kind commercial reactor, particularly the 100 megawatt, that's, that's the path we are, are working towards. And, and as I said in the video, if we keep performing, if we keep doing what we're supposed to be doing, de-risking, with I carried this project for six years with our own skin in the game, at some point, you're going to attract those partners, whether it's industrial or institutional, financial or sovereign, are going to step up and say, we've got to make this happen. Yeah. You, you mentioned the capacity of one megawatt uh, thermal. Uh, in terms of electrical generation size, I, I would assume you're just going to reject heat. You're not going to try to simulate the power generation. How do you envision uh, the power generation to be super critical? Uh, CO2, is it standard? Who's going to do the development? Are you going to do it on your in your university, or how, how do you see that uh, being scaled up and designed? Have you thought about that? <laughs> yes, we've thought about it, and it also is very customer specific, right? Um, if, if they care about the, the, the highest efficiency, then supercritical CO2 is the right way to go. If they care about fastest to deployment and fewest hurdles, then you probably go with something that's a little bit more off the shelf solution. Um, and so it, it depends on, on the customer. They really want the high process heat. Do they need the electricity? They want a combination of both. And so that's, that is something that um, anybody, lots of people have been thinking about taking thermal energy and converting it into electricity and the appropriate way to do that. So. Certainly at ACU, we haven't been worried about that. For this reactor, you're right, the first research reactor, that, that thermal energy is rejected the environment. But obviously, commercial cares about how you harness that and what you do with that. So it depends on the customer. So what we're, I come from the oil and gas industry. So we talk about turning to the right. So the, Andrew Harmon, who's one of our VPs right over here, showed me a video talking about this oil, oil, oil and gas guy that talked about turning to the right, and he acted like we were turning a valve. Turning to the right means you're drilling. It's also called making whole. It's like it's not like this. It's like this. I'm not a big fan of power purchase agreements. I, I see lots of announcements about power purchase agreements, and I I can't tell if they're worth the paper they're written on. What we prefer to do, and we're doing it now, is entering into feasibility studies. So we're I don't think I can say who we're doing this with. We're doing two feasibility studies, maybe a third. I want to get our customers' engineers across the table from our engineers before we enter into any kind of agreements. And we understand what their needs are and they understand what our capabilities are. If we're talking to data centers, they need one specific type. They're interested in electrons. If we're talking to refineries, uh, they, they may need heat along with power. And so first steps are feasibility. So we, are, we have a feasibility study on that technology ongoing as we speak. That is going to be very customer specific. For our commercial reactor, which we anticipate deploying our first commercial reactor by 2030, we need site selection next year in the NRC timeline. And so we're working with potential customers who are providing site selection and capabilities. But it's more of an engineering function than it is starting to have attorneys write contracts. I'm Ralph McBride. I have a question about when you'll develop the non-commercial as well as the commercial. I'm sure you're thinking about this, considering that you're coming from Abilene Christian, how you'll develop this, not as a non-profit, but as a, a third world solution for energy shortages. Is that, hap is that happening now? And, and what's the timing on that? Yes, it's happening now. So this, this reactor at ACU is actually our first, Natura's first deployed reactor. Uh, it will be deployed by 2026, 20, if everything stays on track. 
Uh, we've already started the detail, uh, the, the, the preliminary design on the commercial reactor. Uh, we would be moving quite, moving faster in commercial reactor. It's just a function of money. If we had more money available, we are not recipients of ARP 20. When ARP 20 was issued, Natura didn't exist. So we, we've moved very quickly on private investment. Uh, my concern about getting to third world countries, and I'm, uh, Governor Abbott here in Texas uh, had a directive in August of last year uh, to the, uh, form the Texas Nuclear Advanced Nuclear Task Force. I'm serving on that task force. His directive was how do we get advanced nuclear to Texas? How does Texas become the leader of advanced nuclear? And how do we support the grid with dispatchable power? One of my concerns about data centers is data centers that are willing to pay three and a half times the going rate of power for the grid could snatch up every advanced reactor that's produced for the next 20 years. So it's going to be really interesting to see how we balance high paying customers. I say we, I'm talking about the whole industry with other needs that are more fundamental and we may just have to figure out a way to tie the reactors out of that production stream or something to because we... As, as this video reemphasized, this project fundamentally was how do we meet some of the world's fundamental needs? I don't know that data centers are one of the world's fundamental needs. Maybe they are, uh, but that's going to be the that's going to be the marketing. That's going to be the market challenge we're going to have to navigate our way through. I wanted to thank you for what you're doing. I come from California, and I know this would never, ever happen in California. So it's kind of nice to be in the energy center of America. Um, I wanted to ask about the financing of these. Uh, well, I, I would love to build them in California, but it's probably never going to happen. Uh, I wanted to ask how you guys are financed today and how you envisioning uh, structuring these deals with, uh, in particular, process heat. Uh, for example, are you talking to the energy trading companies uh, who want to buy options on commodities? How do you think about these structuring these deals um, in the future? Currently, everything is financed through private investment, individual investment. Uh, we just closed our last financing round Friday. Uh, that was oversubscribed, so that's a good thing. Um, I haven't thought about commodity ex exchanges as being a financial source. It could. As I mentioned earlier, I, I anticipate, and I'm, it's just not me, it's Guggenheim has been speaking for the street for several years on how the capital is going to flow into advanced nuclear and and their their tune has changed a little bit over the last year or two but but i think i agree with what they're saying is that either a sovereign is going to do it so that's a a nation somewhere is going to step up and say we're going to make this happen uh or technology companies now i would and a technology company would then i would argue that the rfi that we just got the request for information that we we submitted our application, and it was Natura and Zachary and others. Uh, I don't. Can I say Andrew? Are those public? Who participated in that RFI that we submitted? I'll, I'll leave it. At huh? Okay. Natura and Zachary and others uh, that participated in that. That is technology stepping up and saying we want advanced nuclear. Now they have not swum upstream to say we're going to fund it. But they have said, we're going to issue power purchase agreements that I just said I'm, I'm not that big a fan of. The public market has not yet proved itself. We've seen new scale in the public market. They've had their ups and downs. Oklo apparently is going to the public market. X Energy was going to go to the public market. They've pulled that back. I don't know if that's going to happen or not. So the public market has not yet proved itself. So I, I'm, a big, I'm a big believer in, in individual investment and the free market. And I don't think we survive via federal or state funding. I think that's a pathway to nowhere if you're not careful. I'm hoping the industry or capital will, will step up. Uh, swinging a little bit more to the technical side, I was thinking about, uh, you mentioned baseload forever, or uh, I'm wondering if baseload, is nuclear power forever uh, gonna be in that, hold into that base hole, base load job. Even a data center has diurnal patterns uh, and increased power usage during the day and the night, especially if we're talking about local plants or local commercial, you have these patterns. So do you have any plans to do with your research like uh, variable power output and how to manage that and how to account for that? 
So, so certainly uh, reactors can do load following, right? I mean, I think the, the Navy is a great example of, of decades of thousands of year, reactor years worth of variable you know, load following. So it's possible. Um, anything would prefer steady output than, uh, than you know, changing uh, dramatically. So I, I, to me, I think the future lies with multifunctional aspect of the reactors, where you, you produce electricity and high process heat, whether that's to desalinate water or produce synthetic fuels or uh, to produce uh, hydrogen. You know, and so you have multiple outputs. And when you need more electricity, you produce all electricity. When there's not the electrical man, that's when you produce hydrogen or synthetic fuels or desalinate water or something like that. But that's, again, that would be end user. How do you want to utilize that that resource so I, I believe there's a bigger future for nuclear than just base load power on the electric grid okay thank you Good. I, I assume you're going to test different um, fissile materials in different mixes within the salt the different fuel types so so the first research reactor is going to go with the simplest solution possible to try to make it as easy as possible for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to say yes. So the reactor, when we commission it and turn it on, it'll be enriched uranium-235, the fuel source, and that's it. You know, there's, there's people that... There's people who love the idea of a thorium-powered fuel supply. I'm, I, I believe the future is thorium, but the first step is what can we get done, not what's the best solution out oh, there. Yeah. So absolutely, down the road, is there a possibility of right. changing things different or mixing in and learning more and more? Absolutely, the technology supports it. This first reactor will be the easiest thing to get licensed. But I assume after it succeeds, it's gonna keep going. And it keeps going. Yeah. I mean, unlike the MSRE, we don't currently have a plan that would say, let's strip out all the uranium-235 and put in 233 or something like that. Um, we have a source of materials and challenges and there's also separating special nuclear material at private facilities that uh, you know the DOD doesn't like. That was a lousy end. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you for coming to Abilene. Absolutely. There you go. Don't. Something real quick here before I uh, give you a little bit of a break. Uh, there's a fella, more or less dead ahead of me here, Charles Ivey. And uh, yeah, yeah, that guy trying to cover his eyes. He's a national treasure. And uh, he's one of the, you know, original nuclear founding fathers. So. He loves attention, <laughs> and uh, you know, say hi to him, congratulate him on a career well, uh, well done. And uh, you know, I, I, you guys like you are, are heroes to me. You know, you you've been at it for the whole, all the time. So Charles, uh, thanks for, for your career and your life. And we'll see you back after the break. You all have schedules in front of you. I think uh, back here about three thirty, something around there. Thanks.
I want to speak to you about a new organization called the Eco-Modernist Society of North America. I'm here because we are in the midst of a potentially monumental ecological crisis. It is only through a new environmentalism 2.0 that progress can be made. We believe that our only hope for human advancement and even human survival is through the exponential advance of science in the service of humanity. We stand firmly against the war on science that is predicated on the appeal to nature fallacy, which is the belief that whatever is natural must be good and whatever is unnatural must be bad. This belief has become an impediment to advances in areas such as human health, social progress, and even environmental progress. In the field of medicine, the appeal to nature fallacy has already led to catastrophic outcomes. Resistance to vaccines threatens public health and the lives of children. The unwarranted resistance to GMOs has not only held back the fight against climate change, but it has also hampered our ability to feed the developing world as well. Campaigns against GMOs have also held back efforts to ward off the deadly Aedes aegypti mosquito, which has killed countless millions as a carrier of disease and plagues. The scientific consensus concerning the safety of GMOs is solidly supported in every major scientific organization across the planet. The only thing green about being anti-GMO is the extra cash that is made by overcharging for expensive boutique food. But that won't cut it when it comes to raising crops with accelerating heat stress, droughts, floods, disease, and insect infestations brought on by a hotter planet. It makes no sense to accept the call of the IPCC for decarbonization within the next 12 years and yet reject their conclusion that these goals are impossible without nuclear power, which has proven itself to be the cleanest, safest, and most reliable way of achieving decarbonization. It is the most reliable way to decarbonize simply because the alternatives of weather-dependent power sources are inherently unreliable. And nuclear is the cleanest energy source because it is the only form of energy production that completely encases its waste stream. Super safe, advanced Generation 4 reactors, which will almost completely convert existing nuclear waste to centuries worth of energy, are coming very close to commercialization. In fact, it goes completely against most everything we're led to believe, but nuclear... All right. You guys don't have to stop talking, but you can't do it here. So if you guys could find your seats, that'd be super great. If you could stop talking, that'd be even super more better. Uh, I really appreciate it. And I know everybody loves, loves to talk about all the things we're talking about, but you got to stop talking. All right, I need to get Gordon a clapper, an actual clink, you know. <laughs> so uh, please uh, find your seat or find the door. Uh, I don't want to be rude, but uh, you're being rude. Got to be quiet. You got to go or sit down, please. All right, so while that's happening, uh, and, yeah, I'm... I'm also a little bit sorry, it's not my fault, but it's a little warm in here, I know, so we're trying to get... You think it's Texas, nobody loves air conditioning more than Texas. You think, you think that usually you can store meat in every building in Texas. So, uh, uh, while we're waiting for uh, the hoi ploy here to calm down for a moment, uh, our esteemed uh, video live stream production crew of one, Carl Pauls here, uh, is also uh, an employee of a 
a fairly famous uh, advanced reactor, little baby startup. <laughs> and uh, he, he has very generously and bravely uh, gone through the uh, torturous exercise of getting a, a, a very brief presentation approved. So thank you, Carl. I can't thank you enough for all you've done. We should thank him for all the video work, and we should thank him for taking the time to do this. Awesome. Thank you, thank you. So yeah, I, I, I have gotten up at like six, and I'm West Coast, so it feels like four. And uh, I've got five cups of coffee in me. So happy to be here. Uh, I am a software developer. I Believe it or not, I wasn't hired to TerraPower to do media. This is just a hobby. Uh, it's, it's a fun thing I like to do, to lose a bunch of hair, making productions like this go off without too many hitches. But uh, that is where I started in my career. I started as a security server developer. It was a little thing called security information management. And I loved video games. I loved it so much, I really had to get into video games. I worked for some of the biggest game companies in the world. League of Legends, Riot Games, World of Warcraft, Blizzard Entertainment, and uh, another company that makes a tanks game called uh, Wargaming. Uh, through that, uh, you know, around 2014, I saw a crazy video about thorium. And then I remembered, hey, I grew up outside Oak Ridge. My dad worked in nuclear. He helped, he helped put Watts Bar 2 in safe store. He helped project manage Satsup before they shut it down, before Seattle helped shut it down. Thank you, Seattle. Uh, and I knew a lot. I have an, an atomic merit badge. So I have a background that gave me all the tools to recognize, no, this is a good thing. And not just thorium, but all nuclear is good. And then I got training with the amazing folks at Generation Atomic. And I, I think technically I still owe them a few homework assignments before I can officially call myself an atomic ambassador. And then uh, some amazing folks at the NAYGN, the Young American, uh, uh, n sorry, Young Generation Nuclear of North America started a committee to go to conferences like RE+, like uh, Clean Power America. And I joined their team and did a show not unlike this at uh, Pittsburgh CEM. Uh, clean Energy Ministerial, uh, and I am really proud of the work that we have done in in advocacy, uh, but I still had more. I kept talking to Nick Turan about what they were doing in software, and it turns out he needed someone with experience where I had experience, and so I applied, and I applied myself to the interview process, and now I'm applying myself to to deliver at this job, and so I am a software developer at TerraPower Digital Engineering, and that's what I can talk to you about today. Uh, I'm not a nuclear engineer. I don't have authority on many of the other subjects that I have in slides. I got all these slides approved for your benefit, but I can't really talk to any questions you might have, unless it's about software. So uh, I also have some opinions about advocacy. I have opinions about how TerraPower Digital Engineering relates to the rest of the software industry. This is only that opinion. It relates directly from the, the knowledge I have as a software developer and not, you know, in general statements about other labor standards, other engineering standards. Uh, I did clear a whole lot of slides. You see 54 slides there. I'm not going to get to all of these. I think I'm just going to skip the Natrium stuff because you all know that. And, uh, and, and I really can't answer many questions about it other than, you, you see, I talked to Mark Werner. Go check that out on Your Environment Seattle on YouTube. All your questions that can be answered will be answered there, because I tried. <laughs> um, so, but, but why did I leave my dream job in the video games industry? Well, they laid off a couple hundred thousand people. I, I had quit for unrelated reasons, but I did find myself in a very, very tight labor market where it would be a challenge to find new employment. And I was just lucky to be at that inflection point in my career to join TerraPower. Uh, I found that 
for software, TerraPower has terrific PTO. You know, when you join a new software startup, you're lucky if you get two weeks of paid time off. Uh, sometimes we will get a few days extra around Christmas, but TerraPower has got a four week standard vacation, you know, 20 days standard PTO time, uh, as well as some floating holidays there. Uh, and it is great. It's uh, fair pay, and coming from some of the larger video game companies, that's a compliment. It's it's not below below median or anything like that. You know, there are of course digital trading firms and crazy crazy e-commerce retailer for the high high power people, but uh, we're we're not crazy about spending too much money. So they do they do the wage analysis, they do fair pay analysis, and I think we're paid fairly well. Uh, we're short. We have short-term bonus, which is your normal Christmas bonus, but in lieu of equity, it, it, they have a compensation program that's long-term, that's averaged around three years, that is focused on the performance of the company in general. So you're not going to get a bunch of equity in this company that might not IPO for two decades. I, not, sorry, I have no idea where the financials are with that. I have no idea if they will IPO. I can't really make a forward-leading statement. I probably shouldn't, but this is they recognize that it's not a normal software startup. And so we're gonna give you a long-term benefit package that focuses on company performance, not tied to a stock. There's a great option for anyone who has spent a long time in tech and has a lot of cash saved up. It's called the Mega Backdoor Roth. I think technically they like to call it a after-tax contribution in-program transfer, but everyone knows that it's the Mega Backdoor Roth. No one understands the other term, and anyone who works at Amazon who understands that they have that benefit will recognize Mega Backdoor Roth. Uh, there's also a continuing education benefit. I think the last company I worked for that had that was Blizzard. Uh, so I'm glad to basically get a combination of some of the best benefits I've ever had. And of course, whereas in video games, I went from my childhood dream to eventually making in-app purchases and customer engagement strategies to ask them for more and more money <laughs> kind of killed my dream. This time my dream won't die unless the planet also dies because we are making something that is going to save the planet. And I thank you all for contributing to that mission. You're here, you're, you're in this same mission with me. When I joined TerraPower, uh, I knew that there was going to be some expected operational Practices, of course, security is very important in entertainment. You can't be too careful when it comes to millions of players wanting to discover your secrets, and so you have to be confidential with your information as well. I saw more than one coworker fired from Blizzard for accidentally breaching confidentiality at a lunch or on a message board, and I expect to face the same challenges here. So believe it, I, I did my very best to get all of these slides cleared, multiple reviews, a lot to go through. <laughs> and I expected there would be some safety trainings. I did not expect that I would have to be fully trained on every variant of fire extinguisher every year, but that's what a nuclear company is like. So I appreciate it. Safety first. Of course, we're not all software people, uh, but I, I really have learned a lot about nuclear, working with other disciplines, working with project managers, uh, mechanical engineers, chemical engineers, uh, process and quality people in the nuclear industry is great. Uh, I've also been able to bring a, two decades of experience in the software industry and incorporate some of these practices into the platform that I'm building. And of course, no matter how much you know about nuclear, you can always learn more. I was really fascinated to finally join a social experience after work at one TerraPower, um, you know, celebration of our construction permit. We had a little get together for that. And everyone has their own specialty. No one knows everything, and that's a strength in gathering so many people who know so much. So again, thanks for joining a wonderful conference, conference like Thorium Energy Alliance conference. And it is a government contract. So not at all like entertainment. Uh, it's kind of similar to contracting. You gotta be a little careful with your time, make sure you don't lose track of what you're doing. Got to mark down when you go on break, of course. And we can't hide anything fun in the software. There's no Murlocs here and there creeping out from under the bushes. It's, 
It's very serious stuff. It is audited. We're cost aware. You know, we keep bringing in government dollars and we want to spend that money wisely. Of course, because it's government work uh, for, for the software side, for full-time employees, there's no expected overtime, which is a welcome reprieve from entertainment. Uh, but of course, uh, HR reminded me to say, yes, we do have uh, hourly, hourly workers and we have deadlines and we're happy to pay them overtime uh, when it's allocated. Final thing, this was a surprise, is I, I actually can't get paid for lobbying. <laughs> I can't get paid, oh, I can, I can maybe get professional development for this speech, I am talking about TerraPower, but for lobbying to government officials, we have a special code for that, it's called unallowable. It is something that is not allowed to be put into a government contract reimbursement. So there's no malarkey. Uh, just a sampling of some TerraPower careers, because we're not just hiring uh, software developers, we are hiring everyone. We have a construction permit filed and we need all of your help. All of you watching on YouTube right now, go check out terrapower.com careers. You can find these and many others. I'm not gonna read it. I literally just found clip art and tried to match job descriptions with the clip art, with the, um, the clip art from the suggested template. <laughs> now digital engineering, uh, this is where we are trying to do our best to modernize the permitting and construction and quality project. Uh, if you saw me speak in Albuquerque, I talked about how my dad was writing software in COBOL to manage contracts. Uh, I think that I've gone a little bit of an upgrade from that process, hopefully a little bit user friendly, at least, uh, more user friendly at least. Um, and so here are the products. Army is our open source reactor modeling um, system. Atom is for information management, and we also have a great deal of computational environments to support, and we're going to definitely be working on digital twin stuff. Everyone's talking about digital twins, but Nick likes to point out that's been done a million times. It's not that surprising how software and a reactor system are going to integrate. Atom is the project I work on, and here is the tech stack. Nick was very eager to get this approved because, of course, we are looking for talented folks who work in Django, especially Django REST framework, and all of these constituent libraries. Front end, we've got Vue 3, which is sort of um, a, a new front end framework that's not too dissimilar from React. And for the component models that make that visually easier to work with and a little visually more appearing, that's Quasar. The last one on the list there, Cypress, that is an integration testing framework, uh, a little bit like WebDriver. You might have heard the term WebDriver, it boots up Chrome or um, another web browser technology and automatically goes through the process of executing the software. Like many of you here, I'm also an advocate and I have learned something about moving into the industry you're no longer sort of this magical, mysterious creature is a person who loves nuclear but doesn't work in nuclear because eventually we all find our way into a job like this. And so you're not quite as novel. Uh, DOE, in fact, invited me to speak at a, uh, a CEM side event, specifically me because I was not in the industry and they wanted that perspective. I guess I won't get that again. Uh, of course, there are challenges that when I had to, for example, give this talk, we had a lot of review, uh, and there are, of course, you, there are restrictions. You, you can't professionally embarrass your employer. You can't bad talk your investors. Uh, and so there's just a few restrictions on what I can say. And I think because people are terrified of all the legalese and all the review and all of the pressure to maintain your professional posture, uh, they hesitate to participate in public review, in talking to the government. And I think I have a solution to that, and that is our wonderful volunteer organizations. Generation Atomic has a great organization that you can use as a vehicle for your advocacy. They can train you. And I am advocating internally for more people to be involved through NAYGN or Generation Atomic to be advocates. 
And I think I'm seeing some support there. So the rest of this is less opinion, and I'm gonna do a lot less speculation uh, and just go through the slides. Uh, you may have heard of TerraPower Isotope. We are shipping isotopes to uh, manufacturing partners. This is straight from the FAC. And I think you've seen this slide before. Uh, targeted alpha therapy is, uh, it's really amazing stuff, and it shows the best application of, of nuclear energy, or sorry, not nuclear energy, but the, new, the use of nuclear materials that we could possibly see. Um, the, these slides um, were, were cleared. I had to cut a few things out of them, but this is sort of the overview of some things that were cut. And we have a great deal of expertise in executing on these goals. I'm, I've been pretty impressed with the people that I, I met who joined TerraPower uh, before I did, who are, you know, ex-Navy folks, nuclear uh, Navy nukes who did go, get into TerraPower and are working on stuff like, like TerraPower isotopes. If you're not familiar with it, but I, you might be, this is the decay chain and the sourcing of the parent isotope for the potential treatment. And this again, this is our, our product is the, the actinium and we were going to work with pharmaceutical companies to make a constituent product as a result of that partnership with the pharmaceutical industry. Natrium, um, I'm, let's see, how good am I on time? Eight, Eight minutes, okay. Let's skip this, I wanna talk about software. So, very sorry, uh, but you all know a lot about Natrium. Uh, these slides were previously shared at the University of Wisconsin, uh, and of course I got them cleared specifically so that John and Thorium Energy Alliance could have access to them. So this one was uh, previously cleared to talk to the GAIN organization, and this is where we talk about digital engineering's uh, capabilities in general. Uh, Army, again, is our sort of our orchestration system that's been open sourced. You could go right there on GitHub, and download it. This is the system we use to uh, drive some of our reactor simulations. I'm actually not involved in the Army development. It's very, very specialized software for someone who knows a lot more about sciences than I do. So there's a bit of a slideshow. But if you're a nuclear engineer, I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> The code in the top right is Python. Might be familiar if you know NumPy. And Nick even let his own personal uh, GitHub address sneak in there. So part of the thing slash ACE for this one. All right, this is the one that I love to talk about. This is Atom. This is the software that uh, I help produce, I help maintain, and add new features to. Uh, it is the orchestration layer for information, for data about documents, about decisions, parameters, all of the details that we are going into when we approach construction of this natrium plant in Kimmerer, Wyoming. The one thing here that's out of domain for me personally is that central data store. Uh, it is a, sort of a, a qualified product that the NRC gets involved in because it deals with uh, access to that data at rest and the security of that data at rest and as well the reliability of that data at rest. And so we choose to buy rather than build that very, very precise piece of work. Everything else needs to move much, much faster. We have new features that we're asked to make all the time and uh, I think that we have some flexibility and some earned value, some demonstrated value when we execute on new features that our engineers need very, very quickly. The core of sort of the organization of data is the plant breakdown structure or master system list. And so you'll see each of these things here, and these are fictitious examples from our, our QA and developer instance. We can drill down those MSL items 
and in this case, we're showing, you're looking at requirement and, and uh, sorry, the requirements system where we have broken down the requirements pertaining to this fictitious, fictitious fuel handling system. And here we're uh, showing plant parameters and on the very left of that box at the bottom, you see the MSL breakdown again, RCC, RES, HRS, and that's the relationship of parameters to each of the systems they relate to. What you're looking at here is basically when the decision is made on any part of the system, we have ability to trace around it. Uh, there's also some other additional features here, but I'm running out of time. We, we do gate access to files, and so we have a way of adding people to the system and gating access to these files that are in secure storage. And open items is one of the big, biggest used features right now. It's how we track um, things that prevent a, a document from being able to go to final use, or sorry, not final use, but uh, to implementation. Uh, here's an example of workflows. That's the Django um, finite state machine uh, dependency that I talked about earlier, and so we use that to literally express procedure as code. It's a very, very important part of the system. So, in summary, please get a job in nuclear. It is well worth your time. It will, it will help save the planet. It will help make plentiful energy a reality for everyone. Uh, in terrapower.com, the website, you'll find a careers section, uh, and you can apply yourself to any of these positions. So, thank you. All right, man. There may be one or two questions, but only about software, so it might be the wrong crowd. Go ahead. Let's see if it works. So my startup is actually focused on proving actions that machines take, and we use a blockchain. So I wanted to ask, what is your threat model? Kind of in layman terms, how paranoid are you guys? Is it like nation state? Is it insider job? Is it backdoors and cryptographic curves? Like how paranoid are you guys in the software domains for reactors? Our, our threat mo model is what is the best practice of the industry? Which so, is probably not very good, I'd imagine. Well, okay, best practice. <laughs> So more like all of the above. Okay. Yeah. No, no offense on that, by the all way. All right. <laughs> uh, all right. Very good. Does Does Jeff Lekowski still work? Oh, Jeff Lekowski. <laughs> I don't remember. Very good. All right. All right. One more. All right. Sorry. How much of your work do you do uh, inside of cloud resources versus your internal hardware? Well, we we of course need to be very careful about. Um, nation state actors and and you know non disclosures so we are not qualified to put any data uh, on like google drive is blocked uh, for example uh, i know that as a software developer in my personal experience there is a system called govcloud uh, microsoft amazon among others have qualified environments to deal with export restricted uh, information uh, and that's what I'd recommend if you're looking to implement something like that. I bet you're allowed to use Azure. <laughs> All right. Very good. Thank you. All right. So thank you, Carl. Thank you very much. We're, uh, we're getting to the second to the last uh, presentation. Oh, shit. That's the same one. Um, uh, the, uh, oh golly, uh, it's hard to walk and chew gum at the same time here. Uh, 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 uh okay. So the last pro level vendor tech talk is, uh, my favorite, uh, nuclear company at the moment and for a long time, uh, because, uh, one simple thing. Most of all, they build stuff, and you know that's the most to me. You know, I'm a very, I'm like a dog with a bone when it comes to that. I think you know, you you can't, you know, you can't make stuff unless you make stuff. And so Thomas Jam Peterson, uh, and and right before I should uh, thank, I should take this opportunity to thank. We have a lot of people from around. We got England, Canada, 
Australia, that's lunacy, uh, but uh, uh, Copenhagen, uh, we, we have about uh, 15 countries uh, represented here. So it's, you know, for small but mighty, uh, and so take this info back home and uh, pollute a lot of people's minds. And, uh, you know, it's like, the, it's like the Borg, we will take you in and uh, put you part of the collective. <laughs> so anyways, to, back to uh, Copenhagen Atomics, uh, I uh, welcome Thomas Jam Peterson to the stage to tell us where they are at. Thomas, thank you again so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a pleasure. I've been in many of these conferences. Uh, first one uh, I think I, I joined was uh, in 2015, yeah, that when I was a speaker. Um, but Gordon recorded me first time in 2013, <laughs> so that's a long time ago now. Uh, no, I'll actually hold on to this one. So. This is a Thorium Energy Alliance conference. So it has Thorium in the name, and you would think that we would be talking about Thorium all the time. But think about all the talks that have been here. It's mostly about uranium, right? That suck. <laughs> we, we should be talking about Thorium because Thorium can do something unique and special that uranium cannot do. And I've been pissed off by so many conferences that call it like advanced reactors or whatever when it's not, it's like light water reactors. Uh, and, uh, and I really think we should try to have a conference, for example this one, where we sort of look into the future and not into the past. And so part of my talk today is about um, why I think Thorium is special. And I know many of you know this already, but, but I hope some of my slides will give you courage to talk differently to your neighbors and uh, friends and colleagues. So I think many of us got excited about a, an image like this, where the ball, the size of the golf ball, can supply you with all the energy you need for your entire life. Not just electricity, but everything. Transportation, all the products you need, all, your share of all the public, like roads and houses and hospitals, everything. It's amazing that you can get all that energy out of this little ball. Uh, and it costs only less than $100, so if you live for 100 years, it's $1 per year. That is amazing. And that's why I think most of the people in this room are here. But the problem is we don't have the machine that can take the energy out of that ball. Uh, and that's what we're trying to build, and I know a few others who are trying the same. Um, and hopefully, within a few years, it will happen. And I think we should all celebrate that like crazy. Uh, we've been at this for a, quite a while now. So, uh, so thorium, not only does it have unique properties in terms of being able to produce a huge amount of energy, but there's also lots of thorium. And a, a, a lot of times when you talk to uranium uh, people, they say, ah, oh, there's a three or four times more thorium than there is uranium which is technically true, but all the uranium reactors I know, they run on uranium-235, and you know that little sliver, that orange little sliver there? That's uranium-235, it's very rare, and you can't really use it, you have to enrich it and everything. Uh, so, in reality, there's a thousand times more thorium than there is uranium available to us. I mean, you can always debate about uranium and seawater and all that, but Thorium is just a lot easier to get to. One thing that proves that is that we already do mining for other materials, and we get thorium out of the ground when we do mining for rare earth and gold and copper and shit. And alone, that thorium alone that we already get out of the ground today would be enough to power the entire electricity of the whole planet. We don't need to open one additional mine so that is also amazing, and you can't say that about uranium. I mean, now, now we, we, they said at COP28 we need three times more uranium, and uh, everybody's scratching their head, where's that gonna come from, and what about enrichment facilities, and uh, uh, what is it called, like fuel production and everything. And of course, the uranium price already, already went up just because they start talking about it. Um, so um, a lot of times when you talk to sort of the people from the general public, they will tell you that, Nuclear, ah, it's too expensive, it's, uh, it takes too long to build, it has this uh, awful waste and it's dangerous. Um, and uh, I hope some of my slides today can sort of help you 
uh, tell them what you think. <laughs> Uh, I, I agree that uh, classical nuclear is too expensive and too slow. No doubt about it. It sucks. But I think we should try to sort of rethink what can we do about that? How can we solve that problem that it's too slow and too expensive? I offer some uh, ideas today, and I hope we can have more discussions over a beer later. Um, then, then people say it's dangerous. That's definitely a hoax. I mean, nuclear is not dangerous. I'll, I'll get back to that in some of my slides later. And then they say, oh, there's all this awful waste. Ah, uh, yeah, it is not the best waste, I agree, but maybe we can do something about it. I mean, let's try to look at it in a positive light. Um, then there's these, uh, these guys that says, oh, there's these new reactors, uh, small modular reactors, advanced modular reactors, generation four. There's even people talking about generation five now. Molten salt reactors, high temperature reactors, all this crap. It doesn't change anything. It's still the, the old stuff that we've had for, I don't know, seven decades. So please, when you talk to your neighbor or your colleague about coping atomics, please don't call us a small modular reactor or an advanced reactor or generation four or five or whatever. We are something completely different from all these other reactor designs. Um, there's a conference now in uh, Houston in a couple of days, and, and they call it the Advanced Reactor Summit. And if you look at all the reactor designs that are presenting there, uh, most of them are disadvanced reactors. Uh, I don't know. Um, I, I think we need to raise our standards in the nuclear industry. I, like you, Carl, I, I also come from the software industry originally. And in the software industry, we have to make progress every year, not every 100 years. Um, OK, so, um, so I, I'll, I'll try to sort of give you some ideas of how you can talk about the difference between uranium and thorium. So here is a list of, of properties, you could say, for solid fuel reactors. It's sort of, I want you to go home. Don't trust me. Go home and look this up for yourself. Um, this is sort of the average numbers for a solid fuel reactor. You know, they, those designs, they last for 60 years maybe with extensions. Uh, you can look up the uranium price on the web. Right now it's at 4,500 for 5% rich uranium. Uh, in those type of reactors, you can get one to two gigawatt hours out of every kilogram of fuel. Um, some reactor designs are a little bit better than others, but that's sort of the average for, for solid fuel reactors. And you know that most of them take between four and 15 years to build. I mean, maybe so one is a little bit faster and definitely some are a little bit slower, but that's sort of the average. And the price of electricity from solid fuel reactors are between 60 and 120. Uh, dollars per megawatt hour electric. Um, so how does that compare to thorium, do you think? Do you think thorium is the same, sort of roughly the same ballgame? A uh, few people are shaking their head. Most of you are <laughs> just holding <laughs> your breath. So, so I, I, I had to compare it to Copenhagen Atomics. And again, some of these numbers you cannot look up. Um, but let's talk about it. So our design is also sort of 50 year lifetime, plus maybe extensions. The price for thorium is $50 per kilogram. Uh, we've all already ordered uh, tons of thorium, so I know this price because that's what we paid for it. Uh, of course, just like uranium, the price might go up or down, but since there's so much thorium in the world, I think it's more likely to go down than to go up in the future. Um, if one kilogram of thorium, you can get 22 gigawatt hours of energy out of that, thermal energy. And then um, how fast can we build this? Well, I've, I've also been at some of the previous um, conferences, and the goal for Copenhagen Atomics is to build one reactor every day. But of course, we also need to deploy them, and deployment is a little bit more difficult. Uh, so I would expect that in the beginning, for a one gigawatt power plant, we will, it would take 18 months to deploy that. And later on, when we sort of get things up to speed, we, can, we should be able to deploy in six months a one gigawatt power plant, because it's not built on site. It's truly modular. It arrives on trucks. Um, and then the price of uh, energy for, for these type of reactors is between $20 and $40 per megawatt hour. So again, completely different uh, ballgame. And uh, I've, I've made sort of a column with the differences so you don't have to do the calculation in your head. You can see on most of these things, we are an order of magnitude better than solid fuel reactors. And um, 
So I don't think we should compare ourselves to all the old reactors. I think it's great that there's a history and there people did things before we came. Uh, so I like the old, old type of reactors and visiting them and stuff. But, but when people compare it and say that it's the same, I'm sort of not really with you. Um, I believe that our reactor is like a jet airplane and the old reactors is like a horse carriage. Uh, it, it's, I mean, it's not the same thing. Um, we also made this uh, Weinberg number. Some guys in our company came up with this. So we are all really, really big fans of Alan Weinberg. So in his honor, we chose to make this the Weinberg number. And it, it's a way to multiply or, or calculate how good is one reactor design compared to some other reactor designs. Um, and of course, um, uh, it, it, it's this... Um, uh, calculation there at the bottom, you multiply burn up by deployment speed and divide by fuel price and fuel inventory. The reason why it's, it's uh, or fissile inventory, the reason for that is uh, every reactor can breed some fuel. For example, light water reactors with uh, uranium-238, they breed plutonium. And if you have a thorium reactor, you, bre you breed uranium-233. And of course, uh, that is really, really important for your uh, economics of the reactor. And especially when you get close to a breeding reactor, a true breeding reactor that makes more fuel than it consumes, then your, your fissile inventory is one of the most important things. Um, so of course, that's part of the uh, calculation. And, and I made some examples here where I compare just a sort of a standard light water reactor. It has a Weinberg number of 0 0.14, so not very big. Y you will find, I, I really encourage you to go home and look at a lot of different reactor designs. Most solid fuel reactors, they will have a Weinberg number bit below one. It might be if, like some really good designs that have a Weinberg number a little bit above one, so below five. Uh, if you compare that to a Koming Atomics, uh, Breeder, thorium breeder reactor design, it has a Weinberg number of 30,000. And of course, you can adjust some of these things a little bit, maybe the price of thorium or the amount of inventory or something. But you still, I mean, whatever you do, you still get to a number 20,000, 25,000. So to say that it's sort of the same and we should compare them and people should present next to each other at conferences, it's lunatic. I mean, well, I'm sure that when you go to like a jet a airplane conference, you don't see people trying to convince you to buy horse carriages there. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, so we want to mass manufacture these reactors and we planned this through the whole like development of our reactor, uh, the, the, the way we planned the whole company. We want to make one reactor every day. Uh, we, you know that car factories, they can easily make a thousand cars every day. Uh, and sim I mean, our reactors have less components than a modern car. So of course we can easily assemble one reactor every day. I mean, we don't start in the morning and finish in the evening. We have sort of an assembly line and, and the reactors move down the assembly line and then they come out at the end. Uh, one comes out every day. The, pro the problem is not so much to mass manufacture these. The problem is to deploy one reactor every day. That's a big... That's a difficult challenge to, to get approvals to deploy one reactor every day. Um, and we're working on that. I, I'd love to spend some more time on that, but I've limited time, so I've decided to do that some other year. Um, but there's one more thing I want to point to, is um, you guys have done uh, physical labor where you, you dig a hole in the ground or, or move some things and you're sweating and you're working really hard. And then you know that you, you are not as strong as a horse, so it's, you're not doing one horsepower. Uh, actually, on average, uh, like an adult man that works really hard, he can do 150 watts of work with our muscles. Um, and you can't, work, I mean, you, you can't work 24 hours. You, you have to sleep and eat and stuff as well. So, um, so if, you, if you try to calculate this type of reactor, th this reactor can produce... Uh, 42 megawatts of electric energy 24-7. You know, so if you try to calculate how many people it would take to do the same amount of work, it's actually amazing. It's, it's more than a million people to do the same work. Of course, we, we don't do that. We, we buy electrical motors and have them do pumping or whatever. And robots are coming. That's what they say, at least. And, and those robots will also need electrical energy to work. But, but think about it. 
you know, I, I think this could change the future of how we live and play on this, on this planet, because if we make one of these reactors every day, some country, let's say some island state somewhere, they call Copenhagen and Tommy and say, we want to buy 300 of your reactors. We say, yeah, okay, let's uh, make uh, an agreement, and then, we, and then we deliver 300 reactors to them. That's the same as having 300 million workers added to your country. That's more than there is workers in the entire United States. So I think this, this idea of deployment can really change a lot of countries. Um, and um, let's see what, it, what will happen. All right, I, I announced that I would, I would talk more about danger and nuclear energy. Um, I heard at least the several talks today where they say, ooh, this is a s safer nuclear. And I, I, I call bullshit on that. Um, so let's talk about the numbers the way I see the numbers. I mean, you don't have to agree, uh, but I think at least we can have a little, a little bit of fun talking about the, the numbers in a different view. So I'm sure all of you have seen this before. Coal-fired power plants are the most dangerous type of uh, power plants we have. They kill the most people. Uh, I think many of us believe that roughly one million people die every year from coal-fired power plants. It's not only from air pollution, it's also from mining and from uh, shipping all that coal and everything. Um, so one million people, right? And coal-fired power plant has been going on for many decades. So um, if, you, if you sort of go all the way back to the Second World War and calculate how many people died, it's probably more people than died in, in the Second World War from coal-fired power plants. So, um, I don't know if you, if you think it's dangerous. So, if you have something that can slow down the growth of coal-fired power plants, how can that be dangerous? And, and nuclear energy, if we look at nuclear energy, it's not, it's not very dangerous, it's like a, a, a thousand times less dangerous than coal-fired power plants. And, um, and if you look at those numbers for nuclear energy, uh, um, then uh, they also include the death from mining. And you know that it's really, really difficult to get a reactor approved because the reactor have to be super duper standard, uh, like really safe. But you know how much time we spend on making it safe to mine uranium? <sighs> Not so much. What about uh, when there is an accident? I mean, if, if you build thousands of th something, eventually there is going to be an accident, right? We, we can't really make zero accidents. So when there is an accident, and we've had a few accidents, Chernobyl and Fukushima, how many people actually die? I don't know, a few people. A few people in, in Fukushima, one guy. But, but, then, but then when an accident happens, then there are some humans that come in and say, oh, we should do something like, for example, in, in Fukushima, they wanted to have evacuation. More people died from that evacuation than from the reactor itself. So it's not the reactor that is dangerous, it's the people that are dangerous. The, the people that make wrong decisions. In, in Chernobyl, it was even worse. Uh, you know, when there's an accident and there's iodine, you're supposed to get iodine, iodine tablets. And they had the iodine tablets. But there was a guy who decided that they shouldn't give the iodine tablets to the people because it might scare them. And that's the, that's the thing that killed the most people in Chernobyl. It's a stupid mistake by one guy. Is there any really big regulations around that to avoid that stupid people make stupid mistakes? No, not at all. So the, the whole like trying to make nuclear more safe, it's a hoax. And it's, it's just trying, it, it's a hoax by, uh, I don't know, anti-nuclear people to try to hold nuclear uh, energy back. And I think we should just stop this. And, and honestly, when I hear some of you saying that new nuclear or molten salt reactors or small modular reactors is more safe, I think you're doing a disservice to the industry because what you're really saying is, I want to slow down nuclear and I want to make it more expensive. That's what you're saying. And that's not what we need. And, um, and then also, um, well, I should go to the next slide for that. So there's also this um, misunderstanding of radioactivity. We hear this again and again, especially if some of us are interviewed by the media. They, they say, oh, but is your reactor radioactive? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it is. Oh, then it must be dangerous. Okay, uh, 
uh, like, <laughs> what are you talking about? Um, of course, most of you know electricity, and you, know, you, you probably know that this a one and a half volt battery is not dangerous. And I don't know if you know where you learned that, but I, I assume that all of you know that one and a half volt batteries are not dangerous. I also assume that all of you know that high voltage power lines like 1,000 volt or 10,000 volt is dangerous. I mean, if you touch 1,000 volt, you might die. You're not guaranteed to die, but you might die. And it's a little bit similar if there's the kilometers per hour. If you drive 1,000 kilometers an hour in some crazy car, you might die. It's dangerous. But, um, but if you drive 100 kilometers an hour, I'm sure many of you have done that, even within the last week. And I don't think you feel it's super dangerous, but I also think you know that it's not risk-free. And of course, it's the same with, with radiation. I mean, there's levels of radiation that are super dangerous, and there's also radiations, uh, levels of radiation that is not dangerous. And um, so, of course, I should say that uh, there is no physics that, that makes a connection between voltage and kilometers per hour and radiation. I mean, I made this comparison, but the way I made that comparison is, at what level do people die? And, and when you look at radioactivity, a one sievert might kill you. It's not super likely, but you might die from one sievert. If you get 10 sieverts, ah, it's not good, right? It's like 10,000 kilovolts or whatever. It, it's not a good idea. Um, but if you get 20 millisieverts, which is the limit for radiation workers, nobody has ever died for that, from that. We don't know any evidence that anybody has ever died from that. So that's the same as a one, one and a half volt battery. And, you know, I, I, I've never seen anybody spend millions of dollars on making one and a half volt battery safe. But I've seen people spend millions of dollars on trying to make 20 millisieverts safer. And every time you guys talk about Alara or LNT or whatever, what you're really talking about is how can we kill more people from coal-fired power plants. Every time there's a meeting about a LARP or LNT or whatever, you know, that delays and makes nuclear energy more expensive. So it, it's, a, it's, again, it's a disservice to the people of this world to try to make nuclear even safer. Um, I mean, there's, there's actually people who live in areas of the world where there's 100 millisieverts, you get 100 millisieverts per year in your house, so they live in that house for their whole life, and there is no statistical evidence that they get more cancer than the rest of us. So 100 millisieverts is a little bit like driving 100 kilometers an hour. I mean, we know that you know, every now and then there might be a problem, but most of the time it's not dangerous. So uh, yeah, I hope you can use that scale for something. Then I want to talk a little bit about the sort of the the development plan of Copenhagen's Atomics. Uh, we've, we've divided our development into these six milestones. Uh, we started 10 years ago, and the most time we've spent on developing the technology for the first 10 years, um, we have developed unique pumps for molten-salt reactors. Uh, we have developed a unique uh, molten-salt reactor core. It's called the onion core. It has unparalleled efficiency compared to any other reactor we've ever seen. So that's one of the things we developed. I'll talk about it a little bit later. Uh, we've also developed a method to purify salt, because if you purify the salt and get rid of moisture and oxygen and everything, you get less corrosion. And some people say, oh, corrosion is a big problem for molten salt reactors. I think we've solved that. We don't bother to run with uh, expensive materials. We can use stainless steel 316 and run that for many years, no problems with corrosion. Um, so we've spent a lot of time on doing basic uh, development of technology for, for molten salt reactors. And uh, we're also sharing that with the industry. Uh, we're selling some of the technology to other players in the industry. Um, all right, and then um, the second milestone there is we're developing uh, non-fission prototypes. So we've already built two reactors, full-scale reactors, the same size as our commercial reactor, and we are running those with 
non-radioactive materials, so basically Fleenac salt, uh, in our workshop in Copenhagen. Uh, so we heat it up with electricity and we pump the salt around and we do all kinds of tests with thermal expansion and thermal cycling and uh, heat exchangers and all these things we need to test before we can go to, to a real reactor. And the first real reactor is for our our development um, plan is a one megawatt test reactor that we plan to run in 2026. So very similar to ACU, what ACU is doing. But the difference is that our reactor has the onion core and it's using thorium as a blanket. So it, it will be the first thorium molten salt reactor in the world, I think. Let's see. Um, so uh, that, that, that first test reactor, we're going to run it for one month and we're going to run it at one megawatt. So it's basically just a test, and the reason why we run it for a short amount of time and, sh and small power is then we can transport the things around on the roads afterwards. Uh, we, we would really like to be able to move it around, uh, especially the fuel. Um, so that's the reason for that. But, as soon, but like I said, it's, it's a full-scale reactor. It's the same reactor design as the commercial reactor. We've just not run it at full power. So as soon as we have that up and running, we will, we will move towards the first commercial reactors. Uh, and once we have proven that the commercial reactors are working and they're uh, providing energy and selling energy and they can run for a number of years, uh, then we will start the mass manufacturing sort of uh, in the early 2030s. Um, and I think we will go just directly to making one reactor every day. And of course, right now we're trying to get our heads around how do we actually deploy all those reactors. And that's a whole talk by itself. So you will have to wait till maybe next year to hear about that. Um, and then finally, the, the really, really, really big goal is, is milestone number six, where we want to make a thorium breeder reactor in thermal spectrum. Uh, that's going to that's gonna be cool when we do that. Um, that's uh, 2035. Um, and then uh, I'm, I'm really happy to say that there's a number of people in here who have invested in Coming Atomics. I want to thank you for that, for, for your support. Uh, we have a couple of hundred, uh, roughly 500 small private investors who have invested in our company and of course some, some bigger, more corporate investors. Um, uh, we have a policy that we will continue to allow small private investors to invest in our company. Um, so you, you, those of you who haven't invested yet, you still have a chance. Um, you, I, I've tried to make this a uh, funny plot where on the x-axis at the bottom we have the different milestones that we are moving through uh, into the future and then up the y-axis you have the return on investment so if you invest today it starts at 1x and then uh, you can get a return on investment when you invest in a startup company there's not a guarantee that you will get your money back there is a chance or a risk that you might lose your money but if everything goes well and we get these molten salt reactors, thorium molten salt reactors online, uh, then I think you, we can get you a really nice return on investment, maybe something like a 10x in 10 years. Oh, sorry, 100x in 10 years. Um, okay, a little bit about uh, our facility in Copenhagen. Uh, last year we moved into this new facility. It's uh, 11,000 square feet, or oh, sorry, square meters. I don't know what that is in square feet actually, but uh, uh, 100, okay. 100,000 100, uh, square feet, uh, and we have 75 employees, and it's a really big facility where we, we can build and test many reactors. Uh, we plan to build the first 10 commercial reactors there. So if you think about it, is there any other company in the world that has a facility where they can build 10 reactors, 10 commercial reactors? I don't think so. Um, and, uh, and then uh, once we've proven the first 10 commercial reactors, we're going to build an assembly line production. It's a little bit like a gigafactory. And I actually yesterday or a couple of days ago, I went to the gigafactory in Austin. Uh, so it's going to be something like that. Uh, and I don't think we will place that in Denmark because Denmark is not very good at um, volume production of things like that. Denmark is really good at R&D. Um, we've shown that again and again for several hundred years. Uh, but, um, but we're looking for another country where we can put uh, the mass manufacturing of reactors, at least the, fir the first gigafactory. Uh, a little bit about our reactor design. Um, so it's, um, I talked about in the beginning that we have this ball out of thorium and we want to make a machine that can convert it into energy very, very efficiently. Uh, and this is sort of a cartoon drawing of what it would look like. Um, 
if you um, if you look inside in the middle there, we have the schematics of an onion core, sort of a cut through in the section view. And then uh, right next, next to that, there's an insulation wall. Uh, and that's because inside the the 40-foot shipping container, there's a, a cold region and a hot region. The cold region is sort of blue and it's uh, room temperature. The hot region is a little bit uh, orange and it's uh, usually 600 degrees. And then you have a number of heat exchangers that takes the heat and uh, get the uh, the heat um, that is produced from the hot salt out to the customer and the the heavy water we use as a moderator needs to be cooled all the time uh, roughly five percent of the energy that is uh, produced by the reactor goes into heat in the water and we need to take that out so there's a number of heat exchangers sending the water out for cooling um, and then uh, you could see at the bottom there's a number of tanks. So when we shut down the reactor, all of the liquid up in these uh, heat exchangers and the reactor core will drain into the tanks at the bottom. And uh, basically we do that just by stopping the pumps. As soon as we stop the pumps, everything will drain down into the tanks. And then when we start the pumps again, it will start running. So basically to, to shut down this reactor, you just cut the power to the box, then it will stop. So it's a very simple mechanism. Um, and you, you also see the thick line around that, sort of the thick gray line around it. That is the third barrier. So we need three barriers between the radioactive salt and people outside. And the third barrier is sort of a very, very thick wall of steel. So half a meter thick steel wall to protect the reactor from what's coming from outside. But also if something happened inside the reactor, it will protect uh, people outside. Uh, and uh, half a meter the thick wall of steel is a uh, very doable um, a little bit about the onion core so it's it's roughly 2.3 meters in diameter and it's mostly full of water it's of course heavy water heavy water is a, a really really good moderator uh, and then you have a thorn blanket and you see how the blanket is constructed so that it it encapsulate the whole reactor core and that's really important um, because this way we optimize the uh, or minimize the leakage neutrons. Uh, most reactors, especially fast reactors, they have neutrons flying out of the core. Like some fast reactor designs have half of the neutrons flying out of the core. And you know, neutron economy is really, really important if you want to have a great f fuel economy in a nuclear reactor. So how can it be great if half the neutrons are just lost out? Uh, with this kind of thorium blanket, we can get uh, neutron leakage down to 2%. No reactor has ever uh, been this efficient. Um, and, uh, and of course, in the blanket, we breed uranium-233 uh, from thorium. Uh, some people say, oh, you extract protactinium. No, we don't extract protactinium. We extract all the different uranium species in the blanket, and then we put them into the fuel salt. Uh, and the fuel salt, of course, being the orange uh, colored channel in the middle, that is where the heat is produced. Um, and of course, the heavy water is there to moderate or slow down the neutrons. Uh, so how can you have uh, 600 degrees hot salt right next to cold water? Well, you need a little bit of insulation. We have roughly one inch of insulation between them, and that's enough because the majority of the heat in the water doesn't come from uh, heat radiating from the hot channels to the cold channels. The vast majority, more than 90% of the heat in the water comes from slowing down the neutrons. So, I mean, we need, we need to cool the water anyway. So, so we only need a little bit of insulation, like w roughly one inch, um, to make sure that the water doesn't boil. And of course, we have to cool the water all the time. So our reactor, if you get, look at a one gigawatt uh, power plant, it would look something like this with a, an array of reactors in these cocoons. Uh, in this case, we would need 25 reactors for a one gigawatt plant and then some additional uh, empty cocoons so that we can swap, swap things around. And the whole idea with this power plant is that no humans go inside this, this building for 50 years. It's running for 50 years. Of course, you, you can go in there if you want to, but uh, we don't want to have a humans mess up things. So everything in there is remote controlled, like remote controlled cranes, remote controlled forklifts, and, and, uh, and then somebody from the, uh, you could say, oper operation room uh, controls what's going on in there. Um, that building produces heat, and then, uh, and then we transfer the heat through some pipes over to some buffer tanks, and then you can see there's a line of steam gener generators. So if you want to make steam, you, 
you you can run a steam um, turbine or or use the steam for some uh, industrial process. Uh, so I said in the beginning, how can, we, how can we construct a machine that can convert thorium into energy? And I think we are closer than ever to make that happen. This is one of our test reactors that are now running in Copenhagen. When I say running, it's again, it's heated by electricity and it's pumping the salt around. It's not uh, fission uh, going on or chain reaction going on yet, but, uh, but we're getting close to that point. Um, and uh, here's a picture from inside where you see the the onion core and some of the pipes and the heat exchangers and the heaters and other things, uh, pumps. Um, so that was a lot of information and I don't expect you to remember all of it. Uh, of course it will be available on video so you can always watch this video or other videos on our YouTube channel. Uh, we try to come out with videos sort of every month or something so there's a little bit uh, new things. But, but I, I hope that you can at least remember these three things when you talk to your neighbor or your colleague next week. Uh, so because we've developed thorium energy to a new level, we can produce energy at a lower price than any other energy technology, including fusion or wind and solar or oil and gas. So we are not afraid of competition. We can beat anyone on price. Uh, we also know that nuclear energy, uh, for the longest time it has been financed and operated by governments, at least financed for the most part, uh, or secured by governments. But we think this is going to change. We, we think that in the future, uh, the nuclear industry should become a commercial industry. Uh, we don't want uh, taxpayer money to run our reactors. Uh, Copenhagen Atomics will finance, build, own, and operate the reactors at a customer site. And we believe most of our customers will be customers that make commodities, such as ammonia, aluminum, you know, other things, hydrogen. Um, and. Uh, and then we will operate our plant at their facility, but we will finance it, the capex up front, the capital cost of building it, and we will run it, and then we sell the heat to the customer on a long-term contract. And then the final thing I want to note is that the Copenhagen Atomics React is also uh, capable of running on spent nuclear fuel. Um, Unfortunately, it, uh, it's a little bit difficult to get approvals to uh, get some nuclear f spent nuclear fuel and, and show that you can run on that. So we have postponed that a little bit into the 2030s to get that get up and running with that. Uh, we are really happy to see that Curio, for example, spoke earlier today, is working on that. Um, in our reactor design, if you take spent fuel from a classical nuclear reactor, uh, we can get 10 times more energy out of that fuel uh, than what came out of it in the, in the, in the old reactor. So it, it's a significant higher, uh, say, burn up or value coming out of spent fuel than first time it was used. And, uh, and then we will store the fission products for the first, say, 50 or uh, 100 years so that the 90% of the radioactivity from the fission products has decayed away before we give the fission product back to the uh, government or the state uh, where the energy was produced. So we, we still want to, to take the, the fission products and give it back to the country in which we're operating. And of course they have to accept that. <laughs> That's part of the deal. Um, but I, I think it's much easier for a country to get fission products that are already 100 years old and have very little radioactivity left, left in them. And fission products only needs to be stored above ground for maybe 300 years in total before you, you don't have to protect them anymore. Uh, so it's a, it's a very different way of looking at nuclear waste than how we look at it today from spent nuclear fuel. Um, yeah, so that concludes my, my talk. Uh, I hope some of you have some uh, questions. Um, you have a question. Very good. I'll just hold it for a second. So uh, any questions for our nuclear uh, technology vendor here? Yes. So, what type of uranium fluoride you are going to use? Is it U-235? Uranium fluoride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so uh, we need a Kickstarter fuel uh, to get the reactor going, and that can be uranium-235 or it can be transuranics. We would prefer to use transuranics, but like I said, it's difficult to get your hands on that right now. So the first reactors are going to start on 5% enriched uranium. So regular, regular reactor grade uranium. Um, I think you've got two isotopic separation 
things going on then? You've got a deuterium and you've got lithium for fly salt. Do you have isotopic separation suppliers? Uh, yeah, so deuterium or heavy water is available from many different suppliers. You're from Canada. Canada is one of the biggest exporters of heavy water. So we expect you to just be able to buy heavy water off of the market. You also correct that in order for our reactors to work as I described here, we need highly enriched lithium-7 and uh, it's not really available. You can get uh, somewhat enriched lithium-7 from China and Russia, uh, but that's not sustainable. So we have decided many years ago to start our own production of lithium-6 and lithium-7. And our goal is to make 5N or 99.999% pure lithium-7. Uh, it's, uh, it's up and running in small scale, but it's not uh, kilogram or ton scale yet. Uh, it will be kilogram scale before the end of this year. Ton scale, we have to wait until next year. Uh, but it, it is something we're developing, and we plan to also supply many of the other companies in the nuclear industry, including the fusion uh, companies with lithium-6 and lithium-7. Uh, and uh, we're really, really proud that we developed this technology to uh, such a high purity. But I mean, it's, it's, still, uh, it's still hard work uh, to get that up and running. I shouldn't stand so close to you while you talk about lithium-7, because the assassin <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, I had a question about your um, uh, long-term role of uh, waste burden. Uh, and I'm curious about this LIS system for measuring the, uh, I guess, the isotope composition of the stuff. Um, that's going to have some kind of, uh, I guess, optical fiber to separate out the to separate out the high radiation from the measuring instruments, um, what happens to that fiber in the high radiation environment? That's a really good question. So fibers doesn't like uh, radioactivity like gammas and neutrons, uh, so they are going to wear out, and that, and that's one of the problems we haven't really solved. Uh, we um, so we and and to be honest, I mean we we have worked on lips. We don't work very hard on that right now because we don't need it for the one megawatt test reactor and right now we're focusing all our capital on getting the one megawatt test reactor up and running uh, you also know the msre ran for five years it didn't have lips so clearly you can run reactors without lips it would be great to have it but right now we've decided to sort of uh, put less effort on that until we have the test reactor running um, but you're absolutely right there are some uh, difficult problems to solve uh, I was wondering if you could clarify the length of uh, how long the cores will run. I thought I heard 50 years. Yeah, so they, the, the power plant will run for, we, we, will get, we will ask for a license for 50 years for the whole power plant, but the reactors itself, the sort of the, the vessel, the pumps, the heat exchangers will not last for 50 years. Uh, we expect in the beginning that they will last for roughly five years, so we will replace those parts every five years. But I mean, the, the whole power plant will last for a long time. And the, the most important thing, the, the, the expensive things like heavy water, lithium-7, uh, all the fuel salt, the thorium fuel salt, and the, the, um, sorry, the, the thorium blanket salt and the fuel salt will last for 50 years. So the, all, the majority of the capex is there for 50 years. But some of the like, yeah, pumps, we can make those last 50 years in the beginning, at least. Hey Thomas, thanks very much for a great presentation. Um, I was wondering if you might be able to let us know a bit about the regulatory framework and if you figured out a country where you can do your uh, first fission test. Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, we have, like I said also last time at the Thorium Energy Launch Conference, we've talked to uh, regulators in many countries. And uh, somebody said also before, regulators need education about molten salt reactors. There's very, very few people who work for a regulator in one country or the other that have enough information about a molten salt reactor to be able to uh, go through an approval process. So first, there's an education step. I think we are still in, the, in that loop. Uh, we're talking to a number of European countries and also a few countries outside. We're currently not talking to the NRC, um, but uh, I mean, we have a policy that we want to uh, do the, the approval process for the one megawatt test reactor in several different countries uh, because there might be some roadblock blocks in one country or the other. And we don't, so, so in, in, in case that there's a roadblock, we can continue in some of the other countries. Um, 
and it's um, like I said, we're still at the sort of education step, so it's still a lot of uncertainty in relation to approvals in many different countries. Uh, and in some countries, we have almost given up. But uh, uh, it, it is really tough. And there's been people also here who asked me today, what is the biggest problem for molten salt reactors or thorium energy? It's definitely the, this regulatory approval. It, it's a big hurdle. And nobody seems to be able to give us any uh, sort of the, the how long will it take? What will it cost? And every time you talk to an investor, there's actually many, many, many investors who want to invest in this new area of technology because they realize that energy is really, really important for society. But I, I, I you know, we have hundreds of investors that we have lost because we go into a dialogue with them and sign all the papers and we give them all the details and then they want to know how long would that, that approval take for the test reactor and what is it going to cost? And sometimes we've even been able to invite some of them to meetings with the regulator. And after they've been there, they just run out of the door. They don't want to invest anymore. They just, they don't, like they say, you call me in 10 years once you have commercial reactors running, then I'll come back and invest. It, it is a, a really, really big uh, hurdle for the nuclear industry, not only for us, but for, for everyone. I mean, even for light water reactors. It, it's, it's crazy why it should be this difficult. Mm. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you very much. Let's see here. So we're got to the end of another one of these things here. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to say a few words. Uh, this is, uh, by the way, your last chance to run out of the room and have some plausible deniability that you never heard me say the things I'm about to say. <laughs> uh, I don't see people running for the exit, so that's you you're digging your own grave. Uh, <laughs> no, it's not not that bad. A uh, little bit of business here. Uh, we're going to have reception next door, a little cocktail uh, hors d'oeuvre reception. Uh, I'd like it, though, if uh, while we're transitioning there, we, I, I always like to get a group photo, uh, if nothing else, for some evidence, you know. So, <laughs> so, uh, so I'll need a volunteer, somebody uh, to take the photo, so somebody start processing that possibility. Uh, So, so that that slide up there, the most troubling topic, right? You know, it's a, you know the, the the original uh, theme for this thing was the troubling topics that others won't tackle at TAC 12. You know, some nice uh, alliteration there. But you know, what's the most to me? What's the most troubling topic? And uh, you know, what do we see there? We see Diablo Canyon, beautiful Diablo Canyon. Big mammalian fishy swimming around in its warm, beautiful waters. So uh, we know that these things are safe. There's no safer system at all anywhere on Earth than the Western world's fleet of light water reactors, water-based systems. Uh, and we're about to make a new generation of Gen 4 reactors. A new Gen 4 fleet, a thousand flowers are going to bloom when these Gen 4 reactors, when the first one finally gets across the finish line, it's going to explode. It's going to be like a mushroom explosion, thousand flowers. And they're all going to be 10 times safer. It's the safest fleet already. And as Rusty mentioned, it's going to be safer, 10x, order of magnitude safer. Oh, so safe. An abundance of safety. Safety, safety, safety. All right. A century of zero deaths in the West with the new Gen 4, we're going to have a 500-year mean time between failure because we're 10 times safer, an order of magnitude safer, safer than the LWR, the safest thing there is already, already so safe. By every measure, the Gen 4 will be more cost-effective. So... 
it'll, it, if it's a walk away safe with added defense and depth, if it's factory built and we have learning curves from working in a factory and we're building them in the same environment every day, ever increasing quality, economies of scale, if the molten salt reactor with thorium based fuel are inherently safe, if they're intrinsically safe, operator error and terrorism proof, blow up a molten salt reactor, go ahead, nobody talks about how they're terrorism proof, fail safe, immune to human error, slow to respond, the inertia of a molten salt reactor is tremendous, you don't have prompt critical, and more, 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 more safety, there's more, we'll talk about in a second here, but I mean, man, is that safe enough? Anything called a Gen 4 reactor has all those attributes. That is literally what it takes to become a Gen 4 reactor. Any reactor that's called Gen 4, lead cooled, HTGR, ultra high pressure water, molten salt reactors, they all share those attributes. That is the attribute that makes them Gen 4. The six Gen 4 reactor types is inherent safety. So I'm proposing that since safety in every form and every definition is such an explicit and underlying baseline of everything that is MSR, I propose that we finally get our priorities straight. And when we do, when we finally get our priorities straight, if we have inherently safe reactor, then I have a new paradigm for that new inherently safe reactor. Inherent safety means cost first, Speed to market second, and safety third. <laughs> there you go. I know there's some uh, guys out there fainting. They're like, oh my God. <laughs> Don't put it on film, John. Don't do it. Look, I just gave you an exhaustive list of why I can only call this a weaponized safety culture. A single mandate NRC should not be blocking the rapid deployment of these systems. Things like Part 53 need to be adopted now. It's years late. We need to keep the prioritization of speed. That was good. That's a new prioritization they have in, in Part 53 as an example. Let's keep doing more of that and do it ever quicker. We don't have time. Safety third, a single, uh, let me just say, look, it's fun, it's kind of funny. Safety third is just a way of me saying the emperor has no clothes, all right? All safety third is a way of me saying safety is so inherent in the MSR, so inherent in the design that we do not need a fabricated culture of zero tolerance and baseless LNT and Alara to scare us into safety. It is safe because it is inherently safe. The physics makes it safe. Safety is ever present from before the beginning. It's not safety first. It's not safety zero. It's not safety never. It's safety forever. It's safety in the DNA. It's safety uber alles. With MSR, we don't need to think about safety, 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 quadruple redundant systems, ridiculous EPZs. It's ever present from the first napkin set to the 50th refueling. Safety is already the alpha and the omega. It is the ether spirit of these systems. So stop making single mandate safety and the debunked LNT, the artificial straw man for delaying the rollout of these most needed technologies. Give us the dignity of taking a risk. And look, I know you all know what I'm saying. There's a huge gap between real world mandates for safety and real safety culture, real safety of things where it's like, hey, I want to get home from my job today, so I'm going to be safe. I'm going to wear steel toed shoes. You know, I'm going to uh, wear my hard hat. I'm going to you know, build a fence line and have guards with big guns walking around it. I'm going to lock out, tag out, because I don't like things blowing up in me or pumps starting with my hand on them. I'm going to have training and beautiful train record. I'm going to have chains of command, chains of custody, etc., etc. 
all of it were going to be safe as any industrial chemical facility. We believe in all that safety. But it's this twisted take on the single mandate for the NRC and again the LNT that needs to be taken away zero tolerance safety paradigm that's been purposely and explicitly put into place to ensure that the nuclear industry is hobbled by capricious and endless regulatory weight and policy costs costs and time costs and treasure there's no other industry that would put up with this no other industry. the airline industry would never put up with this level of scrutiny medical industry and medical devices people are allowed to volunteer for monkey hearts and pig bladders you know medical industry the internet you know one of the, one of the most insidious and dangerous things for our children and society and we let it go utterly unregulated nobody in any other industry would put up with the giant burden that nuclear quietly just carries on its back I want safety third to wake the regulators up. There is no other method of making energy more inherently safe. This is the safest fuel and energy production form factor we will ever have that can produce at scale and avoid calamity, avoid national security issues, save the environment, create jobs, prosperity, abundance, if the, if, the, if the West refuses to do this, others will be happy to own the future. From China to the UAE, even little El Salvador, they are going to kick our ass. So again, if it's safe, walk away safe with added defense and depth. We are giving you an MSR that is inherently safe, intrinsically safe, factory built, fail safe, slow response curves, immune to system error, and fundamentally self-regulating, load following, always natural coast down to shut down state with no input from external controls or external human input, naturally cooled, naturally moderated, and innately simple and well understood. This is all true. This is all true, and you know it. And you, if you didn't know it before you came here, you know it now. Regulator, we have given you the inherently safe fuel and the Gen 4 reactor demanded by you. We've given you a 10x improvement over the phenomenal track record we already have. Now, keep your long delayed promise, adopt things like Part 53 and other policies like fuel recycling, and you damn well better give us the permission to save the world right now. I just want to say, you are all thorium. You are all the stone that was rejected by the builder. And now you're the cornerstone. You are the future of energy. Let's build this cathedral of energy together. Thank you, everybody.
could take a few minutes. Uh, I haven't been in there for a while, but if you could find the biggest open area in the room, like in front of the uh, in front of the projector, uh, I would like a group photo in there. So that would be great. That's nuclear's big problem, I think, is that we don't, um, we're very good at talking to ourselves. And we are very good at messaging and re-messaging to the people that are already on our side. So we go for depth of support when what we really need is breadth. We really badly need breadth of support. We need uh, more people and more types of people Yeah, you like that?